for curing the limbo program for the last three years. My name is Dina Diora and I will be your host for the event today. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us here today. As you can imagine, it was our initial plan. It was to be all together here in Athens and meet face to face and discuss about our work. But unfortunately, we can't make this happen due to the current conditions. Nevertheless, today is an opportunity to stay together, connect, learn from each other and learn together within this virtual room, share good practices and share information about our work. A brief disclaimer about the space we're here and broadcasting live today is that we have taken all the measurements and all the precautions to make sure that the space is safe for myself as a host and all our members of the panels and everyone who will be talking from this location. That is why you're going to see that we're not wearing any face masks, but we have kept the space very well safe. We'd really like to hear from you, so this is a time for you to introduce yourselves. So please take some time and use the chat box facility to let us know who you are, where you're hearing from. So write your name, your role and your organization and where you're listening from. The conference today is an opportunity to celebrate the work of Curing the Limbo and Catholic Relief Services, a program that's been running from 2018 to 2021, a rather complex program with various aspects concerning the integration of refugee communities in the city of Athens. The program involves supporting refugees with language and technical skills, with access to affordable housing, enable them to enter the job market, psychosocial support and opportunities through the civil society of Athens to connect, become creative, become placemakers of the city they're going to be living in. The program has been implemented by the city of Athens in partnerships with our wonderful partners, the National and Capodistrian University of Athens, the Catholic Relief Services, the International Rescue Committee, and the Athens Development and Destination Management Agency. The program has been co-financed by the European Regional Development Fund through the Urban Innovative Actions Initiative. We will now share on the screen a slide with the structure of the day, and I'm going to talk you through what we're going to see today. So we're going to start with some welcome remarks by our wonderful speakers. We're going to have our first plenary, a contextual overview on access and housing in Greece and the wider Europe context. We're going to have a short break, a first panel on good practices of housing implementation programs, then followed by a second break. We're going to have the parallel panels happening on municipal strategies and financing affordable housing, and we're going to close sharing our key takeaways of the day and lessons learned. A couple of things before I give the floor to our speakers to make sure you get the best experience of the symposium today. First of all, we not only welcome, but you really, really encourage active participation from your behalf in this conference. So please use the chat box facilities to share any thoughts, any ideas, any interesting examples you'd like to share with us, links, and just make sure you put your name and your organization or your role. The conference today is being recorded. And also we provide translation services, you, which you will be able to find on your screen, at the bottom of your screen, if you find the globe symbol and you click on that, you'll be able to select the language of your choice. Translation is being provided in English and Greek. Breaks. We will have those two breaks I mentioned today, and this is where we would normally get a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and get to chat a bit more informally outside the main room. We can't do that today, unfortunately, but still we'd like you to stay engaged and connected through our chat box facilities. And please try to use as well our social media to share your insights of the conference. So we have created a hashtag for our social media, which you're going to see on this card, hashtag Athens Housing Symposium. So please do use that when you uh, share information on the conference so we can look back on um, the ideas you shared. So without further ado, it's with great pleasure I invite Mrs. Adigoni Kotanidis, Project Manager for Killing the Limbo, City of Athens, who myself I had the absolute pleasure to work with as well, to take the floor for some welcome remarks. 
Hello everyone, good morning from Athens. Uh, on behalf of Cure in the Limbo, it is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to today's symposium on affordable housing. Uh, we are delighted to have so many great speakers from all over Europe today with us, and your presence shows that despite the lockdown and the geographical distance, we face common challenges and we can all learn from each other. I would like to say a few words about our program, which is now in its third and final year as it ends in June. Cure in the Limbo is a pilot European program of the city of Athens, which was made possible through funding by the Urban Innovative Actions, and we are grateful for the support. Over the course of the past three years, Cure in the Limbo um, developed a holistic integration program through a variety of services designed for and addressed to refugees who have lived in Athens since 2015. Our integrated approach aimed to assist our city's new residents to successfully transition from, from temporary emergency assistance to independent living in Athens. Through language and technical skills training, job counseling, psychosocial support, and the building of relationships and connections with active citizen groups in the city neighborhoods, the aim was to help participants improve their connection to the city. We tested a new approach where the city itself and the local population play an active role in the integration process. And the parallel goal was to empower people through independence, autonomy, learning, and active contribution. Access to housing was the central priority of Curing the Limbo and its housing facilitation unit. And our goal from the onset was to address the issue of sustainable, affordable housing in cooperation with the experienced team of our partner, Catholic Relief Services. It's an enduring issue for our cities and one which became even more evident following the refugee crisis in 2015. It was a great challenge which provided ample food for thought as well as know-how which now can be useful to anyone searching for long-term sustainable solutions in the field of affordable housing. Our approach was realistic based on needs assessment, but also reflected the reality of, the, of Athens' real estate market. As an urban innovative actions project, neither innovation nor going into uncharted waters were an issue. In fact, our pilot, our pilot program provided a unique opportunity to test new ideas that could be transferable and scaled up for other cities. So this is why we are here today to share our learnings and to also open a dialogue with other cities and relevant stakeholders, to reflect together on housing models that work well. So today we will start with an overview of the current housing reality in Greece and in Europe, the latest trends and the challenges. We will then go on to hear about best practices in the field throughout Europe, looking into incentives for the involvement of the private sector, but also how housing services can contribute to social inclusion. Finally, during the two parallel sessions this afternoon, we will hear about municipal interventions and strategies to ensure access to affordable and social housing for vulnerable groups and explore funding opportunities for the sustainability of different social and affordable housing models. Tomorrow, in a roundtable discussion, we will discuss some of today's findings and try to help improve the development and implementation of future housing models for refugees in Greek cities, and particularly a social rental agency. So I look forward to fruitful discussions of all the different facets of this challenging topic and sincerely hope we can come up with further recommendations on sustainable <coughs> solutions. So I would like once again to thank you all for your presence today and wish us a successful conference. Thank you, Adigoni. Um, it's, we're going to have two very busy, busy days, but of course, how could that not be possible given this has been such a complex and multifaceted uh, program. And it's brilliant what uh, Adigoni said, uh, that this program is beyond just integration. This program is a lot more about active participation and active uh, citizenship for our refugee communities. But also, in the same time, for the community here in Athens, the old and new citizens of the city, people who maybe since the economic recession have become less active and less engaged, so this program brought everyone together to kind of re rethink and reimagine their city. 
We are ready now to invite to take the floor the president of Athens Development and Destination Management Agency and executive advisor for migrants and refugees in the city of Athens, Mrs. Melina Daskalakis. We, we're going to quickly do a small uh, sound check and then we'll be back with you with uh, Mrs. Daskalaki. Uh, we make sure we have a, a, a very well-organized technical team here, so we're making sure that we're hosting people here in person in the Serafia building, but at the same time digitally online as well. So I think we're all um, okay. We're okay now to continue and again maybe we can invite Mrs. Daskalaki to start again from the beginning. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. I think we fixed it. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, Curing the Limbo and our partner, Catholic Relief Services, for invite me to, uh, inviting me to greet the symposium. The City of Athens takes continuous actions and implements a variety of projects for the integration of refugees. The pilot UIA program, Curing the Limbo, was and has always been of special importance for the city. In addition to the benefits it offers to direct beneficiaries, its participants, it taught us how refugees, together with the city, can work and, can work and coexist, improving the lives of all of us. The European Commission strategy through UIA was to, is to encourage municipalities to design pilot projects in synergies with civil society organization, institutions, universities, and private sector initiatives. Curing the Limbo did and does just that. Curing the Limbo is a social innovation program mm -hmm. tested ideas on the key challenges today's cities fa are facing, such as housing. The program was a practice of social and affordable housing in Greece, in Greece aiming at poverty reduction, refugee integration, as well as job creation, circular economy, etc. The Athens Development and Destination Management Agency, ADDMA, having the required business experience for the implementation and supervision of such an European program, undertook the implementation of the program in organic cooperation with the municipality of Athens and the rest of our partners. Finding an integration model that ensures its viability in Athens after the end of the program was a main goal from the beginning through the implementation and evaluation of the pilot actions of curing the limbo. The municipality of Athens participated in its continuous development and we can say that when curing the limbo is completed, it would be able to present basic recommendations for dealing with housing and access to, house, to affordable housing. The program will be able to make proposals to address the challenges that arise in a limited real estate rental market. During the limbo has gained valuable experience in incentives to attract private and public owners to make their properties available at affordable housing programs. It knows how housing support can contribute to the wider social integration of the city's vulnerable population. It will propose sustainable solutions that meet the real needs of refugees, the neighborhood, the city, and the citizens. Now that the program is coming to an end, it is time to step up our efforts to transform the original model of action into a public policy proposal in the context of refugee integration, and why not, even more broadly, in the context of general social housing policy. A proposal sustainable and applicable at the scale of European cities, that at the same time recognizes the specific features of each city. At this point, the role of the municipality of Athens is important as a body of institutional, institutional continuity and organic legacy of the program. Through the municipality, the actions and good practices of curing the limbo transform into proposals which can set an example, a good practice, and be applied in other cities. That is why I, in turn, I welcome you to the symposium and I look forward to watching its work. I wish all of us a successful meeting. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your contributions. Um, you, we can see housing and affordable housing, social housing has been at the core of this program. So it is with great pleasure I invite the country representative for Catholic Relief Services, Mr. Connor O'Lachlan, to take the floor. Okay, um, good morning everyone. Um, I was just reminded to take off my mask there as I came up to the podium. Um, you are very welcome to today's symposium. Um, I will just say a few brief words building off um, what my colleagues have already spoken um, about during the Limbo program. Ms. Melina and Ms. Antigone, who spoke very well to give an overview of both the Curing the Limbo program and what we're, why we're here today as well. So um, I'm, I'm actually incredibly impressed by um, the numbers of people that we have here for the symposium today. The level of interest in this area of work um, from a broad range of stakeholders, not just within Greece, but in Europe as well, from many cities that I know are represented across uh, across Europe today is really inspiring. Um, there is a lot of uh, creativity gone into how we're doing this today. I do wish we were all here together in person, um, but of course the situation will not allow that. At the same time, um, you know, the, as I said, this creativity that has allowed us to do here today is probably actually symptomatic of the creativity that we've seen in this Curing the Limbo program. As my colleagues have already mentioned, what has, what has defined the Curing the Limbo program has been an innovation and a courage to try new things, to really deliver affordable housing models for refugees in the city of Athens here, among many other areas of work that are also supporting the, their integration. And that today is what we are looking at. Catholic Relief Services globally believes that dignified housing is essential and integral to human development. Uh, we work in many, many countries to deliver shelter and housing solutions. That is not just refined to our uh, constraints to shelter in times of disaster or uh, crisis. It is also enduring housing solutions for people. What can we do to support, as a society, to support people with affordable housing solutions that can also contribute to that greater society? And I think the Curing the Limbo project that CRS has worked with and with our fantastic colleagues in, in the municipality of Athens here as well, is really finding that out. What are models of success that we can, we can bring to bear in for refugees that have been affected by crisis. And I think the opportunity today, and Ms. Molina, I think, put out that to us, the challenge really is to say, how can we scale this further? What have we learned as a community of stakeholders that are trying to deliver better solutions for refugees, for vulnerable populations, to have enduring housing solutions? That today is the challenge. And I'm, for one, for, from Catholic Relief Services perspective, I think it's, it's fantastic that we have this level of expertise together to really challenge that um, and to ask ourselves, what can we do together to bring together all that best practice, um, that shared learning, and really forge a way forward for this. Um, so I would like to to end on that note, just to say again, a very warm welcome to you all today. Um, it is fantastic to have such a, such a breadth of stakeholders here. I know it's going to be a very rich discussion. I'm certainly looking forward to, to um, joining a lot of those discussions today as well and to, to hear that. And I would say what comes out of this is, you know, a new, you know, a new approaches that we can bring forward. And as Ms. Melina said, you know, that is the challenge that's set forth for us today. So on that note, um, to say again, you are very welcome. We are delighted to be able to host this today and we look forward to the discussion that happens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lachlan. Um, I'd like to just echo a couple of words, especially regarding uh, how we're scaling up this type of work. And this is something that we're going to explore a lot throughout the symposium today, talking about partnerships, about the support organizations can get through their municipality, 
and um, also how we finance this type of work. So now I would like to invite the head of Social Integration Department for the Greek Ministry of Migration Policy, Mr. Athanasios Vitanzatos, to take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. So please allow me to introduce myself. I am Nasus Vicenzatos and I am Social Integration Directorate Head of uh, uh, Integration Directorate and the Ministry of uh, Migration and Asylum. Uh, thank you for the invitation in this uh, important conference. So please now allow me to speak in Greek. Kalimera se olus. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για την πρόσκληση σε αυτό το σημαντικό συνέδριο. Το θέμα του, του συνεδρίου αποτελεί από μόνο του πρόκληση, γιατί είναι κοινά αποδεκτό ότι το περιβάλλον διαβίωσης και οι συνθήκες στέγασης διαδραματίζουν σημαντικό ρόλο στην επίτευξη της κοινωνικής ένταξης τόσο των μεταναστών όσο και των προσφύγων όλων των πολιτών τρίτων φορών. Η συμβολή της στέγασης στην κοινωνική ένταξη επιτυχάνεται όμως όταν η παροχή εξασφάλισης της στέγασης πρώτον καθίσταται εξίσου προσβάσιμη σε όλους, σε όλους τους πολίτες τρίτων χωρών, δεύτερον προωθεί την ύπαρξη πολυπολιτισμικών συνθήκων διαβίωσης και διαπολιτισμικού διαλόγου, αποφεύγοντας έτσι την περιθωριοποίηση και τη δημιουργία μόνο πολιτισμικών συνοικιών ηγέτο, και τρίτον, παρέχει πέραν της στέγασης α, και της κατοικίας και άλλες υπηρεσίες. Τώρα, στα περισσότερα κράτη-μέλη της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης υπάρχουν εθνικοί και τοπικοί φορείς, καθώς και διεθνείς οργανισμοί, μη κυβερνητικές οργανώσεις που συμμετέχουν στην οργάνωση και διαχείριση προγραμμάτων ή και εγκαταστάσεων στέγασης μεταναστών και προσφύγων. Η συνεργασία αυτών των προαναφερθέντων φορέων σε συνδυασμό με την παροχή και άλλων υπηρεσιών, πέραν της στέγασης, σε κάθε ένα από αυτά τα στεγαστικά προγράμματα, θα πρέπει οπωσδήποτε να αποτελεί ένα απόσπαστο μέρος κάθε λύσης ή προγράμματος ή δράση στέγασης. Ωστόσο, η πραγματικότητα στα περισσότερα κράτη-μέλη της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης είναι ότι τα διαθέσιμα ακίνητα είναι λιγοστά, τα ενίκεια είναι υψηλά, στα ακίνητα τα οποία έχουν μία προσιτή τιμή οι συνθήκες διαβίωσης είναι συνήθως ανεπαρκείς και συχνά τα ελόγω ακίνητα βρίσκονται σε μη προνομιούχες γειτονιές. Όλες οι προαναφερθείς σε συνθήκες αφενός οδηγούν συχνά τα άτομα που ανήκουν σε ευάλωτες ομάδες σε μια τρόπον την απεριθυροποίηση, ειδικά όταν αυτά τα άτομα αφορούν τον προσφυγικό πληθυσμό ή αφορούν άτομα με αναπηρία ή μονογονεακές οικογένειες οι ψυχικά πάσχοντες, οι ηλικιωμένου, οι επιζήσασες σε έμφυλης ή ενδεκογενειακής βίας, μπορούν να τα οδηγήσουν ακόμα και στις συνθήκες αστεγίας. Ενώ η έλλειψη επαρκούς και αξιοπρεπούς στέγασης αποτελεί για πολλούς πρόσφυγες και μετανάστες εμπόδιο για την ένταξή τους στην κοινωνία υποδοχής. Την κοινωνία την οποία έχουν διαλέξει το κράτος υποδοχής για να κατοικήσουν. Με δεδομένα λοιπόν τα προαναφερθέντα, και προκειμένου τα προγράμματα στέγασης να μην παρέχουν απλά μία στέγη ή μία επιδότηση ενικίου της εν λόγω στέγης, αλλά να συμβάλλουν στη βιώσιμη ένταξη των μεταναστών και προσφύγων, είναι πολύ σημαντικό τα εν λόγω προγράμματα. Πρώτον, να υλοποιούνται σε ήδη υπάρχουσες κατοικημένες περιοχές, ενσωματώνοντας τη διαθεσιμότητα και την παροχή κοινωνικών υπηρεσιών, είτε αυτή είναι φροντίδα παιδιών, κέντρα υγείας, κοινωνικές υπηρεσίες, δημόσιες υπηρεσίες, εκπαιδευτικές εγκαταστάσεις, αθλητικούς φορείς, καθώς και τη διαθεσιμότητα και την προσφορά θέσεων εργασίας. Δεύτερον, να παρέχουν νομικές, κοινωνικές και ψυχολογικές υπηρεσίες που λαμβάνουν υπόψη τις ατομικές ανάγκες των επωφελούμενων, καθώς και μαθήματα ελληνικών, εργασιακή συμβουλευτική, αλλά και καθοδήγηση αναφορά, αναφορικά με θέματα καθημερινότητας και διαδικασιών. Πώς ενοικιάζεται ένα σπίτι, πώς υποβάλλεται αίτηση για κοινωνικές παροχές, πώς πληρώνεται ένας λογαριασμός ηλεκτρικού ρεύματος, πώς εγγράφεται ένα παιδί στο σχολείο, πώς γίνεται εγγραφή στον ΟΑΕΔ, πώς εκδίδεται ένα εισιτήριο για αληφορείο ακόμα ακόμα. Τρίτον, να προωθούν την ανάπτυξη μεικτών κοινοτήτων, 
καθώς και διαπολιτισμικού και θετικού διαλόγου μεταξύ των προσφύγων μεταναστών και της κοινωνίας υποδοχής. Και τέταρτον, να παρέχουν ενημέρωση και κίνητρα στους διοκτήτες ακινήτων, προκειμένου να είναι πιο εύκολη αφενός η επίτευξη προσιτών ενοικίων και αφετέρου η εν γέννη ενοικίαση κατοικιών σε πρόσφυγες. Με βάση αυτά, λοιπόν, που υπόθηκαν, καθώς και την εμπειρία που έχουμε εμείς αποκομίσει παρακολουθώντας την υλοποίηση του προγράμματος Ήλιος, θεωρούμε ότι τα προγράμματα στέγασης είναι αναγκαία προκειμένου να επιτευχθεί η ένταξη των προσφύγων στην ελληνική κοινωνία. Αλλά και σε κάθε περίπτωση κρίνουμε ότι δεν αποτελούν αυτόνομα προγράμματα ένταξης αν δεν συνδυάζονται με την παροχή και άλλων απαραίτητων υπηρεσιών, δεν έχουν τη σωστή χωροθέτηση και δεν συμβάλλουν στην επίτευξη ουσιώδους διαπολιτισμικού διαλόγου. Το διήμερο συμπόσιο, στο οποίο έχει τη χαρά και την τιμή να απευθύνω σήμερα χαιρετισμό, διοργανώνεται στο πλαίσιο του πιλωτικού προγράμματο Curing the Libre. Ένα προγράμματο που συγκεντρώνει αρκετά από αυτά τα προαναφερθέντα χαρακτηριστικά που ανέφερα, ενό προγράμματο στέγαση που συμβάλλει στη βιώσιμη ένταξη των προσφύγων, υποστηρίζοντα του πρόσφυγε με γλωσσικέ και τεχνικέ δεξιότητε, με διευκόλυνση τη πρόσβασή του σε προσιτή κατοικία με ψυχοκοινωνική υποστήριξη και παροχή υπηρεσιών εργασιακής συμβουλευτικής, αλλά και την παροχή της ευκαιρίας στον ωφελούμενο προσφυγικό πληθυσμό να αλληλεπιδράσει με ομάδες ενεργών πολιτών και να συμμετάσχει σε πρωτοβουλίες της πόλης με αποτέλεσμα να ανταχθεί στη ζωή της πόλης της Αθήνας. Τώρα, ως υπηρεσία θεωρούμε ότι μπορούν να συνεπάρχουν πολλά στεγαστικά προγράμματα και σε αυτή την κατεύθυνση θα κινηθούμε και στην επόμενη προγραμματική περίοδο, που ήδη έχει ξεκινήσει, την προγραμματική περίοδο 21-27. Εν τέλει, δεν ξέρω εάν η στέγαση είναι ένταξη. Το σίγουρο είναι όμως ότι η στέγαση βοηθά πάρα πολύ στην κοινωνική ένταξη. Εύχομαι να είναι ένα διήμερο πλούσιο σε ανταλλαγή εμπειριών, απόκτηση νέων γνώσεων και ιδεών. Σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ όλοι. Thank you very much for your contributions and I would like to invite to the floor Mr. Milan College, Senior Project Coordinator for ILIOS, the International Organization for Migration. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning and thank you for uh, having me here. The, um, the accommodation capacity of Greece is both very limited when discussing on affordable housing for people in uh, poverty and very wide and unutilized when it comes to the empty houses that are not even in the housing market. Tens of thousands of apartments are either not rented or not in a condition to be rented. At the same time, there are no social housing prog programs in place for many given reasons. The most important being the fact that in Greece, the house ownership ratio was always high and that the, the, the uh, social housing policy was always, it was, uh, uh, was almost not, not needed in the past. The last um, remarkable social housing program was implemented in the 90s when people with Greek origin uh, came to Greece from Russia and Turkey. Even with the inflow of economic uh, Uh, migrants from Albania, ex-Soviet countries, and other countries, the raising, uh, the raising uh, economy was capable to produce sufficient income for workers to afford and rent houses in the market. After the economic crisis in 2009, when unemployment rate raised, the situation started changing significantly, and with the influx of almost 40,000 migrants their year between 2012 and 2014, homelessness became, became more notable and visible. Um, the recent uh, flows after 2015 rapidly increased the need, the, the, the need to address the problem. As we all know, uh, migrants and those living in poverty are the first affected. This is why this conference and in general discussions on uh, affordable housing uh, as substitute or, um, or uh, complementary solutions to this, to this problem are uh, important to be held 
in order to explore its possibilities and search for modalities which can fit the Greek context and offer possible solutions to the current problem. As a good uh, reference point, one could mention the national strategy of integration from July 2019, addressing the housing issue and promoting social cohesion in local communities by suggesting the uh, refurbishment of state and municipal buildings that were not used or were abandoned in order to create low rent apartments. These properties would accommodate migrants, beneficiaries of international protection, alongside local vulnerable people, such as homeless people or uh, long-term unemployed. After almost two years of implementation uh, of, in, of implementation of Ilios program, which up to date provided the uh, accommodation support and rental subsidies to almost 13,000 beneficiaries of international protection throughout Greece, we could say that uh, the main challenges remain the same. And I will quickly mention the main ones. Concerns of landlords that beneficiaries will be unable to keep up with their payments after the Ilios financial support has been completed. Concerns about damages to their apartments that will possibly not be paid. The shortage of uh, affordable apartments uh, and the fact that property owners select to whom they rent the apartment demoralize beneficiaries after visiting several affordable apartments. Property owners are reluctant to work directly with beneficiaries and, work, and would prefer to rent apartments to NGOs that can guarantee the duration and possible reparation as the STIA program does. There is a shortage of, of quality affordable apartments in urban areas. While there is a greater property, property availability, rental prices remain high. And real estate agencies dominate the housing market in certain regions such as Epirus or Thessaly, and their fees are very often high and not affordable for the project and its beneficiaries. And for the end, allow me to say one very important fact, which I consider as one of the strongholds for today's discussion, the social and affordable housing increase social cohesion and support integration. Therefore, it is crucial to invest resources to implement them. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contributions and thank you all for watching. A polite reminder to keep adding your introduction to say hello on the chat. A home is very important for all of us. We all understand the importance of having a home. Having a home and a roof over our head, it allows us to safely have the confidence and the safety to pursue other aspects of our lives. Having a home increases the opportunity, especially for displaced families, to establish strong social, economic and cultural ties with their host community. Once you establish those ties, then you don't only simply integrate to the city you live in, but you become a happy and active member of your community. Housing, in general, is, a core, uh, is at the core of the Urban Innovative Action Initiative and has been explored in various other projects. And for curing the limbo, Catholic Relief Services have developed an affordable housing model to assist refugees move away from temporary or emergency accommodation and have a more permanent long-term home. So it is a truly people-centered program. And who best to share this experience with us than a member from our community who participated in curing the limbo aspects of the program. So it is with great pleasure I'd like to invite Mr. Mohamed Tayeb to tell us his insight from his experience being part of the program. Okay, first of all, I would like uh, to thank all of you for amazing opportunity to speak here. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to Rania and Katrina who helped me a lot since uh, every beginning of this great program, Curing the Limbo. In, it is the best program that I applied and participate, especially housing support. That is the most important things in life. 
So if you got a house, you feel more stable and calm and ready to integrate onto, into the society and be part of it. The team was great. Whenever I needed, they helped me a lot. Um, they are very welcoming team in the curing the limbo. Uh, it was hard for them to find a house for us. They spoke with many owners and when they found a house, they prepared the contract, the bills. Uh, they were there when we got the house and they prepared the, uh, sorry. We got the keys of the house. Actually, I still live in the house uh, that they founded for me. The owner, Zoe, is such a nice person and she considered me as a member of her family. And whenever I need something, they need really to help. The flat is so nice and calm and the price is very good. Actually, I like Athens and people I feel as I am in my hometown, actually, I found love and care in the curing the limbo from the beginning. And I am still in touch with all the team members and I really appreciate them for everything they did for me and all the participants. I would like to give a special thanks to my Greek teacher, Iriana. And thank you, you, for listening to me and hope to see you in person and keep yourself safe and healthy. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Tayeb. It's just so wonderful to hear that this program not only offered some practical solutions to some of the issues affecting our community, but it has potentially invested to some long lasting friendships within the city. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for adding your comments in the chat box. We have a very impressive um, geographical map of where you're listening from. So we have Greece, we have England, Madagascar, Poland, Belgium, Hungary, Czech Republic, the Netherlands, uh, Bangladesh and Iran, a few of the places I could mention right now. So thank you all so much for being with us here today. And uh, now we're going to move on into our first plenary, uh, the opportunity to get a bit more context, a more contextual approach to the access to affordable housing in Greece and the wider Europe. So again, with great pleasure, I invite our moderator, Mrs. Iona, Ioana Pertzinidou, Athens Solidarity Center coordinator from Solidarity Now and management board member of the Greek Housing Network, who would guide us through this conversation today. Welcome. Thank you very much and good morning to everybody from all over the world. Uh, definitely they have, we will need to thank uh, Kirin de Libo for bringing us uh, together here today. A lot have been said, so I wouldn't like that you, we lose uh, more time on what is essential that we bring together in this uh, discussion. So uh, just a few rules of, of the house, we would like definitely our, uh, our speakers uh, to stick to their time schedule. That means 15 uh, minutes uh, each one. And they will, so there will be some time at the end of our uh, panel for your questions and the discussion. And uh, there will be two presentations that will be in Greek. That uh, means from our uh, General, Secretary General of Social Solidarity and Fight Against Poverty, and also from the Secretary General of the City of Athens. So there will be a need of interpretation that you foreign speakers would need to use, um, especially for Mrs. Uh, Mr. Tsetsiamis, that is the second uh, panelist. Uh, he will have a shorter, uh, let's say, time uh, during to his speech, and he will allow five minutes of his 15 minutes, so we could address uh, the questions to him uh, at that uh, time. So, uh, I would like to invite Mr. Stamatis uh, George, Secretary General of Social Solidarity and Fight Against Poverty from the Greek Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs to give us the state of the art and uh, uh, on the current situation on combating homelessness in Greece and especially those uh, who are at the 
limbo status. Mr. General. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, let me allow to, to speak in my in native uh, language. Θα ήθελα καταρχήν να σα ευχαριστήσω για, τη, για την πρόσκληση και γενικότερα τα θέματα τη προσιτή και κοινωνική κατοικία πάντα είναι στο επίκεντρο του ενδιαφέροντο, ειδικότερα μετά την οικονομική κρίση όσον αφορά την, τη χώρα μα. Αλλά εκεί αναπτύχθηκε και ένα άλλο μοντέλο το οποίο δουλεύτηκε στο κομμάτι τη κατοικία που αφορούσε το κομμάτι του, του προσφυγικού, την περίοδο τη προσφυγική κρίση που, που έζησε η χώρα μα. Ε, δεν σας κρύβω ότι και εμείς προβληματιζόμαστε γιατί μέχρι το 2012 υπήρχε ο Οργανισμός Εργατικής Κατοικίας που αυτό ήταν το, το, το μοντέλο της χώρας όσον αφορά το κομμάτι της ε, κατοικίας. Μετά την ε, κατάργηση του Οργανισμού Εργατικής Κατοικίας δεν έχει, δεν έχει αναπτυχθεί κάποιο σχέδιο, ε, δεν υπήρξε κάποιο σχέδιο όσον αφορά το κομμάτι της ε, κατοικίας πόσο μάλλον το κομμάτι των, της κοινωνικής κατοικίας στα, στο επίπεδο των ευάλωτων και ευπαθών ομάδων. Και όταν μιλάμε για ευάλωτες και ευπαθείς ε, ομάδες, εννοούμε ε, συμπολίτε μας οι οποίοι είναι άστεγοι, συμπολίτε μας οι οποίοι ε, εκτείουν ποινές στις φυλακές και είναι στη διαδικασία της αποφυλάκησης και γενικά ε, ε, φτωχά νοικοκυριά τα οποία δυσκολεύονται να ανταπεξέλθουν στις καθημερινές τους ανάγκες. Εκεί ε, εμείς έχουμε προσανατολιστεί στο, στο, στο εξής σημείο. Πρώτα απ' όλα ε, παρουσιάστηκε μέσω της ε, πανδημίας του COVID η, η ευκαιρία να δηλώσουμε στο Ταμείο Ανάκαμψης ένα πρόγραμμα πιλωτικό της τάξης του 1,3 εκατομμυρίων ευρώ για να φτιάξουμε ένα πρόγραμμα κοινωνικής κατοικίας πιλωτικά σε δύο πόλεις. Οι πόλεις που έχουμε επιλέξει είναι η Αθήνα και η Θεσσαλονίκη και το μοντέλο αυτό θα είναι σε 70 διαμερίσματα στην Αθήνα και 30 στη Θεσσαλονίκη. Αυτό που εμείς έχουμε ε, α, ζητήσει από το Ταμείο Ανάκαψης και έχει εγκριθεί είναι να προχωρήσουμε στο μοντέλο που θα δώσουμε κάποια χρήματα περίπου της τάξης των 10.000 ευρώ ένα διαμέρισμα στους ιδιοκτήτες των, των σπιτιών ε, ώστε να γίνει μια ανακατασκευή αυτών ώστε να μπορέσει να είναι ένα κίνητρο να δοθούν τα σπίτια. Ε, και ταυτόχρονα... Ε, να γίνουν κάποιες άλλες παρεμβάσεις με διάφορα άλλα προγράμματα που έχει αυτή τη στιγμή η, η χώρα μας και η κυβέρνηση, όπως είναι το, το εξοικονομό. Εδώ θέλω να πω ότι τρέχοντας και άλλα προγράμματα που συνεργαζόμαστε και, στο, και με το Δήμο Αθηναίων σε αυτό, υπάρχει γενικότερα μια, ένα έλλειμμα κατοικιών. Δεν υπάρχουν διαθέσιμα ακίνητα. Και ταυτόχρονα υπάρχει και ένα θέμα ε, που το έχουμε αντιμετωπίσει σε ένα πρόγραμμα που θα σας το αναφέρω ε, ε, σε λίγο, ότι πολλοί συμπολίτε μας που έχουν διαμερίσματα ε, δεν θέλουν να δώσουν διαμερίσματα σε ευπαθείς ομάδες του πληθυσμού που συμμετέχουν σε ένα, σε, σε, σε ένα πρόγραμμα. Και αν θέλετε, αυτό μας δίνει την άλλη διάσταση πώς ε, θα μπορέσουμε και πώς θα κάνουμε συγκεκριμένες δράσεις ώστε να μην υπάρχει αυτό που λέμε ο στιγματισμός. Δηλαδή, ο κάθε πολίτης που θα θέλει να δώσει μια κατοικία και αυτή να χρησιμοποιηθεί σε, σε, σε μορφή κοινωνικής κατοικία, να μην νιώθει ότι δίνοντας αυτό το σπίτι στιγματίζεται ο άνθρωπος που θα μείνει εκεί. Και ταυτόχρονα και οι άνθρωποι που θα μένουν εκεί να μην νιώθουν ότι διαμένουν κάπου ο οποίο είναι συναματισμένοι στην κατοικία, στην πολυκατοικία, στη γειτονιά και ούτω καθεξής. Εμείς ήρθαμε τον Νοέμβριο και θεσπίσαμε ένα πρόγραμμα, το Στέγα Συγεργασία, το οποίο είναι ένα πρόγραμμα που είχε μένει στο παρελθόν, λειτουργήσει πιλωτικά και τώρα έχει θεσμοθετηθεί ώστε θα είναι κάθε χρόνο και θα λειτουργεί. Αυτό είναι τη τάξη των 10 εκατομμυρίων. Και ταυτόχρονα, πέραν το ότι δίνουμε στέγη σε, σε ευάλωτε ομάδε του πληθυσμού, υπάρχουν και συνοδευτικέ υπηρεσίε. Και νομίζω ότι το πιο σημαντικό στα μοντέλα που εμεί θέλουμε από εδώ και πέρα να δουλέψουμε δεν είναι μόνο η, 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 το να μείνει κάποιο σε, σε μια κοινωνική κατοικία, αλλά είναι πόσο οι συνοδευτικέ υπηρεσίε, οι οποίε θα του δοθούν από την πολιτεία και από του εταίρου που θα συμμετέχουν σε προγράμματα. Ε, ώστε να μπορέσουν να τον εντάξουν πάλι στην κοινωνία. Σε αυτό το σημείο, επιτρέψτε μου να σας πω ότι το μόνο μοντέλο αυτή τη στιγμή που η χώρα μας δουλεύει υπό τη μορφή κοινωνικής κατοικίας ε, είναι το μοντέλο που σας πρότεινα, που, που σας είπα ότι θα ζητήσαμε από το Ταμείο Ανάκαμψης. Το δεύτερο είναι το στέγας και εργασία και το τρίτο 
Είναι ένα πρόγραμμα χρηματοδοτούμενο από τον Ευρωπαϊκό Οικονομικό Χώρο στην, στην Κατερίνη, στη θέση Πέλεκας. Εκεί θα γίνει μια μετεγκατάσταση του πληθυσμού των Ρωμά. Μιλάμε για 56 οικογένειε και αυτοί θα μείνουν σε, μια, σε, σε έναν άλλον χώρο υπό τη μορφή της κοινωνικής κατοικίας. Τι σημαίνει αυτό. Θα φτιάξουμε τα σπίτια. Τα σπίτια, να σας πω ότι θα είναι βιοκλιματικά. Ε, θα υπάρχει ένα πολυδύναμο κέντρο το οποίο θα συνεισφέρει ε, με συνοδές υπηρεσίες ε, τους ανθρώπους αυτούς και ταυτόχρονα ε, έχουμε επεξεργαστεί ένα σχέδιο και έχει εγκριθεί ώστε να κάνουμε την ενδυνάμωση αυτών των ανθρώπων. Ένα από τα πολλά πράγματα τα οποία έχουμε διαπιστώσει α, και σε αυτό το πρόγραμμα και γενικότερα στο κομμάτι το, των ευάλωτων ομάδων του πληθυσμού στο, όταν τους παρέχεται μια κοινωνική κατοικία είναι πώς μπορείς να τους εκπαιδεύσει πάλι στο να στήσουν έναν οικοκυριό, πέραν του να μείνουν σε μία στέγη. Και αυτό το μοντέλο θα το δουλέψουμε πάρα πολύ στην Κατερίνη, που οι άνθρωποι θα μαθαίνουν πώς στήνεται έναν οικοκυριό, πώς επεξεργάζονται τους λογαριασμούς οι οποίοι έρχονται, πώς αποπερατώνουν αυτούς τους λογαριασμούς, πώς μπορούν να είναι σε πιο φτηνές μορφές ρεύματο νερού και ούτω καθεξής, ώστε ταυτόχρονα, μαζί με το κομμάτι που είναι συνδεόμενο, γιατί χωρίς αυτό δεν μπορεί να συμβεί, με το κομμάτι της εργασίας και της εκπαίδευση ε, αυτών των ομάδων του πληθυσμού να ενταχθούν πάλι στην κοινωνία. Οπότε όλα τα μοντέλα εμείς που δουλεύουμε είναι ταυτόχρονα με τη διασύνδεση αυτών στο κομμάτι της εργασίας. Δεν μπορούμε να, να στηρίξουμε θεσμούς κοινωνικής κατοικία ε, ε, σε ευάλωτους πληθυσμού, αν αυτοί δεν διασυνδεθούν είτε με συνοδευτικές υπηρεσίες, είτε ταυτόχρονα με το κομμάτι ε, τ, τ, της εργασίας. Σε αυτό το πλαίσιο ε, θα ξεκινήσουμε αυτή τη στιγμή, ε, ε, επειδή βλέπω ότι είναι και η εκπρόσωπη τη ΦΕΑΝΤΣΑ, εμείς φέτος θα κάνουμε την καταγραφή των αστέγων στη, 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 στη χώρα μας και ήδη έχουμε συστήσει μια ομάδα εργασίας που συμμετέχουν φορείς της κοινωνίας των πολιτών ώστε να επεξεργαστούμε κυρίως τρία πράγματα. Ένα πράγμα είναι ένα σχέδιο έκτακτων, έκτακτης δράσης, όπως παράδειγμα προέκυψε από τον COVID, πέραν των παγετώνων ή του καύσωνα και ταυτόχρονα να φτιάξουμε ένα συγκεκριμένο ερωτηματολόγιο και μια συγκεκριμένη μεθοδολογία ώστε να μπορούμε κάθε χρόνο να κάνουμε την καταγραφή, απογραφή ε, των αστέγων στη χώρα μας. Αυτή τη στιγμή οι, οι άστεγοι που διαμένουν στις δομές υπνοτήρα και ξενώνες που έχουμε στη χώρα είναι 752 συν 30 οι οποίοι είναι στη διαδικασία του να μπουν στα ξενώνες και υπνοτήρια και σε αυτή τη λογική προσπαθούμε όλους αυτούς τους ανθρώπους που μένουν σε αυτές τις δομές να τους συνδέσουμε, διασυνδέσουμε με το πρόγραμμα στέγαση και εργασία. Και οφείλω να σας πω ότι αυτό έχει αρχίσει και πετυχαίνει γιατί λειτουργεί ένα τρίπτυχο. Πρώτον, πώς παίρνουμε τους ανθρώπους από τον δρόμο, τους αστέγους, πώς τους βάζουμε σε ένα ξενώνα και σε ένα υπνοτήριο αν θέλετε και δεύτερον, πώς με συνοδευτικές υπηρεσίες τους, ε, προσπαθούμε να τους εντάξουμε ε, στο κομμάτι της κατοικίας. Από τη στιγμή που συμβεί αυτό, το επόμενο στάδιο είναι ε, η διασύνδεσή τους με την, με, την, με, την, με την εργασία. Οπότε, σε όλο αυτό το πλαίσιο, νομίζω ότι είμαστε σε φάση να πούμε ότι τα επόμενα χρόνια, κάνοντας τα πιλωτικά που σας ανέφερα πριν, να δούμε το μοντέλο μιας ε, ενδεχόμενης εθνικής στρατηγικής όσον αφορά ε, την, την κοινωνική κατοικία στη χώρα. Αυτό που πέρα, πρέπει να να πούμε, είναι ότι ε, η αποτύπωση της μελέτης που εμείς αυτή τη στιγμή έχουμε ξεκινήσει να, να δουλεύουμε για να δούμε ακριβώς τις ανάγκες της χώρας στην κοινωνική κατοικία, αντιλαμβάνεστε ότι όλα αυτά συνδέονται και με βάση και την οικονομία και πόσα μπορούν να είναι αυτά τα ακίνητα και πόσα είναι τα χρήματα που μπορεί να διαθέσει η, η ελληνική πολιτεία. Οπότε πιστεύω ότι τέλος του χρόνου, αρχές του επόμενου χρόνου, θα είμαστε σε, σε θέση να παρουσιάσουμε ένα γενικότερο πλαίσιο α, πάνω στο κομμάτι αυτό, έχοντας ήδη πολιτικές, ε, όπως είναι το στέγας και εργασία, όπως είναι άλλες πολιτικές, που αυτές θα διασυνδεθούν μεταξύ τους, με βάση βέβαια και τα διαθέσιμα ακίνητα, είτε του δημοσίου, είτε των ιδιωτών. Σε αυτό θέλω να σας πω ότι προχωρήσαμε και σε μία... Α, α, ψηφίσαμε ένα νόμο, μέχρι πρώτην στη χώρα μας, οι, οι άστεγοι που, μέναν, που ήταν στον δρόμο, ε, δικαιούτησαν το ελάχιστο εγγυημένο εισόδημα, ε, αλλά όταν μπαίνανε σε έναν ξενώνα, αυτό δεν, δεν μπορούσε να είναι δυνατόν να το παίρνουν. Οπότε αλλάξαμε αυτό, οπότε και αυτοί οι άνθρωποι μπαίνουν μέσα στους ξενώνες και αυτόματα λαμβάνουν το, το ελάχιστο εγγυημένο εισόδημα. Στόχος κυρίως σε εμά, με βάση το, 
τη θέση που έχουμε εμεί εδώ ω Υπουργείο και με αυτά που είμαστε υπεύθυνοι είναι πώ θα βγάλουμε περισσότερου ανθρώπου από το δρόμο, θα του περάσουμε στου ξενώνε και ταυτόχρονα με συνοδευτικέ υπηρεσίε θα του βάλουμε σε μοντέλα κοινωνική κατοικία και διασύνδεση του με την εργασία. Νομίζω ότι τέτοιε πρωτοβουλίε όπω και η δική σα, αλλά και σε μοντέλα που έχει δουλέψει ο Δήμο και οι μεγάλε πόλει τη χώρα. Είμαι αισιόδοξο ότι μπορούμε να φτιάξουμε ένα τέτοιο δίκτυο προστασία τη κατοικία για ευάλωτε ομάδε του πληθυσμού, οι οποίε και δεν θα στιγματίζονται συμμετέχοντα μέσα σε ένα τέτοιο πρόγραμμα και ταυτόχρονα θα νιώθουν και οι ίδιοι ενεργοί πολίτε, όντα έχοντα την κοινωνική προστασία που του που τους δίνει, τους δίνει το κράτο. Σα ευχαριστώ. Uh, thank you very much, uh, General Secretary. A uh, very formative uh, presentation and also giving a perspective and uh, ideas and I hope uh, the people that are able to participate can use, highlighting also the need to coordinate uh, different stakeholders in uh, the issue and hopefully can move uh, forward in a longer term perspective and uh, beyond uh, specific, let's say, um, Uh, duration of uh, that the government, each government may have. Um, I would like to continue inviting Mr. Uh, Alexandros Tsiatsiamis, Secretary General of the City of Athens, to explain from uh, the very concrete local perspective uh, the social housing experience and uh, the position of municipality of Athens. Thank you very much for joining us today. Good morning, everybody. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the municipality and the mayor of Athens. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, allow me now to, to introduce some uh, of our initiatives and some uh, uh, some proposals for, for, for this uh, symposium. Uh, θα ήθελα να σας ευχαριστήσω όλους για την πρόσκληση, για τη συμμετοχή τους σε αυτό το συμπόσιο. Και θέλω να πω ότι από τα πρώτα πράγματα τα οποία συμμετείχα ενεργά όταν ανέλαβα Γενικός Γραμματέας στο Δήμο της Αθήνας ήταν το πρόγραμμα Curing the Limbo. Και ο λόγος ήταν ότι το βρήκα πάρα πολύ σημαντικό και πάρα πολύ καλά οργανωμένο για, να, για το θέμα το οποίο θέλει να αντιμετωπίσει. Το θέμα δηλαδή της στέγασης των ευάλωτων ομάδων. Και με αυτόν τον τρόπο μου δόθηκε η ευκαιρία συμμετέχοντας στο πρόγραμμα να καταλάβω πόσο πολύ σημαντική δουλειά μπορεί να έχουν τέτοια προγράμματα, τέτοια προγράμματα που οδηγούνται από την καινοτομία και τις εφαρμογές που, που, που χρησιμοποιούν για να αντιμετωπίσουν αυτό το πρόγραμμα, έτσι ώστε να αποτελέσουν τη βάση μιας μονιμότερης εφαρμογής πολιτικής. Το Δήμο της Αθήνας, το πρόγραμμα της Αστεγίας, πέραν από, την, από τα, τυπικά της, τα τυπικά ζητήματα τα οποία όλοι αναφέρουν, ε, είναι ένα πρόγραμμα το οποίο είναι και σε μεγάλη έκταση και, σε πάρα πολύ, και πολύ έντονο στη ζωή των ανθρώπων στην πόλη. Ε, τα τελευταία χρόνια έχουμε προσπαθήσει ε, να αντιμετωπίσουμε αυτό το, το, προ, το πρόβλημα αλλά στην πραγματικότητα δεν έχουμε δώσει τις πραγματικές λύσεις. Η Αθήνα είναι μια πόλη πολύ, πολύ μεγάλη, με πάρα πολύ μεγάλες ροές πληθυσμών προσφύγων και μεταναστών και με πάρα πολλούς άστεγους. Η προσπάθεια λοιπόν που καταβάλουμε στο Δήμο Αθηναίων είναι να έχουμε μια συστηματική προσέγγιση σε ό,τι αφορά το θέμα της αστεγίας. Από τη μία πλευρά είναι η άστεγη της πόλης και στη, στο πλαίσιο της ε, κρίσης, της υγειονομικής κρίσης, ο Δήμος της Αθήνας, προσπαθώντας να αντατικοποιήσει την προσπάθειά του για να αντιμετωπιστεί αυτό το φαινόμενο, δημιούργησε το κέντρο αστέγων. Ε, το κέντρο αστέγων είναι μια πολύ σημαντική πρωτοβουλία, η οποία έγινε μέσα σε έξι μήνες μετά το ξέσπασμα της κρίσης. Έχει τη δυνατότητα να φιλοξενήσει 400 άτομα και παρέχονται μια σειρά από υπηρεσίες, όπως βεβαίω η σύντηση, η στέγαση και ψυχοκοινωνικές υπηρεσίες, υπηρεσίες ιατρικές υπηρεσίες και ψυχολογική στήριξη. 
δημιούργησε ένα ξενόνα αστέγων πάλι για άτομα που διαξαρτημένους, πάλι στην, με, στην, με τις ίδιες υπηρεσίες. Όλα αυτά γίνανε πάρα πολύ γρήγορα. Το καπάσιτι και των δύο δομών είναι 500 άτομα και είναι αυτή τη στιγμή ε, λειτουργούν σχεδόν στο 100% ε, της, ε, της δυνατότητας εξυπηρέτηση. Το Πολυδύναμο Κέντρο είναι μια πρωτοβουλία που ε, ήρθε για να μείνει στην πόλη. Συνοδεύεται από ε, περιφερειακή και συνοδές υπηρεσίες ε, street work, το οποίο εφαρμόζουμε ε, τακτικά και θεωρούμε ότι θα αποτελέσει ένα μοντέλο το οποίο αν καταφέρουμε και το πολλαπλασιάσουμε στις, ε, σε άλλες περιοχές στην πόλη θα αντιμετωπίσει ουσιαστικά ε, το, το θέμα της ε, αστεγίας. Όπως είπε και ο κύριος Γενικός προηγουμένως έχουμε και εμείς στο Δήμα Αθηναίων δύο προγράμματα στέγαση και εργασία ε, για αστέγους ε, το, ένα πρόγραμμα, το πρώτο πρόγραμμα μάλλον που ξεκινήσαμε, το οποίο αφορά 69 οφελούμενους και έχει έναν προϋπολογισμό 730.000 και έχει απορροφηθεί σχεδόν το σύνολο. Το δεύτερο πρόγραμμα είναι περίπου ένα πρόγραμμα 300.000 για 32 οφελούμενους, δηλαδή 30 περίπου νοικοκυριά κατά προσέγγιση. Τώρα θέλω να περάσω σε μια άλλη κατηγορία πολιτών που αναζητούν προσοχή στέγη και είναι οι πρόσφυγες και δικαιούχοι διεθνούς προστασίας. Υλοποιούμε το πρόγραμμα ΕΣΤΙΑ, ένα πάρα πολύ σημαντικό πρόγραμμα, σε συνεργασία με την ΥΠΑΤΙ Αρμοστία του ΟΗΕ και με το Υπουργείο Μετανάστες της Κερασίνη. Σήμερα το πρόγραμμα παρέχει φιλοξενία σε 1.750 ωφελούμενους, οι οποίοι στεγάζουν σε 320 μισθωμένα διαμερίσματα στο πλαίσιο αυτόνομης διαβίωσης. Η διάρκεια της μίσθωσης συναρτάται με τη διάρκεια του προγράμματος. Είναι συνήθως ετήσια, αλλά μπορεί να είναι και λιγότερο 4-6 μήνες. Έχει... Το αντιμετωπίζουν θετικά οι ιδιοκτήτες και γι' αυτό και είναι ενεργό και, και λειτουργεί. Ε... Έτσι έχουμε δημιουργήσει στην πραγματικότητα μια δεξαμενή διαμερισμάτων, η οποία συνεχώς την επικαιροποιούμε. Ε, καλώντας, ε, κάνοντας εγκαλώς ενδιαφέροντος ε, για να μπορέσουμε να, ε, να μας διατεθούν διαμερίσματα. Δεν είναι κάτι, κάτι το οποίο είναι εύκολο. Πρέπει να σας πω ότι επειδή και οι προηγούμενοι ομιλητές αναφέρθηκαν στις, στον, το πόσο αντιμετωπίζουν οι ιδιοκτήτε των διαμερισμάτων αυτές τις, αυτούς τους ανθρώπους, αυτές τις κατηγορίες των υποψήφιων ε, ενοικιαστών, πρέπει να πω ότι είναι πράγματι κάτι το οποίο ενδεχομένως και αυτό το συμπόσιο θα μπορέσει να βρει, να βρει μια καλή πρακτική προσέγγισης γιατί θεωρούμε ότι σε κάθε περίπτωση η, 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 η κατοικία είναι ενσωμάτωση και ενσωμάτωση πραγματική. Δεν είναι μόνο μια στέγη πάνω από το κεφάλι αλλά είναι μια πραγματική διαδικασία ενσωμάτωσης σε μια, σε μια κοινωνία η οποία μπορεί με, τη, με, με, με την κατοικία, δηλαδή μια, μια, μια κοινωνία η οποία μπορεί μέσα σε ένα οικιστικό σύστημα να ενσωματώσει με τις διάφορες λειτουργίες της τους πολίτες οι οποίοι έχουν πραγματική ανάγκη. Ένα πρόβλημα που υπάρχει στην Αθήνα και θέλω να το τονίσω είναι ότι τα περισσότερα ζητήματα... Οι περισσότεροι πληθυσμοί κινούνται στο κέντρο της πόλης, σε συγκεκριμένες περιοχές, με αποτέλεσμα να μην υπάρχει διασπορά και των προσφύγων και των μεταναστών και των αστέγων. Έτσι, οι δομές οι οποίες καλούμαστε να δημιουργήσουμε ή η κοινωνική κατοικία, τα διάφορα διαμερίσματα, επειδή το κτηριακό απόθεμα στο κέντρο της πόλης είναι πιο απαξιωμένο, είναι αρκετά διαμερίσματα τα οποία δεν λειτουργούνται γιατί έχουν φύγει οι ιδιοκτήτε και έχουν πάει σε άλλες περιοχές με αποτέλεσμα το διαθέσιμο κτηριακό απόθεμα να επικεντρώνεται σε συγκεκριμένες περιοχές. Αυτό δημιουργεί διάφορα ζητήματα στη λειτουργία των, της κοινωνίας έτσι όπως το αντιλαμβάνεται βέβαια. Ότι η, και με το δεδομένο ότι υπάρχει αυτή η καχυποψία των ιδιοκτητών 
για αυτούς τους πληθυσμού. Πρέπει να αντιμετωπίσουμε και αυτό το ζήτημα και αυτό είναι μια, μια, το αναφέρω, διότι αυτό ίσως είναι και ένα στοιχείο το οποίο πρέπει να το επεξεργαστούμε σε, και εσείς να το επεξεργαστείτε στα πλαίσια αυτού του συμποσίου. Δεν θέλω να πω πολλά για το κύριο Μιντελίμπο, το θεωρώ υπόδειγμα πρόγραμμα και για το διαμεσολαβητικό ρόλο που έχει, αλλά και για όλες τις διαδικασίες, το Γραφείο Κοινωνική Μίσθωσης και όλες τις πρωτοβουλίες τις οποίες έχω τη χαρά να τις παρακολουθώ. Ε, αυτή η καλή πρακτική πρέπει να μας βοηθήσει να εφαρμόσουμε τέτοιου είδους προγράμματα στέγασης, πραγματικά, δηλαδή αυτό το scale-up το οποίο πραγματικά όλοι επιδιώκουμε, είναι η ώρα να χρησιμοποιήσουμε την καλή αυτή πρακτική. Άλλωστε, αυτός ήταν και ο λόγος το οποίο ενεκρίθη αυτό το πρόγραμμα και χρηματοδοτήθηκε, ώστε να αποτελεί ένα πρόγραμμα που θα δώσει καλή πρακτική, αλλά αυτό πρέπει να πάψει να είναι ένα μικρό πρόγραμμα, αλλά πρέπει να αποκτήσει χαρακτηριστικά μιας συγκεκριμένης πολιτικής στέγασης, το οποίο πρέπει να αναζητήσει και πηγές χρηματοδότηση. Ε... Τι θέλω να πω, ότι η, η, η πραγματικότητα με εξαίρεση της, τη χρηματοδότηση του προγράμματος Εστία και του Ήλιος για το θέμα της ε, κοινωνικής στέγασης, όπως ανέφερε και ο κύριος Γενικό προηγουμένω, ότι πρέπει, επειδή γίνεται ένα πιλωτικό που εντάσσεται σε, στη χρηματοδότηση του Ταμείου Ανάκαμψης, ε, πρέπει να αποκτήσει πιο μόνιμα χαρακτηριστικά. Πρέπει να γίνει ε, ε, μια τακτική χρηματοδοτική διαδικασία μέσα από τους πόρους του, ε, του ΕΚΤ, του Κοινωνικού Ταμείου. Α, μόνο με αυτόν τον τρόπο και όταν οι δικαιούχοι που θα είναι κατά πάσα πιθανότητα οι Δήμοι ή άλλοι φορείς οι οποίοι θέλουν να λάβουν μια χρηματοδότηση, πρέπει να έχουν ένα σταθερό χρηματοδοτικό εργαλείο έτσι ώστε να εφαρμόζουν πολιτικές στέγασεις οι οποίες θα είναι βιώσιμες. Η, η, η αναζήτηση κάθε φορά κάποιας ευκαιρίας χρηματοδότησης δεν δίνει συνέχεια στην υπόθεση της στέγασης ε, όλων αυτών των ομάδων. Όταν μόνο θεσπίσουμε τον κανόνα της, χρημα, της διαρκούς χρηματοδότησης των πρωτοβουλειών ε, στέγασης και αποτελεί μία τακτική διαδικασία, τότε πράγματι και οι θεσμοί οι οποίοι εμπλέκονται, οι Δήμοι και οι άλλοι θεσμοί, θα μπορούν να επεξεργάζονται σοβαρές λύσεις και στους ιδιοκτήτες και στον ιδιωτικό τομέα θα αποτελεί ένα κίνητρο διακρίνοντας μια διάρκεια και ένα περιεχόμενο στις σχέσεις που θέλουν να αποκτήσουν με τους, με τους, με τους, με αυτές τις ομάδες, με τους μελλοντικούς τους νικάριδες. Αυτό λοιπόν είναι ε, κάτι το οποίο ε, έχει απασχολήσει το Δήμο της Αθήνας και εμείς στο Υπουργείο ε, Απασχόλησης ε, θα υποβάλουμε μια πρόταση, τεχνικά επεξεργασμένη πρόταση, έτσι ώστε να υπάρχει μια, ένα μέτρο, να υπάρχει δηλαδή μια εξειδίκευση στο επιχειρησιακό του πρόγραμμα που να δίνει τη δυνατότητα στους Δήμους που ε, ασχολούνται που θέλουν να ασχοληθούν σοβαρά με αυτό το πρόγραμμα, ε, να, να, να χρηματοδοτηθούν και να οργανώσουν το θέμα ε, της ε, στέγασης της, με βιώσιμο τρόπο, όπως είπα προηγουμένως. Αυτό νομίζω ότι είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικό, διότι στην πραγματικότητα η, το θέμα της ε, στέγασης, της κοινωνικής κατοικίας, δεν έχει σε αυτή τη χώρα δεν έχει αντιμετωπιστεί με αποτελεσματικό τρόπο, ούτε με συστηματικό τρόπο. Γι' αυτό εμείς θα πάρουμε αυτή την πρωτοβουλία και θα υποβάλουμε μια συγκεκριμένη και ολοκληρωμένη πρόταση, που δεν επεξεργαζόμαστε τώρα με την βοήθεια της αναπτυξιακής μας εταιρεία, αντλώντας τις εμπειρίες από το ΕΣΤΙΑ, φυσικά από το κ. Ρελίμπο και ό,τι άλλες το κέντρο αστέγων, έτσι ώστε να έχει τα τεχνικά χαρακτηριστικά της βιωσιμότητας και της χρηματοδοτικής επάρκειας. Αυτά ήθελα να πω εγώ. Σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για το πρόσκληση και για το χρόνο που μου δώσατε να μιλήσω. Και είμαι στη διάθεσή σας. Ευχαριστώ.
Um, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Tsatsiami, for this hopeful presentation. I think it's very uh, sincere and promising the fact that the uh, municipality, the city of Athens, considers uh, housing um, um, an issue that needs to be addressed systematically, needs to allocate the necessary resources so it could, could be uh, sustainable and uh, not just. Uh, uh, depending on sporadic and spasmodic uh, funding opportunity and also will use the lessons learned from uh, curing the limbo um, uh, to inform uh, the best practices. There is one uh, question addressed to you and I will uh, address it uh, now. On the issue of lack of affordable quality units for rent in the city, curious to know if there is any minimum standard selection criteria for apartments and if there is any budget to repair potential units. Να το πω στα ελληνικά. Όχι, το κατάλαβα. Μιλάμε για το εστία, το πρόγραμμα, δεν κατάλαβα την ερώτηση. Μιλάμε συνολικότερα και για όλα τα προγράμματα στα οποία αναφερθήκατε και αυτή τη στιγμή χρησιμοποιούν, είναι γενική ερώτηση, δεν το συγκεκριμενοποιεί. Αυτή τη στιγμή το πρόγραμμα το οποίο πέραν από αυτή την πρωτοβουλία που είπαμε ότι θα ξεκινήσει για το Ταμείο Ανάκαμψης, το πρόγραμμα το οποίο παρέχει κοινωνική κατοικία σε ιδιωτικέ όχι σε δομές, αλλά σε ε, ιδιωτικά ακίνητα, ε, αυτή τη στιγμή δεν υπάρχει. Δεν, υπά, δεν υπάρχει ένα πρόγραμμα όπου ο Δήμος, πέρα, επαναλαμβάνω πέρα από το Εστία, όπου εκεί πέρα υπάρχει μια διαδικασία, υπάρχουν συγκεκριμένα κριτήρια και υπάρχουν συγκεκριμένους προϋπολογισμός. Η αναπτυξιακή εταιρεία του Δήμου Αθηναίων το τρέ, έχει, έχει τις διαδικασίες και τους κανονισμούς. Άρα, στην πραγματικότητα, ναι, υπάρχουν συγκεκριμένα κριτήρια και συγκεκριμένο ύψος χρηματοδότηση, αλλά σε επίπεδο κοινωνικής κατοικίας για τους άστεγους στην πόλη, ως δομές πέραν των δομών, βεβαίως είναι αυτονόητο ότι στις δομές της πόλης όποιος είναι δωρεάν να είναι κοινωνική κατοικία, δεν ξέρω αν πρέπει να το υπογραμμίσω αυτό, αλλά σε κάθε περίπτωση το πετυχημένο μοντέλο δεν είναι να υπάρχει ε, δωρεάν κατοικία. Η κοινωνική κατοικία, κατά την άποψή μου, πρέπει να συνδυάζεται με ένα μικρό ενίκιο, με ένα ενίκιο το οποίο να είναι affordable για τον αυτό που συμμετέχει, γιατί και να επιδοτείται από το κράτος, από το Δήμο, αλλά να είναι ένα μηχανισμός ώστε η κατοικία να αποτελεί και υπόθεση του ωφελούμενου. Ε, αυτή τη στιγμή, κοινωνική κατοικία σε, στους, σε, σαν δομές στο Δήμο ε, δεν υπάρχουν. Ε, για να νομίζω ότι η ερώτηση αφορούσε στην επιλογή των διαπαιρισμάτων πολύ συγκεκριμένα και αν υπάρχουν συγκεκριμένα κριτήρια που επιλέγετε διαμερίσματα για τη στέγαση έχουν... Νομίζω, δεν κατάλαβα, νομίζω ότι ήταν... Ναι. Ε, Τα διαμερίσματα επιλέγονται... Πιλόκια. Γίνονται προσκλήσεις εκδήλωσης ενδιαφέροντος για την αιστεία από, τους, από την αναπτυξιακή. Υπάρχουν κατηγορίες... Προσπαθούμε να μην είναι σε ό, όλοι στο τρίτο, τέταρτο και πέμπτο δημοτικό διαμέρισμα όπου εκεί εντοπίζουμε τα προβλήματα. Εξετάζουμε την, την κατάσταση, την, την κατάσταση τους, ποια είναι τα, τα δομικά χαρακτηριστικά, πώς είναι διαμορφωμένα, αν έχουν όλα τα facilities για να λειτουργήσει και στην πορεία αποφασίζουμε αυτό το, το μηχανισμό με ένα μηχανισμό ενοικίασης, με βάση κάποια κριτήρια να είναι, αντιλαμβάνεστε ότι δεν θέλουμε να είναι εγκατελειμμένα και να, να μπορούν να είναι βιώσιμη η, η κατοικία και να μπορεί να α, ε, φιλοξενήσει σοβαρά τις οικογένειες που στεγάζουμε. Ε, άρα τα κριτήρια στην πραγματικότητα είναι ε, τέτοια ώστε να μπορούν να είναι λειτουργικά και γρήγορα ε, να να κατηγηθούν. Ε, ευχαριστούμε πολύ. Ε, ένα 
ε, πολύ μικρό σχόλιο. Στι χώρε όπου υπάρχει συνεισφορά για, και για το ενίκαιο, όπω αναφέρθηκε, θα ήταν χρήσιμο, πιστεύουμε, να ληφθεί υπόψη ότι υπάρχουν και άλλου είδου παροχέ ε, στου ανθρώπου, προκειμένου να ανταποξέλθουν και σε αυτέ τι ε, προσκλη... προκλήσει. Και στην καθημερινότητα, ώστε πραγματικά να είναι βιώσιμο και να μην είναι κάτι το οποίο. Οπότε, στην κουβέντα που θα γίνει και στην επεξεργασία των προτάσεων, καλό θα ήταν να. Ε, υπάρχει μια συνολική θεώρηση για το τι είναι εφικτό και ποιε θα είναι οι παροχέ στου ανθρώπου που αντιμετωπίζουν συγκεκριμένα ε, ζητήματα για να μπορούν να ανταπεξέλθουν στι ε, καθημερινέ του ανάγκε. Ε, thank you very much. I, I would like we move now to our next uh, speaker, Mrs. Alice Pitini, Research Coordinator in Housing Europe, to Uh, give us an overview of uh, the state of affairs at European level and uh, to contribute to certain challenges and also give an idea of potential funding uh, possibilities to see recommendations and challenges to move forward. Thank you very much, Thank Alice. you very much. Thank you for the invitation uh, to participate to this very interesting discussion today. I will uh, uh, share my screen because I have prepared um, a small presentation. I hope that you can see it all right. Can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, my name is Alicia Pittini. I'm research director at Housing Europe, uh, the European Federation of uh, Cooperative Public and uh, Social Housing. We uh, represent a network of uh, 45 national and regional housing providers across uh, 24 countries uh, in the EU uh, and uh, in the larger uh, European region. Um, altogether, they manage uh, about 25 million homes across Europe and they represent uh, about 43,000 uh, housing organizations on the ground. Um, our network um, carries out uh, several different activities. So we work on uh, policy. Uh, we focus a lot on EU policy to monitor policy developments and try to uh, influence uh, policy outcomes at European level so that uh, they have a um, A beneficial impact on the affordable housing uh, uh, sector. We also uh, work on uh, exchange of good practices and capacity building um, for our members, but also uh, with a number of, uh, of uh, partners um, at different levels. And we also have an observatory that I'm responsible for, which um, carries out its own research on specific topics related to housing and also generally monitors what are the main Uh, trends and developments uh, in housing across uh, Europe. So uh, we recently published the last uh, edition of our main report, the state of housing uh, in Europe. And um, what we focused on this year is basically the recent changing in the housing landscape at European level, uh, keeping in mind the impact of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So what, uh, if we have to summarize uh, the main findings of the report is that Europe was already facing uh, a crisis in terms of uh, uh, housing affordability and availability of decent and affordable housing. Um, already in 2019, uh, more than 17% of the European population was living in homes uh, that are overcrowded. About 10% of the overall population uh, was facing housing costs that were disproportionate compared to their income. And this share is even much higher if we look at uh, the population uh, living on low income with over 35% of them spending more than 40% of their income on housing. Uh, of course, the situation differs uh, very much across countries, uh, across population groups. Uh, one uh, interesting point that I, uh, we also, um, I think, have to keep in mind is that often tenants are the ones that are more, most likely to suffer for, from uh, uh, disproportionate housing costs. And um, housing costs tend to be higher in cities compared to uh, smaller towns or rural areas. What we see uh, one year into the, the COVID crisis is that, uh, of course, 
um, the pandemic has really shown that uh, inequalities in housing have uh, a number of additional um, impacts, uh, first and foremost on health, with a number of studies that have highlighted how uh, overcrowding, uh, inadequate housing conditions uh, lead to uh, a higher uh, incidence uh, of COVID and even higher mortality. But of course also uh, the way we live and the, the kind of homes that we have uh, uh, available have a strong impact on well-being and mental health and also on things like school performance of kids and um, recently also very important the possibility for people to uh, work remotely. So because of all these elements um, we see that there is an increased attention uh, around the issue of adequate and affordable housing at the European and international level, with uh, very interesting uh, uh, reports and publications produced by European institutions, by the OECD, but also by a number of uh, European uh, uh, partners, such as uh, FEANSA, who is here today um, uh, with us in the symposium, and, um, and others, such as Eurocities um, and Housing Europe, of course. So what has been the impact so far um, on housing needs and housing demand uh, if we look at uh, before and uh, the aftermath of the, of the pandemic? Um, the overall uh, economic situation and the economic forecast for Europe uh, all point at uh, a very likely increase uh, in poverty and uh, in inequality in the near future. And a number of um, institutions uh, are already flagging uh, the, the risk that this will in inevitably lead to a, an increased demand for social and affordable housing. Uh, and this will be on top of uh, what are al already very large uh, unmet needs for housing, especially uh, from vulnerable groups, uh, from lower income groups, but also a, a diversification of demand. What we see today is, for instance, uh, typically uh, middle class households that in the past wouldn't have had problems accessing uh, housing uh, and even home ownership uh, find themselves in, in a more precarious situation that, that doesn't um, allow them um, to, um, to secure uh, decent housing. And there are a number of other groups, of course, uh, migrants and refugees were mentioned a lot today. Uh, but also uh, young people, for instance, coming to the city to work or to study, and uh, older people uh, on the other end of the, of the age um, uh, pyramid, they also have uh, specific needs and um, um, a general need for adapting homes so that people can live longer, healthier lives in their homes. But um, although the evidence is still scarce, we already see the impact of this pandemic uh, in some countries. For instance, just to give you a few numbers, in England, um, there are already uh, over one million households on the waiting list for social housing, and they are foreseen to nearly double to two millions uh, next year. Uh, also, um, in the Czech Republic, Caritas carried out an interesting uh, survey um, which shows that um, one in four tenants uh, now fears that they will have to leave their current home in the future because they will no longer be able to uh, afford their rents. Also in Italy, um, the share of uh, tenants with arrears on rent payments just over one year, so from 2019 to 2020, jumped from around 10% to uh, 24%. So we already see that the impact uh, that this pandemic is having on incomes uh, is also affecting the, the possibility for people uh, to secure and maintain uh, decent housing. If we look at policy responses, um, most countries in Europe have put in place um, schemes to support incomes uh, and also to make sure that uh, people did not risk losing their homes uh, during the pandemic, typically with the Mm, moratorium evictions, um, um, deferral of rent payments, of mortgage payments, uh, and, and similar emergency and temporary measures. But um, indeed, these measures are not supposed to um, 
be permanent on a permanent basis. And what is really needed uh, is a shift from this type of uh, uh, emergency measures to a long-term perspective um, and a long-term change in housing policies to um, guarantee the availability of more affordable and decent housing. And this is not uh, yet uh, happening in a sustained uh, way across Europe. Also, interestingly, uh, and here we see really the interaction of European and national level, uh, we see that many countries actually foresee investment in housing through their national recovery plans. Um, there are some examples such as France, um, Italy, Portugal and Spain, with a combination of uh, major investment in housing renovation in line with the Green Deal uh, priorities. Uh, but also programs to um, uh, increase the availability of uh, social housing uh, in urban areas. So um, we are very keen on following the, uh, these development and we were very happy to hear uh, from um, the Ministry that also Greece uh, is looking at uh, the potential use of a recovery plan for social housing uh, uh, pilot programs. So what about Greece uh, in this context? Um, so there are some, some elements uh, that really is, are really striking uh, in Greece compared to other countries. Uh, first of all, it's important to mention that unfortunately um, for some years now, Greece is the country in the Euro European Union that is displaying the highest uh, rate of housing cost over burden. Uh, you see it in the chart at the bottom left uh, on, this, on this slide. So if the European average is around 10%, uh, Europe, uh, Greece is uh, over 35%. And of course, uh, if we look at people on low income, here we see that almost 70% of them um, are facing disproportionate housing costs, which is of course a, a serious cause of concern. Um, also, uh, compared to other European countries, Greece has a high uh, level of uh, arrears, uh, whether it's a mortgage, rent, or even just utility bills. Um, and this also shows that the fact that although there, there's widespread home ownership uh, in Greece, this um, doesn't mean that homeowners are sheltered from, uh, from facing high housing costs. There is no social rental housing in Greece. This is a bit of an exception. Um, it was mentioned before uh, by other panelists. Um, but of course, we are following these new developments and the, the new uh, schemes that are, uh, are put in place with great interest. Um, although we believe, of course, there's a need to switch from a um, very local uh, and I would almost say pilot experiences to a more uh, systematic approach. Of course, there are specific vulnerable groups, but there's also general concern uh, with affordability overall, uh, especially for tenants and especially in cities. But we see uh, there are also, um, we're, in a, we're in a situation where there are some opportunities at the moment that could be seized. For instance, the fact that there is a decline in foreign demand at the moment and in uh, decline in short term lettings, and there's also a high uh, vacancy rate uh, in Greece can uh, offer an opportunity to indeed um, work with the uh, private uh, owners uh, to use uh, the housing stock for social goals, uh, but also why not uh, for local authorities and for state authorities to acquire um, housing uh, so as to build a permanent uh, stock of, um, of homes to be used for social housing. But to Look at the European context from uh, the point of view of funding opportunities now. Uh, I think it's also important to highlight that uh, we're uh, in, a, in a relatively new um, European policy landscape in terms of opportunities. So if we compare the situation today compared to the aftermath of the global cr uh, financial crisis in 2009, uh, what we see is that then we had, of course, austerity. Uh, which had a tremendous uh, impact on our societies. But today, uh, the Stability and Growth Pact has been temporarily put on hold uh, and member states are allowed basically to, uh, to, to spend more, to, to invest uh, through public expenditure um, with both emergency measures and uh, with a longer term perspective through the recovery plans. 
Also very important, so the European Union has now a clear mandate to implement and respect social rights because of the adoption of the European pillar of social rights and of course principle 19 uh, include the right to uh, access social housing and uh, assistance for the homeless. So a very important step that is also supposed to be a, a guiding light for all uh, the different European policies and programs in the future. Uh, also, the EU has made the Green Deal um, and the fair energy transition um, a clear, clear priority, which of course include the decarbonization of the building stock with um, the construction of nearly zero energy buildings and the renovation of uh, the, the, old, uh, the old ones. Also, um, very recently, another positive sign from the European Parliament, this time uh, which adopted the um, report on access to decent and affordable housing for all, calling uh, on both the Commission and the Member States to develop a more coherent approach. More concretely, so what could be opportunities for, for Greece in this new context? We have, of course, the new cohesion policy uh, with um, uh, strong uh, prioritization, uh, for instance, of um, uh, sustainable um, and, and, and smart uh, development. This includes, of course, uh, energy efficiency renovation of the existing housing stock and uh, demonstration projects and supporting measures. There's also a stronger urban dimension compared to the previous uh, round uh, of structural funds with 6% of the European Regional Development Fund dedicated to sustainable urban development. Um, this is budget that will go straight to the cities to implement uh, their urban development strategies, which can include, of course, affordable and social housing and um, a new networking and capacity building program, which will be called the European Urban Initiative, uh, which sounds very promising. Of course, there's also a renewed uh, European Social Fund. And um, with regards to this, we've seen uh, in the previous uh, programming period, interesting examples, for instance, from Czech Republic of the possibility to use the ESF for capacity building for public authorities to uh, build uh, social housing programs uh, the central and municipal level uh, together. There's also, of course, uh, Next Generation Europe, so um, the recovery uh, and resilience uh, programs that were already mentioned. And last but not least, there is, of course, uh, an increased um, availability of finance, so of loans this time, from the European Investment Bank. Um, but interestingly, uh, this can be backed with a new InvestEU fund that will act uh, as a guarantee on the loans that can mean um, more risky investments can be taken on board by the bank uh, and also better lending conditions. And this uh, guarantee will also be available to other financial institutions such as the Council of Europe uh, uh, Development Bank, which is also uh, increasing his, um, its uh, social housing uh, investment portfolio. But of course, all these opportunities will not be seized unless there is a, a real uh, policy uh, change in terms of uh, establishing a long-term framework uh, for the cooperation between the different uh, level of governance for better social housing policies. And with regards to this, and on this I will close my presentation, uh, Housing Europe um, has signed a memorandum of understanding with the municipality of Athens two years ago for um, to cooperate uh, with the city to promote local social housing policies and to establish a social housing observatory uh, to identify um, the areas um, for need and, and support. And of course, we would like to renew uh, in, this, in this occasion our willingness to cooperate with the city of Athens. And also, um, we've recently uh, launched an initiative with the UNECE and UN Habitat that is called Housing 2030, that um, is producing a, a sort of policy toolkit um, to um, offer ideas and illustrations for policymakers at national and local level on governance, on uh, uh, land policy, on um, climate neutral housing, and on uh, uh, financing uh, uh, affordable housing. So um, with this, I will close my presentation, but of course uh, um, I'm myself available uh, for questions and uh, Housing Europe is hoping to cooperate uh, with you more in the future.
So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alice, for your uh, very hands-on practical uh, uh, presentation beyond the provision of the state of the art. I would kindly ask uh, the next uh, panelists to really uh, reduce their time to 10 minutes and try to focus on the really most important uh, things due to the uh, time uh, pressure and apologizing deeply for uh, this time pressure. Uh, so to allow and to have some space for questions and uh, discussion with uh, people participating here, even if limited. So I would kindly ask uh, Fritz Pinewin, the director of EANSA, to enlighten uh, about uh, uh, curing the limbo, whether it is a Greek issue or a European issue, and whether there would be uh, potential alliances around there to combat uh, homelessness at EU level. Thank you, uh, Joanna. I hope you all hear me. Uh, good morning to uh, everybody. Uh, I'll try to stick to 10 minutes, um, uh, Joanna. I think it's possible. I would like to say uh, first uh, a few words about uh, homelessness and the um, uh, recent developments in the European Union. Uh, then maybe a few words about uh, refugees and homelessness and how uh, they are related. And then um, end with a few words on the housing solutions um, uh, for, this, um, uh, for this population. So let me start with uh, a few words about uh, homelessness. Uh, we estimate in Fianza um, that there is uh, at least 700,000 people um, uh, that sleep in a shelter or on the street on any given day uh, in the European uh, Union. Uh, uh, what is probably more important than the than that total number is that uh, that number has increased by 70 percent, 70 uh, percent uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, and the estimate of 700,000 people is an estimate that predates uh, Corona uh, and uh, everybody expects uh, another spike uh, in homelessness after uh, uh, Corona. Um, now, this is a, a point in time um, uh, figure, so it's if you count um, uh, today. Uh, but uh, if you look at the people that experience homelessness over the period of the year, um, you're talking about millions um, uh, of people. What is interesting is that we see, or we have seen the increase in the last 10 years in almost all EU member states, uh, with the exception uh, of Finland. Uh, even if we saw slight decreases or um, a stabilization uh, very recently in a number of countries like the Netherlands for instance. So the increase is not only an increase in countries with um, uh, uh, less robust social welfare systems, but also in countries that have that are known uh, for the strength of their welfare system, uh, such as countries like Denmark, uh, uh, for instance. Now, there is, and I, can, I don't have the time to go into, into great detail, but there is a multitude of causes um, uh, for this increase. Uh, and I'm not, going into, uh, I'm not going to list them here, uh, but it's clear that um, the continued stress in the housing market is one uh, of the uh, major causes. But another one, and this is related to the topic of this seminar uh, today, is that the flaws in migration policy at European level and at national level actually spiral over into the homeless sector. Uh, so you could say that the flaws of the migration policy produce uh, more homelessness. When I started working for FEANSA 20 years ago, um, uh, um, the, the, the impact of migration on homelessness was really an issue for the south of Europe, Italy, Spain, uh, Greece, where we regularly saw um, um, uh, numbers showing that half of the homeless population or the sheltered population was uh, a migrant. Uh, but now, and certainly since the migration crisis in 2015, this is also uh, an issue for uh, the other parts of Europe, especially North Europe. Now you see uh, similar figures in countries like Germany and Sweden, for instance. Uh, uh, probably much less still in uh, in Eastern Europe, but you could say that migration and homelessness and the way they're inter, uh, intertwined is becoming a bigger European issue and not just limited to the south uh, uh, of Europe. And of course, most uh, of the migrants that um, uh, uh, experience homelessness are undocumented migrants, but we also see asylum seekers in the homeless system uh, and also uh, refugees. And that brings me to the second bit of the uh, presentation, how uh, are uh, refugees and homelessness actually uh, uh, connected? Um, 
maybe I'm stating the obvious, but refugees are, of course, also confronted with the stressed housing market like anybody uh, else, you know. And if you look, uh, and uh, Alicia already gave a number of uh, uh, figures, if you look at, um, at the European Union, and I'll try to be a bit more specific than uh, 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 Alicia, you see that 40% of the people in poverty uh, are in housing cost uh, overboard, overburden. And that has increased over the last couple of years. And in Greece, it's almost eight out of 10 people in poverty that are in housing cost overburden, which means that they spend more than 40% of their income on housing. 30% of the people in poverty are in overcrowded uh, accommodation um, or, or overcrowded housing. Um, that has gone down a little bit uh, over the last couple of years, but in Greece, it still affects half of the population, almost half of the population. And 10% are in severe housing deprivation, um, uh, and there Greece is uh, uh, in the average. So this is what the, 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 the population in poverty is confronted with when they try to access housing. Uh, refugees are often in poverty as well, so they're confronted with the same uh, difficulties. And that leads to um, uh, uh, refugees having difficulties to access the housing market and in extreme cases becoming homeless. And let me give me just a few numbers here. Um, we see countries where up to one, uh, one out of five of the beds in an asylum center, in asylum centers, in the asylum system, are occupied by refugees. So people that have actually obtained um, the permission to stay in the countries. This is the case in countries like France uh, and the Netherlands. In a country like Germany, for instance, there is more refugees in asylum centers, overstaying in asylum centers, than there is homeless in shelters. Uh, and these people, refugees stay overstaying in asylum centers because they cannot access housing, are counted as homeless uh, in uh, Germany. So that's quite, uh, quite interesting. And of course, the shorter the uh, overstay that is allowed um, uh, is in a country, the more likely people are to become homeless. And typically, um, uh, refugees, when they have obtained the refugee status, uh, can stay two to three months uh, in uh, an asylum center, and then they have to move on. That leads, of course, to situations like in France, where uh, the latest data from 2017, I think, that 10,000 um, refugees uh, left that year uh, the asylum centers without any secure accommodation. So some of them, of course, become homeless. And in a city like Paris, 15% of the rough sleepers uh, are refugees, are people with the refugee um, uh, status. So that's all quite uh, shocking figures, um, but still the issue of homelessness and housing exclusion amongst refugees is not sufficiently addressed, not at local level, not at national level, and not at European level. A recent survey uh, of the local social services in Belgium, for instance, um, uh, where um, um, the uh, uh, officials were asked uh, how long do uh, refugees need to actually secure um, 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 uh, decent accommodation, they said that it was at least six months that was needed. Uh, and uh, I told you already that in most countries it's uh, two to three months that uh, uh, refugees are allowed to overstay uh, in the shelters. And of course there was countries that had uh, good support systems in place like Italy and uh, Greece. Uh, the Helios program was mentioned already, but these programs uh, are suffering from uh, budget cuts, cuts with all the consequences that they can have. The last thing that I wanted to say is um, uh, about housing and housing solutions for this uh, the group of the population. It was said many times before me, but it's good to repeat it again. Uh, housing is a tool of integration and it should not be uh, considered as the end result of a positive integration process. Like if you don't have access to stable, settled, long-term accommodation, it's very difficult to integrate in society. And that's also true uh, for refugees, uh, obviously. Uh, probably there is a too strong emphasis on employment, um, but even uh, uh, getting access to employment is difficult if you have an unstable housing situation. Now, where uh, should this housing be found uh, 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 for refugees and other people uh, um, uh, experiencing housing exclusion uh, or homelessness? The, the, the most straightforward way is to access social uh, housing, and uh, Alice already said it um, uh, before. Um, but there is two buts. Uh, one is that often uh, countries impose conditions on um, the time people have to live in a country or in an area before they can access uh, social housing, typically three, four, five uh, years. And also, and that's a reality, um, the social housing uh, uh, sector is quite small in most EU countries and inexistent in a number of countries like uh, in Greece. In most countries, it's less than 10 uh, uh, percent. So it's difficult to uh, expect from the social housing sector to 
uh, solve all housing exclusion problems, including the exclusion uh, experienced by refugees. Nevertheless, there is some countries that now have priority allocation mechanisms um, uh, of social housing for uh, refugees, like the Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, Sweden, uh, and uh, and all. So I think investing more in social housing is the way to go, but it takes time. And in the meantime, I think we also, and there is room and potential to socialize the private rental sector. Uh, and that can be done by the social rental agencies. I'm not going to detail because there is other people speaking later on the program that are um, uh, better placed than me to speak about it. But we can uh, 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 stress that it works and it's a quick uh, solution. But there is two buts there as well. We have to be modest about how many houses can be socialized in the private rental sector. It's not unlimited, uh, and it's quite an expensive um, uh, form of uh, providing affordable, um, uh, affordable housing. But it's quick, and uh, quick is necessary in these uh, times. And then, of course, um, we need uh, uh, robust housing allowance systems um, uh, targeted as well. Um, they're also quick. Uh, they might have an inflationary effect, and be also quite expensive, but uh, uh, important to have a nice mix between uh, housing allowance and social housing. And the last, and I'm going to end my presentation, uh, is that we have to uh, fill the gaps by uh, innovating. And again, I cannot go into a great detail, but there is so much potential to uh, innovate in the provision of affordable housing that affects both the private providers and the social providers. There is huge developments in the construction uh, sector, cheap construction, container build. 20 years ago, I would say putting people in containers is awful idea. Now it has evolved so much that maybe it can provide part of the solution. There's a lot of vacancy, it has been mentioned, vacancy in buildings, in housing as well. Office space, especially in the aftermath of Corona, there will be a lot of empty office space. Can that be turned into housing units, etc.? Um, um, the, there is new financial vehicles. I heard that in Spain they're just creating a new uh, first in Europe. I think social real estate uh, investment trust uh, targeted at homeless housing, homeless people. So there is lots of potential uh, in the area of innovation that we have to um, that we have to embrace. And all of that innovation we try to capture in a knowledge platform that is called Housing Solutions Platform. I invite you to go to the website of the Housing Solutions Platform. It's a, it's a network, it's a, it's a learning network that we run together with, uh, with Housing Europe. Sorry to be a bit quick and superficial, but I hope I still managed to add to uh, the debate later today. Thanks for the invitation again. They are, uh, they, thank you very much, Freak, for sticking really to the restricted uh, time and actually mentioning certain facts that are affecting and can, should be uh, taken into consideration when planning, uh, planning social housing uh, in, uh, at local level or at national level. Important to consider. I would like to now invite uh, Laura Collini expert of, for uh, urban innovative actions and urban initiatives to uh, enlighten us about uh, how important is the engagement of local authorities and the municipalities at uh, different uh, cities around Europe and how that could be possible. Uh, yeah, do you hear me? Good morning, everyone. Do you hear me? I'm not sure. Yes, we can. Hi. Um, good morning and thank you for inviting me um, and to join this uh, interesting symposium. Uh, my perspective is the one of an urbanist, uh, um, and I'm working for uh, UIA and uh, Orbat programs. There are two European programs uh, dealing with uh, a broad range of issues in, um, in urban policies, not specifically on housing. But uh, we focused on housing because of a particular moment in time, and I would like to uh, quickly go through what we did in this initiative, of which also um, Curing the Limbo was part of, uh, being part of uh, UIA. So my presentation, and I tried to stick as well in the 10 minutes, is uh, I would like to look where, where we are in the terms of um, uh, the urban policy dimension where we work, um, why we uh, took this city centre uh, framework and approach for the initiatives, what we did, and next steps. Um, as I was saying before, um, 
we are not really focusing specifically on housing. When I say we, I, re I refer to the two European programs that I'm uh, actually representing here. So one is the UIA, the one that funded uh, also here in the limbo. It's an instrument of uh, a particular instrument of the European Commission that directly funds uh, cities innovative practices with a fairly recent uh, generous uh, budget of the directly of uh, ERDF. Um, with up to five million for each project for co-financing with uh, municipalities. And it's, uh, I think in the sense what Frick was saying is a, a potential for innovating uh, at the local scale. Um, and then we have Urbact that has a, a much uh, limited budget and it's a program uh, focusing exclusively on exchange of practices and on capacity buildings in which housing is one, part of it, but not the, the major part of it as uh, the other two speakers uh, organizations were addressing. Um, but we have some cities network that are really focusing on, uh, on housing related issues. And then we have, uh, that was a particular moment in uh, 2016 where the EU urban agenda was launched. Uh, the partnerships is for those who are not familiar. Uh, we have uh, in the EU urban agenda, a, a multi-level stakeholder, multi stakeholders that are organized themselves according to thematic partnerships. Uh, their participation is voluntary based. Uh, there is no funding directly to implement and experiment practices, but it's uh, um, an opportunity opportunity to uh, propose, because there is no obligation from the side of the European Commission to take them on board, to propose ideas in better regulation, better funding and better knowledge. So I want to say that from 2016, um, there was, a, at least from the perspective of the urban dimension of a European discourse, there was a moment in which housing got more prominent than it was before. Um, because of you know, this um, sort of uh, constellation of different initiatives coming together. And uh, as though it was repeated uh, so often that you doesn't have a, a, a specific mandate on housing, you could see that both programs uh, are working in this direction of addressing housing, but as well funding as uh, uh, Alicia was also saying before, uh, it can be used directly for uh, housing policies. So they remained uh, part of the decision of the sort of variety of the member states. So I skip completely all the description of why we start this for being the, the European condition because we had enough data from the previous speakers. And I want to say why we took a, um, a city center approach for this initiative that has been created for exchanging knowledge between uh, UIA and uh, Urbach cities. Because we think that governments are accountable, so at different levels, and cities administration have a very important role to play in implementing right to housing. So we also look at the, uh, not only at the administration as institution per se, but at this, um, what we can say the institutional thickness, including different types of uh, stakeholders. And we try to invite in one year uh, exchange initiatives, um, other uh, representatives, including the ones uh, that are part of the urban agenda as a fianza, um, housing Europe, Eurocities and so on but also including the voices of social movement city initiatives and focus specifically on um, practices that have been developed in within the two, uh, the two program UIA and ORBACT. So the thematic areas we looked at is collaborative housing, no one left behind and fair finance. Their division is also virtual in terms of topics because they're very much intertwined. Um, and so we focus on uh, uh, those practices that have, were developed within the programs and they, I think we could not cover everything to my point of view. There are many other aspects that have uh, left a little bit behind, but I want to give you a sense of what, uh, what kind of uh, discussions and uh, projects we looked at. So for instance, we looked at the uh, collaborative housing solutions as a, a not unique solution. So uh, it's not that uh, we sort of underestimate the, the, the priority of investing in the public social housing sector, but we also wanted to see how cities administration can actually support sort of uh, blooming different types of alternatives that are um, collaborative oriented and cities oriented. And so we have the uh, 
the um, case studies or presentation of um, traditional uh, cooperative housing as in Switzerland, uh, co-housing uh, initiatives in Berlin by social movements are also more focused on uh, one of the project that was also financed as a um, cure in the limbo called Calico um, is managed, co-managed by the CLTB um, in Brussels, Community uh, Land Trust. Um, it's adopting a model that secures the um, affordability of housing over uh, over um, uh, over 90 years. Uh, it has a, a structure of um, a sociocracy in the decision-making policies, and it includes a variety of actors that are active uh, at, um, at city level, neighborhood level, but not only. So the idea is to upscale the CLTB with, uh, or this model, which is an inter intergenerational uh, cohabitation model that includes uh, um, um, NGOs like uh, Angela D that is focusing on a feminist uh, uh, approach and a gender oriented uh, cohabitation. Uh, but also Passage is another NGO who's focusing on um, um, providing care at, uh, inside the same body, but care from life to death. So it, there's a, they call the Maison de Mourance and Maison uh, uh, de Naissance. And the intergeneration and the intercultural aspect is a main characteristic of this project. Um, the other, I've just skipped through some of the examples the, the, of the um, online conference that were held over one year time. The one was uh, dedicated to uh, No One Left Behind and mostly on uh, um, we had uh, the presence of uh, Fianza that uh, presented some of the data that uh, Freik was also talking about, but we looked at the examples like uh, um, uh, Curing the Limbo, but also other projects of UIA that were um, uh, focusing on uh, refugees and um, um, especially unaccompanied uh, young adults in Utrecht. All this information will be available on the website and I'm, I'm sort of skipping through them uh, to give a sense of what, uh, what you can find if you want to um, find more information. We also presented the work of uh, Roof Network is a network of Orbach cities. So it's not experimenting, actually creating a project as the one I was mentioning before, Calico, but is uh, supporting cities who are interested in um, implementing housing first as a, um, as a policies and to exchange on how really to uh, make this um, working on their localities and in different uh, conditions. Uh, last but not least was the event uh, related to fair finance and we had a, another case study from uh, UIA who's going to be presented uh, also today is a yes uh, we rent um, is, a, um, is a solution for um, creating a, a tenants cooperative at city level uh, to increase affordable and rental housing but we also looked at more um, broadly to the meaning of um, what does it mean to definancialize the housing sector uh, and we invited uh, both the MEP uh, Kim van Sparentak who's presented the report access to decent and affordable housing that was uh, um, mentioned before to be um, um, uh, accepted in form of voted in a resolution of uh, in January, but also on uh, looking at how as well the European funds uh, can um, uh, and are actually acting in financializing the housing sector. And so also to be aware that wherever we, um, whenever we talk about uh, funding, we also European funds, uh, there are like uh, lights and shadows to be taken on board. Uh, last but not least, we uh, had a special session at the European Week of Regions and Cities. Uh, again, it's another occasion for uh, pushing the, um, the debate on the right to housing at, um, uh, on a wider, in a wider uh, platform as the European Week of Regions and Cities. And we had um, uh, intervention of OECD. Uh, they were uh, they had published in the summer uh, quite interesting report on uh, um, policy responses and challenges. Um, but I would like to uh, close the my remark in a more um, uh, in a broader sense, saying that uh, uh, what we have seen now, what the kind of initiatives that we brought together. Um, last year uh, was designed a co-planned before COVID and uh, everything changed. Uh, and also we have seen a, a, um, an, an amazing push towards the 
creation of solution that were long weighted to a certain extent, like um, you know the moratoria on uh, rental payment, uh, the federal rental payment, uh, the moratoria on mortgage, and so on and so forth. That uh, some of the measures that are also Alicia was mentioning before. But we see this happening in a situation where uh, urgency is actually pushing. So what would be to um, uh, rethink actions of public governments, not only on uh, more uh, stable terms, but also in a way that uh, we are prepared and prevented um, with beyond uh, reaching the tipping point of the critical conditions in which uh, the uh, data becomes uh, more worrying and more shocking. So what, what does it mean to um, um, invest more on innovations in the sense of also trying uh, as much as um, as a uh, cure in the limbo was doing because at the beginning this urban innovative action action um, it's um, it was a complete experiment as well uh, at the european level and the idea is that uh, combining uh, public sector uh, investment on social housing on a more stable base, but together with uh, giving support for innovation towards uh, um, um, uh, more um, alter alternatives, uh, also community-based alternatives, can possibly lead to a, a systematic change. Um, the next step from our side um, is obviously looking at what is happening at European level, the um, uh, Portuguese presidency and uh, other events that have been uh, mentioned before, but also we have uh, the launching of the platform the 22 of April and it will include articles, but obviously the case studies that I was uh, mentioning uh, before, uh, the, some podcasts uh, uh, and videos of uh, case studies. Um, we were launching another action within the EU urban agenda on regulating uh, short-term rental platform and sustainable tourism. Uh, and also there will be other events promoted within urban networks like gender and housing in October, but also roof, especially focusing on uh, data sharing reg um, regarding homelessness and a promotion of housing first. Um, I stop here and um, I'm um, very happy if we can have a, a dialogue and debate and questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Laura Collini, for your uh, presentation and also sticking uh, to the time. Uh, there is uh, one, there is one question I would like actually to ask uh, you and the rest of the panelists, of course, is uh, it seems that there is a lot of uh, quite uh, at this uh, moment, uh, quite uh, certain opportunities uh, that could be used to move towards um, uh, more sustainable housing solution. And there are certain funding that can address these uh, needs. However, there are two things, there are different EU initiatives and it seems that there might be, a, let's say, duplication of efforts, funding and so on. And it's not very clear how all these are do coordinate and how they can be made, uh, let's say, used to, so we can, uh, cities and uh, interested uh, stakeholders can really use the maximum of it. And just the second one, uh, how is possible transferability of not only best practices because there are different contexts in uh, different EU cities and that cannot facilitate always a good practice in one place that can apply in a, in a, in a different location due to contextual differences. So uh, how can uh, we best learn from the others and transfer meaningfully uh, what works well? Hope, please. Is I it can a answer question? if you want to. I don't know if it's if it's a specific question to any of us or just uh, whomever. You uh, you can start, Laura. We start from the end. Yeah, I mean uh, the question of coordination. Um, I think this is like a, a fixed ideas that we have all the time in every kind of discussions that we have at the European level. 
Uh, I, I, if we stick with, with this idea of coordinating everything that is going on, we lose time uh, because uh, the obviously coordination, I obviously agree with that, but I, I think the Euro, European Union, the European Commission is going towards that direction in terms of European policy. We have the uh, urban initiative that is coming up. There will be JRC involved. There will be, you know, Orbán to a certain extent, UIA, there will be a knowledge platform and so on and so forth. So uh, this is, I think, an important step forward. But at the same time, I think we need to um, give the space to plurality of initiatives because uh, the, the, the fact that now um, housing is uh, back on the agenda and is uh, on the top of the agenda also in the policy discussion, it is also due to the fact that social movements have been uh, pushing towards this, that uh, associations have been uh, launching different initiatives, that there is a really a need that is, uh, that is uh, screened in a certain way for attention uh, and because it comes from different voices. Um, and so I would like to say that uh, we should welcome all to the differences and not to be scared that there are different uh, associations and occasions like, uh, like this, it's uh, an opportunity to really uh, bring the plurality of voices. And in terms of um, translating uh, ideas, um, Urbac is a main core business and looking at how ideas can translate and uh, how the mo mobility of policies can happen. There's always a risk with that because uh, contexts are different, economic situation, political situation and so on. So I'm not lecturing on this. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I mean, uh, what it, I think it's important to in this discussion is to say that ideas need to are need to travel and and uh, and can be inspiring and it's also because of the security of uh, of uh, translating an initiative in initiative in the right context is because we need to have the uh, as i said local association local groups that are sort of uh, safeguarding that whatever is taken from another context really fit in uh, in uh, wherever it's um, it's adapted or experimented i give the floor to somebody else thank you laura uh Elite. maybe i can go next so i think on the point of view of uh, transfer of good practices is something that of course it's 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 an issue that we encounter uh, all the time uh, I know that you cannot be over optimistic, but I also know that some solutions when they are well studied and well understood uh, are actually not so not so difficult to transfer, I think, once you know what you're talking about. And I think, I suspect, my, Frick might want to say something about the housing first model. We also have <laughs> good practices to, push, to put forward. But I, maybe this is from a researcher perspective, kind of, but I think it's very important to know the starting point very well. Um, I, I found it very reassuring today when I, we heard from the ministry that they're, they're carrying out a big study to assess the housing need across the country. And um, I, I think I can only um, support this initiative. And I think it's something that sometimes is not, um, it's not entirely taken on board. And it's very important to understand the, the conditions um, ex ante, but also for policy evaluation ex post, which is something that we, we need much, much more in housing, I think. Um, then on the second point, um, so on the different uh, EU uh, opportunities and initiatives, uh, I, th I think uh, indeed the call for more interoperability and the possibility to use, uh, for example, funds, uh, grants with financing uh, uh, tools is something that we've always uh, called for. What we see though, it's a, uh, uh, I mean, the institutions are building more, more capacity in this area and there are, for example, I'm thinking of the EIB advisory hub that is really uh, useful and helping both housing organizations, but also cities, for instance, through the URBIS initiative to, um, to put together the best possible uh, project, making use of the different uh, EU possibilities. So I think there is there are some good developments in this uh, in this sense. Yes. Rick? Maybe be very very quickly to add like i i think we are in a in a bit of um, uh, a contradiction in a way like there is unprecedented opportunities to use eu funding um, um, for housing uh, and homelessness uh, for that matter um, but at the same time it is really a potpourri of um, 
of opportunities and it's very difficult even for experts uh, to see clear in all of that like some of the opportunities are related to the previous F mff multi-annual financial framework that is supposed to be finished some are new some are loans some are grants like it's really complicated and i i sympathize with those people that have to uh, make sense out of it and, and, and use it in a practical way. Um, but I guess that's what the European Union is to some extent, you know, like it's complicated and <laughs> it's a way of, of gatekeeping, you know, you don't want everybody to access the funds. Um, but I would advise you not to give up, you know, like there is opportunities. Um, um, uh, really take the time um, uh, to try to understand it. Um, use uh, uh, expertise that is available in Housing Europe, in Fianza to, uh, to do that. And in in terms of good practices, yes, like we always have to take account of the uh, of, of the context. But in relation to housing first, I have not uh, discovered a context in Europe where housing first uh, makes no sense. You know, um, uh, it is a, it, it is it is a, it is an approach that works. Um, you just need to adapt to the context in terms of the time you need, uh, in terms of what kind of housing you provide for the people, etc. But the fact that housing first as an effective approach to homelessness works in every context, I don't think that anybody doubts that, yeah. to be honest. Thank you very much, Mr. General Secretary. Που μα πρόσφεραν. Ε, αυτό που θέλω να, έτσι, να σας κάνω κοινωνούς είναι ότι εμείς δίνουμε πολύ μεγάλη βάση και στις εκθέσεις και στα reports αλλά και σε έρευνες που κάνει και η ΦΕΑΤΣΑ και το Housing Europe. Οπότε είμαστε στη διαδικασία αυτή τη στιγμή να κάνουμε έτοιμα να, είμαστε, α, να μας δεχτούν ως παρατηρητές, ως μέλη α, και η ΦΕΑΤΣΑ και το Housing Europe και θα είναι η πρώτη φορά που η ελληνική πολιτεία, αντίστοιχο Υπουργείο, θα θέλει να είναι μέλος αυτής της ομάδος, ώστε να μπορεί να γίνεται η ανταλλαγή καλών πρακτικών. Οπότε με βάση αυτά που εμείς θέλουμε να, ε, να, να κάνουμε ως πολιτικές, να βασίζονται και σε ένα ευρωπαϊκό πλαίσιο και σε καλές πρακτικές που έχουν δουλευτεί σε άλλες χώρες της Ευρώπης. Οπότε για μας αυτό είναι ίσως το, το, το πιο σημαντικό, γιατί προφανώς το γνωρίζετε, η χώρα μας, ε, όσον αφορά το 2019, έχει ίσως από τα μεγαλύτερα ποσοστά α, φτώχειας και κοινωνικού αποκλεισμού ε, ατό, των ομάδων. Οπότε το κομμάτι της φτώχειας ε, και της κοινωνικής κατοικίας είναι αλληλένδετο σε εμάς. Οπότε αυτός είναι ο, 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 ο επόμενος στόχος μας. Ευχαριστώ. Thank you very much. There are two more questions uh, from uh, the uh, audience. So if I may address them. There are... Laura can so have there been any potential landlords that have wanted to engage in any programs but have not had the resources to bring their properties up to standard? Um, did you hear the question? Okay. Is it for somebody in particular, or uh... it is to any? And uh, also, but uh, and there is an additional one. Are there any examples of programs that have worked from this perspective as an additional way to increase supply on housing? It means. So, would some of you like to address the question? The question. I think may maybe just like very quickly. So I'm, I'm not very I'm not referring to the Greek case, of course, but the, in the case of Belgium, which is the one that probably we we know best, best both within housing Europe and Fianza, uh, an important part of the social rental agency uh, program was that it came with uh, potential um, incentives and and um, support. Uh, for renovation, because indeed an important part was first bringing the homes to a decent. Uh, uh, standard. So, of course, it, there's also public support from, from this side. Um, and then in terms of the social rental agencies, again, and I think it responds to some of the concerns that were raised today, really the importance of the intermediary, so the role that the actual um, association and the NGO uh, plays should not be uh, underestimated, because indeed there's a lot of uh, uh, follow-up work, reassurance of the um, of the owners, guarantees to be put in place and so on. So this would be my only um, comment on this. But again, I'm not uh, the expert on that. <laughs> oh. 
Um, I think uh, Mr. General Secretary already announced uh, that uh, from uh, the current uh, uh, recovery plan budget, there will be a certain amount for the apartments uh, to be renovated. Uh, Mr. General Secretary? Can you hear? Εμεί έχουμε ζητήσει 1,3 εκατομμύρια ευρώ, όπω σα είπα, που στο κομμάτι του πιλωτικού προγράμματο κοινωνική κατοικία σε Θεσσαλονίκη και Αθήνα θα είναι περίπου στο ποσό των 10.000, ώστε αυτά είναι για να βελτιωθούν οι, οι, οι κατοικίε που θα παρασχεθούν ω κοινωνική κατοικία και θα είναι και το κίνητρο ε, των ανθρώπων να δώσουν τα σπίτια. Αυτό που πάντα μα ανησυχεί και το έχουμε δουλέψει στο κομμάτι του στέγα και εργασία στο προηγούμενο πρόγραμμα ανθρώπων που είτε διαβιούν στον δρόμο, είτε έμεινε σε ξενώνες και υπνοτήρια που τους παραμπέμπουμε να μπουν σε αυτό το πρόγραμμα, είναι ότι πολλές φορές ε, η, η ποιότητα, αν θέλετε, των σπιτιών δεν είναι η κατάλληλη. Οπότε, στο να βελτιώσουμε τα σπίτια και να τα εντάξουμε και στα προγράμματα του εξοικονομώ, ε, ώστε να γίνουν πιο ενεργειακά, είναι προς, προς αυτή την κατεύθυνση. Αλλά θέλω πάντα να σας πω, α, η εμπειρία έχει δείξει ότι πολλές φορές ε, συμπολίτε μας δεν δίνουν... Ε, ε, δεν είναι πρόθυμοι να δώσουν τα σπίτια σε ευάλωτες ομάδες του πληθυσμού. Okay. I, I think time uh, has uh, come uh, that we need uh, to thank all of you for very interesting presentations. We hope uh, that uh, the current suggestion policy projections and plans as well as experience at EU, EU level or different EU funding mechanisms can uh, really contribute so we can uh, identify sustainable solutions. Laura Colini, would you like to address something? No, but I want just to uh, also consider that the question of housing, uh, if we taken from the perspective of uh, housing really the, the, the really as it should be the most disadvantaged starting from that and and we um, consider for instance all the problematic uh, related for instance to under undocumented migrants right uh, and how the difficulties are to invest uh, in this um, in this area so the problem can be overwhelming and uh, my point of view is that we cannot just take this uh, perspective only sectorially, only looking at housing policies, uh, because there has to be, and in a certain extent, uh, housing first is an example that it really looks at starting from housing, but look at a broader perspective. And in this, in this terms, uh, coordination, I think it's very important also at local level and trying really to bring together different types of services in relation to housing. And I hope that this is uh, something that can be picked up also in, when we talk about the social rental agency model, not exclusively looking only at the object itself, but as a more complex and holistic uh, question in, in relation to service provisions and uh, quality of, um, of uh, living in cities. Thank you very much uh, for your contributions, all of you. I hope uh, that is just a, a beginning of uh, really getting the most out of the EU funding possibilities or other resources that can really contribute to combat in a holistic manner, as it was very well pointed out, uh, all these major issues that are uh, prohibiting people from accessing fundamental rights and really enabling them into what it essentially is an active uh, citizenship and participation. Thank you indeed. Thank you. Bye. Thank you to, our, uh, to all to our uh, plenary discussion members for this conversation. Uh, this is such a diverse approach and a wealth of information on what uh, uh, you mentioned being long-weighted solutions, which is uh, really important for us to have in mind. Considering as well the current conditions with the COVID pandemic, that housing is uh, still a major issue. So I would like uh, to thank uh, Mrs. Ioana uh, Pertzinidou for her moderation. And I'd just like to ask her if she could share with us a couple of key takeaways uh, of what is really the housing situation in Greece and the wider Europe today. So, Mrs. Pertzinidou. Well, that's... Uh... <laughs> There was just an, an hour and a half and that was definitely not enough. But I think what is important that we keep in mind is that uh, we need to learn 
and to really inform policymakers from what is evident out there. And there is certainly a quite significant number of uh, evidence and best practices that we need to inform policies. We also need to coordinate in terms of funding, really to consider, as it was already pointed out, uh, uh, housing just the beginning of uh, an integration and at the beginning of the journey and not just uh, at the end of integration when it comes to, uh, let's say, asylum seekers, refugees and migrants. However, poverty and uh, homelessness uh, is a key issue for active citizenship. That it, can uh, and affects uh, a lot more uh, people and should be addressed in a way that does not create discriminations within uh, societies and uh, can uh, local authorities and society and ministries and policymakers at local and national level uh, need to really uh, engage meaningfully so to use potential funding resources to address the needs uh, of their uh, societies, I think. Generally Great. Speaking. Thank you very much uh, for all the contributions and the moderation. It's time now to have a first break. We're going to take a five minute break. As we said, uh, please do stay connected. We're going to have our chat box facility open and through a social media account using the hashtag so Athens Housing Symposium. And please do use uh, the chat box to share your own Twitter handles so we can network even if we can't be together in the same room. For our event, you can find us at, uh, at Sinathina and at UIA underscore initiative, uh, again, hashtag Athens Housing Symposium, to stay connected and follow us on Twitter as well. Thank you very much. We will be back in five minutes with a UIA a video of the experience of our community of interest and then we'll start the conversation again.
Fahme. Hijo de GT. Για να, έχει, να γίνει το επίκαιρο πιο γνωστό, του κάνουμε διάφορα σεμινάρια για το πώ θα διατηρήσουν το σπίτι και πώ θα μπορέσουν να ανταπεξέλθουν στι υποχρεώσει. Ολιστική προσέγγιση στην ένταξη. Πιστεύουμε ότι όλα αυτά συνδέονται μεταξύ του. Προφανώ, αν δεν έχει ε, εμποστή κατοικία, δεν μπορεί να πατήσει τα πόδια σου για να πα να παρακολουθεί τα χρήματα να βρει δουλειά. Αν δεν έχει ε, κάποιε γνώσει στα ελληνικά ή στα αγγλικά, το καλύτερο είναι να δύσκολα θα βρει ένα σπίτι. Ένα-δύο. Ένα-δύο, ναι. Welcome back, apologies. We are all trying to kind of navigate through this new digital world, so uh, it's all good now. We can continue. Welcome back to our symposium, Forging Social Cohesion and Affordable Housing Approach, organized by Kirin the Limb of the City of Athens and Catholic Relief Services. I hope you enjoyed the video. It was it's just wonderful to see so many familiar faces, both from our members of our teams and our members of our community. And thank you so much for staying active and engaging in the chat box. It's great to follow your discussion. Now we're going to move into our first panel, Good Practices of Housing Implementation Programs. We will invite our moderator, Levente Poliak, Urban Innovative Actions Expert for the City of Athens, who we're very happy to see again. And we will discuss a couple of ideas and different housing models addressed to vulnerable groups. So welcome Levente and the floor is yours to introduce your panel members and guide the discussion. Yazina, thanks a lot. Thank you very much for having us and it's a great pleasure to see over 150 people uh, following us. It would have been, of course, much nicer to be there in person, and I would have had this nice uh, curing the limbo background and environment uh, for this. 
but anyway, I think it's 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 a great success that you managed to bring so many people uh, together. And this panel, I would like to say, it's building a lot on the discussion we had earlier. And I hope we can go into more into details of also what were brought up uh, by the panelists before. Uh, as Dina mentioned, I'm a, I'm the UA expert for Athens, which means that I've been following the project for the last years and also have been documenting, have been discussing a lot of issues, a lot of internal issues in the process, but also. Uh, have discussed in the process of uh, building up this conference, which we thought would be a very key moment, not only to share the results of uh, Curing the Limbo, but also get a lot of other insights on board uh, for to, to discuss what is the future of Curing the Limbo as well. So a few words about UIA, because Laura already mentioned uh, most, of, uh, most of the important things about UIA, but it's also that uh, there's a lot of cities within UIA that work on housing and that's why as Laura mentioned as well there's been a lot of efforts to put into something that they call the a capitalization on, on affordable housing so as Laura mentioned again uh, podcasts videos uh, discussions conferences the next conference will be next week but also we had a lot of meetings and this actually helped us to to meet other UIA cities that are working on housing from different directions and this brought us also uh, closer to organizing this panel because when we looked into whom should we invite for this panel one of the first idea was uh, uh, the UIA city of Matero and their project Yes We Rent from whom we have Laia Carbonel Agustin here with us that uh, it's a project that we met in several occasions in different UA events and we thought there's a it's a very nice model that we can uh, learn from it and also other uh, participants that we invited into this uh, into this panel, and especially Urania Dimitri and Ihav Sampana, who organized actually uh, a big part of this conference, they went into details also with this uh, this uh, initiatives, these projects, because they wanted to uh, understand what can we learn from them and how, how can we use some of this knowledge for uh, Athens uh, as well. So this is why we looked uh, with the help of Hanna Semzo that you will hear in the next panel. Uh, from MRI Budapest, we looked into some uh, social rental agency models. For example, we have with us uh, a Romodrom from the Czech Republic, uh, represented by Katerina Kubrichtova and Eva Nednamova. And then also we have uh, Habitat for Humanity from Poland, uh, represented by Beata Patuszynska. And also to look at a more established welfare situation, to learn also from, uh, let's say, a more uh, long-term uh, housing engagement in, in Finland. We also invited Peter Fredriksson for, from the Y Foundation uh, in Helsinki. So I would like to uh, invite you all to think about, uh, in the audience, think about your questions and please put them in the chat uh, box. And also because in the end of the, the discussion, the end of the presentations, we will have 15 minutes for questions and answers. And if you articulate more uh, clear questions, we can actually uh, hopefully give more clear answers as well. Uh, but before, before that, we would like to hear a lot in depth about the projects. And I would like to start with uh, Stefania Giftopoulou, who will tell us about the, you know, the, the, the center point of this whole event today, the Curing the Limbo uh, project. She's uh, project management for Catholic Relief Services, and she was following a, a big part of this project and was of course participating in building up the housing uh, program, but also in relationship with a lot of other activities in Curing the Limbo. So I'd, I would have I invite uh, Stefania to, to tell us a little bit more about Curing the Limbo. Stefania, are you with us? Yes. Hi Levente, thank you for the introduction. Um, I will share my screen. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, we're honored to be part of um, such an interesting panel and uh, I really look forward for the discussion uh, later on. Um, Curing the Limbo uh, supported uh, 116 refugee households who have received asylum in Greece transition from emergency to longer term housing solutions. Um, you can see some basic demographics on uh, gender distribution for subsidized participation, uh, family status distribution, 
as well as um, the main countries of origin, which are um, Iran, Afghanistan, and Syria. The municipality of Athens and Catholic Relief Services developed a social rental agency within the project to act as an intermediary between the renter and the owner and address the barriers uh, refugees uh, face in accessing affordable housing. The program offers uh, owners and tenants uh, a range of support services and financial assurances to create those um, uh, sustainable linkages and, and tenancies um, beyond uh, project support. So the, the services we, we provide for housing are the, the following. Um, one is access to verified apartments. Uh, the project identifies owners wanting to rent to program participants and verify appropriateness of the apartments. Uh, and then um, the project conducts one-to-one -one meetings with prospective tenants to share uh, the, 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 apart the available apartments. Um, two, rental technical support. Um, field staff provide pre-tenancy trainings to um, participants. Topics vary from how to look uh, from, for an apartment and apartment costs to um, the um, very specificities of uh, um, Athenian uh, apartment buildings. Uh, and um, the, the material of these um, tra trainings have um, um, have developed now a how-to guide which uh, is going to be translated in four different languages. Um, three, the conditional rental subsidy. Uh, participants are eligible to receive a monthly cash housing subsidy based on their continuous engagement in Greek language uh, classes and they are also encouraged to engage in other program exchange activities um, based on their interests and, uh, and needs. Um, four is what we call neighborhood integration, uh, where we um, match program participants and locals, enabling refugees to practice Greek, um, volunteer, uh, and connect with locals um, in case day-to-day um, -day support is, is required. Um, five, uh, legal support. So we provided legal support to both owners and uh, renters uh, upon request. And last but not least, uh, the accompaniment, which we also considered and found out that it's, it's a, a very, very important aspect of, of this uh, mediation work. Uh, so accompaniment support, which includes uh, setting up bank accounts, utility bills, uh, and e-banking, as well as a household, household finance uh, planning um, to establish understanding of housing costs uh, and have plan, uh, a plan for uh, the family's longer term um, affordability. Um, we received uh, feedback from uh, our program participants. Uh, and um, as you can see, 85 of a percentage of respondents stated that workshop series um, was relevant. Um, in, in, in regards to rental subsidies, what's, um, what was uh, interesting is that 79% seven, uh, of respondents stated that rental subsidy enabled them to meet their accommodation needs according to their personal choice criteria. And we think that is very important as well, that the um, uh, tenant actually has an active role in, in selecting the apartment they want to, to, to live in. Uh, and 88% of respondents stated that the rental subsidies combined with accommodation support uh, received allowed them to focus on other priorities, such as learning the language, uh, looking for a job, etc. We also received feedback from um, the homeowners and 17 out of 21 agreed that they benefited from the program. Um, most owners value regular payments and uh, maintenance of the apartment. So despite the fact and that the financial incentive, and I'll, I'll speak more about this later, 
didn't work as, as planned, we saw that um, most owners valued the presence of an organization or a program supporting the lease and the tenant. So this in um, having a focal, a focal point. Um, we are currently working on project learnings. Um, however, uh, there are good practices and challenges that uh, are already identified which I think are very interesting to share and also um, help open up the, the discussion later. Um, so one is the program flexibility. Um, we were able, so major and minor uh, modification, modifications were um, timely implemented based on the assessments uh, we conducted, information gathered from the monitoring of activities and the changes in the context. And as a result, we, we practiced the process of, of, of understanding the diverse population we, we work with. Thus, program participants uh, received personalized support tailored to their needs. So this, this learning process um, is also very important in adopting the program to, to other population groups. Um, we exclusively worked with the private uh, rental market and um, um, we, uh, we see that linkages were made with uh, real estate agencies and the Real Estate Federation of Greece. Um, however, rents are developed on the market which raises affordability concerns and this, is, this has actually been one of the um, major challenges of, of our work. Uh, the fact that, and this has been also mentioned by the previous speakers, the lack of an affordable, accessible and equitable uh, housing stock in, in Athens, in Greece, but in Athens um, particularly. particularly. Um, so this takes, uh, here the, the, the financial incentives uh, to owners um, did not uh, work as initially um, expected. So we believe that uh, there is a need for more competitive uh, incentive to owners. Uh, and I know that um, the uh, next speakers um, will have uh, good examples from which we can, we, we can learn. Um, but having said that, uh, the um, refugees uh, networking proved to be a key factor for locating apartments and the most effective and efficient uh, outreach uh, method. Um, Time-wise, uh, affordability-wise, uh, but also the fact that the owners were ready to sign. Um, because um, our team uh, used different outreach methods and identified over a thousand of uh, apartments. But what we noticed is that there was a high turnover, of, uh, turnover uh, rate, meaning that many apartments quickly uh, came out of the available pool. Plus, um, um, the majority were, were very expensive. Um, Additionally, I would like to say that the municipality played a significant role in making owners feel um, secure to enter the program, and that was very, very important. And last but not least, I'll, uh, those key linkages with uh, the other program pillars, uh, such as the capacity building lab run by the uh, University of Athens, as well as the psychosocial support, job readiness, uh, and uh, the neighborhood activities. Um, these uh, linkages with other program pillars is, is key, because uh, as mentioned before, housing cannot stand on its, on its own. Uh, as well as the accompaniment and coaching, which provided, uh, um, which proved to be uh, empowering approaches to integration since um, the, the participants are, are active um, in, in, in their housing um, journey, let's say. Um, future perspectives are our next steps. Uh, we are currently working on uh, the uh, lessons learned report and also um, uh, planning to conducting a study for a policy brief and a business plan for a housing rental agency, social rental agency, 
to look at the financial mechanisms to support um, a, a housing program uh, like this. That's all, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefania, for this very concise and very compact uh, explanation. And I guess in the end with the Q&A, we can go more in, in details, uh, but we have a few minutes, maybe even now before we go on. And I would like to hear a bit about uh, what you mentioned that the refugees own outreach is very important, their, their own networks. Uh, and I'm wondering if, uh, because you, you build up a lot of services around the refugees, like uh, like the neighborhood integration programs, uh, like the guide to housing. So, how much do you think all these services actually help them to to be more comfortable, also on their way? No, because I think in this sense, uh, empowering them to actually make also their own way to get access to housing, to to build a relationship with the owners as well. That's that's very important. So, I'm wondering, Stefan, if you're still with us, uh, what do you think of this? Yes, so this has been um, uh, one of the uh, talk, uh, one of the issues that um, uh, we, as a team, uh, had discussed uh, a lot. Because, as you said, we had a um, we had an intermediary role, and we knew that our role would uh, end at some point. And um, to uh, this was particularly the reason we developed tools such as the how to guide, um, uh, as well as a um, uh, lexicon uh, in collaboration with the University of Athens to kind of uh, fill uh, uh, the ga our gap um, once, um, once the project uh, ends. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, and I mean, it's, um, what, what we wanted to, um, from the very beginning of the project, we had this in mind. So as time passed uh, and as we were reaching the end of the program, we um, slowly, slowly wanted to limit our, our intermediary role and give more um, space and tools to, to, to participants to, to carry on uh, independently. Okay, great. Uh, I think this uh, uh, how to guide, I think this is a very, very useful resource that I recommend for everyone to to look at it, uh, to download, to use in, in their own cities. Uh, I think my fellow Budapest citizens would also need uh, something like this, uh, because I think we can all learn, for example, yes, how, the, how, do, how does an apartment work? Also, how can you save money on some of the, the costs? No, because, because I think something that a lot of people uh, encountered with big surprise that actually some of the, the, the utility costs are actually much more expensive in, than in their country of origin. So I think what I thought as, as, a, as a quite complex approach on your side was that you accompany them on, on all these elements of, of what does it mean to live in a new context, but also with all the neighborhood integration, with all the social uh, psychosocial support that you mentioned, uh, I think this was a very important trajectory uh, for all of them. Uh, I would say let's move on uh, and then we can come back with some more questions uh, to you, Stefania, don't go away. Uh, let's move on to Matara, and I would like to invite Laia Carbonella Agustin, who's uh, project coordinator of uh, Yes We Rent at UAE Mataro, to tell us uh, about their model that is another UIA city, uh, by the way. And we thought when we met first uh, uh, the project, uh, Alberto, we thought that it was actually very, very interesting to see what kind of incentives you're using uh, to get on board private uh, owners and also. Uh, how do you work a little bit with, with the, the power of, 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 of numbers, power of a cooperative, power of, let's say, pooling uh, expertise and resources in order to lower the costs of, for example, renovation and this kind of stuff? That's something that I think can be very relevant also in Athens. As we, as we heard in Athens, it was almost privately with private owners. Uh, and I think when you work with maybe more institutional owners and you have more apartments or bigger numbers uh, in the same time, maybe this kind of the, the power of the, you know, a, a network could actually help uh, uh, getting a niche in, in, in the business model of the whole operation. But Leia, the, the floor is yours. So let us know, please, uh, how did it go with Yes We Rent? Thank you very much uh, for having us here. 
Um, I'll show, I'll share my screen with you as we have a presentation as well. Um, just, uh, okay. okay. I don't know if um, you can see the presentation now. Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'll try to share our uh, experience. Um, yes, we rent uh, Lurem is um, a UAA project um, that's been running for um, almost two years, but um, it's still a work in, in progress. In fact, um, we, we, are apply, we will apply soon uh, for an extension of the project because um, um, due to the COVID situation and some other delays, we are, we are, we are, we are still working on, on, on the project. Um, and there are things that we can see already that we, we, we can, we have uh, quite clear some others we are still trying to figure out um, how um, they will uh, develop. But basically, um, yes, we rent project is, uh, is uh, it focuses on affordable housing. Uh, it's uh, on rental housing. And the idea is to generate an, a stable uh, rental supply in the long term in the city of Mataró. Um, the way we are uh, we are trying to do that is uh, it's like twofold. One is through reaching uh, owners and mobilizing these empty flats uh, of the city through a set of, of of incentives, and the other one is uh, a cooperative of tenants that they will manage this um, supply of of flats that we can mobilize. Um, I can. We, we can go a little bit further if you want on the on the incentives that's a little bit what you mentioned before um, there's yeah before uh, the idea the logic behind the project uh, is um, and that's what we thought it was interesting it was uh, to, to change a little bit this balance of power between tenants and, and owners in the sense that as we had uh, a, a, one of the, the problems that we experience is that by renting uh, one by one, like one tenant by one owner, it made a, it's, it's an imbalanced situation between owners and tenants in which basically owners have like the, um, the predominant position. The idea behind the cooperative was to uh, being able to uh, bring in together people interested in, uh, in renting and then um, mobilizing these, uh, these uh, tenants and, and being able to set up um, this we, the, the way we did it was through a cooperative, but just the idea was to bring them together and being able to have a little bit more of bargaining power with owners and then being able to reach this um, uh, negotiation capacity to lower uh, um, the, the rental price. Then how do we tackle owners? Uh, that's one of the things that I, I thought it was very interesting uh, from the previous presentation on how to tackle owners and, and this, um, how you, you get um, you get to them and how you convince them to uh, to bring their flats to the to the project and, and then to this uh, cooperative. Um, that was something that in our case as well it it, um, it changed a little bit in the sense that when we first um, thought about what incentives um, we could give, we knew that there were like two um, main reasons why owners prefer to have their flats empty rather than to uh, rent them. One was um, because um, the state of the apartment was in poor conditions and probably they, they didn't have the resources to uh, uh, refurbish these houses so that they could be rented. That was one. And the second one was um, they were, um, uh, there was this fear that uh, tenants wouldn't pay or that, that they would vandalize the apartment. That was something that they were really uh, scared of because uh, many of them, of the owners we, we could uh, speak to, had previous um, bad experiences on that. So that was, these were the two main uh, lines in which we uh, set, uh, we designed the incentives. <clears throat> First, um, this was, uh, that we, we thought of these uh, grant uh, for renovation. Uh, that was something that changed as well because um, the first idea was uh, to start with a lower amount of, of grant. Um, we have these uh, 18,000 uh, um, euros that uh, it's uh, the maximum they can apply to and with special uh, emphasis on uh, energy efficiency. But uh, the idea was before to have a lower uh, grant, but then well, we realized that the state of the flats that we could, uh, that were um, uh, coming to the project, they really needed much more renovation than what we first expected. And so the difference was too, too high, then owners were reluctant to bring the, the flat to the apartment. So that we had to uh, somehow increase a little bit this grant with the idea of creating an effect that owners would know the project, they would rely on the project, they would bring the, their apartment to the project, and then little by little, 
we would be able to uh, decrease a little bit the 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 um, this grant. Also thinking that the cooperative would already uh, be set and, and then we could uh, figure out some sort of, of uh, compensation mechanisms with the, with the cooperative. But that's mainly the first incentives. The first incentive was on, on rent. Um, then we also had the fact that uh, the management of the works could be done uh, by the city council. That was something uh, also that uh, owners, um, at some point they couldn't, uh, it, they were very reluctant to face the whole process of renovation of the of their, their apartments and and we took care of that um together with some other um, minor like the uh, energy certificate or certificate of, uh, of habitation that we could also manage um there were also some uh, tax exemptions on certain property taxes that are uh, on the uh, city council and then there was this second uh, pillar that we mentioned that was these uh, the uh, we ensured the payment of the of the rent um, throughout the, the, the project, mainly through these uh, insurances and, and also this mediation, um, this mediation on the rent uh, that what we what we did is that um, we as a city council, we are set in the middle of the of the whole process and we get the money from the uh, from the tenants and then we pay the we pay the, the the owner then we have a certain um we have this capacity to mediate in case there's some um delay in one of the months and we can uh we can activate this mediation process that's what we offer this is something that's also interesting because that's what we offer while there's a pro the project the idea is that after that we're going to have this uh cooperative and it's the cooperative the one who will have to define its own incentives because we we won't have the project um i mean we won't we won't be able to be to continue giving such grants once the project is over so that the cooperative, um, the good thing of the project is that they allow the cooperative to start at, uh, receiving some um, uh, some um, finance, some money from their own um, members, so they can start capitalizing the economy at their, the cooperative. And then, once the project is over, they will have to find a mechanism, that probably through uh, uh, loans, um, to continue doing the this ref the renovation. Then something. <clears throat> that was uh, that was important as well was the fact that um, what what we the project doesn't tackle um, um, social housing. It what it does it it, it tries to lower the burden of uh, rental uh, of rental prices over burden of, of of tenants. Let's say so. How do we do it? What uh, we work with the Catalan Housing uh, Agency through their rental price index, which is a standard index that sets what's the average price, uh, not only in the city, but like in, 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 in neighborhoods, it's very specific. What we did is that we established a price. Um, we have this index, which is the, the average, and then market price can be from the index above. Uh, what we did is we, try, we set the price, um, it's lower than the, than the index. The idea is that uh, all, that it can be affordable in the sense that uh, the cooperative adds this 12% uh, from the rental price as a fee for the cooperative from the, the, the tenants pay. What we do is that uh, with the price that um, we, we find in, 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 in this uh, through the index, we apply a, a certain variations according to the grant that they receive the years of leasing and other uh, characteristics, oh, we always think or we calculate it in the way that um, with the price that we propose to the owner and the fee, it's still below the, the index price. It's 20% below the rental price index. That makes it uh, either affordable. Also, uh, we are also limited by the fact that we have this insurance in which uh, tenants, they, have, um, they cannot uh, appear pay more than 40% of the income in the rent. So these are um, the ways and mechanisms in which we can guarantee that uh, the price, the rental, the final rental price is, uh, it's an affordable, it's an affordable rent and it's beyond, it's below this uh, uh, general index that it's established. Um, that is the one that, that allows us to, to guide um, what we do. 
Then the other part of, of, the, of the system or, or the project is this cooperative that we are working with. And that's also, a, it's, it's being a, a quite interesting um, process because uh, what we did is we did a call among, uh, it was a general call in the city of Mataró to gather together the people that wanted to uh, carry out this project. Um, we had uh, some people, it, we had quite a good response. And at the end, we had a group of people that were working for uh, quite a, a long time to decide on how to how to um, do this cooperative um, now they are registered since uh, february they are registered they are working to uh, increase the people and um however it's it's been difficult to de to, to define the system and you can see here a, a interrogation uh, mark because um we've set a system in which we can operate now with the city council and the kind the, the the kind of uh, rental agreements between the owner and the tenant this is, is done in the way it's been traditionally done through the normal um, rental contract. Now what we are um, proposing is that the owner can rent um, through the cooperative and then the cooperative will have to uh, do this uh, other rent rental. We have to see if it's going to be a contract. We are working on that uh, uh, to their um, members. That has an impact on, on uh, taxation. That also may threaten affordability because in case we have to apply the VAT, then it's now we are we are working on on all that, and this is going to be I mean these minor um, adjust adjustments of the of the project uh, is going to be undertaken and will be sorted uh, until the uh, in June July, which we think is going to be is going to be done. How does it, how is it going to work? Uh, the idea behind the cooperative is that they will. Um, uh, gather together, they will um, pay an entry fee of 100 euros to be a member of the cooperative, and they will only pay once they already have a, a flat. They will pay this 12% uh, of the rental price as a monthly fee. That The objective of this monthly fee is that uh, the cooperative can, can uh, first of all, get some money that they can save to uh, give continue these um, incentives for owners on, on the one hand, on the other hand is for the daily uh, working uh, and, and sustainability of the cooperative. The idea, as we said, is that even uh, by applying this monthly fee, the price will still be below market, um, below market price. And, and, and that's what I said before, the, this um, a fee uh, will, will be uh, divided into different items that will, be, uh, will cover the insurance. Uh, that's also something interesting because now we are working with the insurance uh, methods, um, but we are, we are trying to see in the business plan of the cooperative when this uh, co um, insurance won't be necessary because the idea is that tenants can uh, do like, a, a, they can uh, cover up uh, one another, so they don't really need to uh, to have these insurances. But it can be that they can cover up, or that they will have a common fund in which they can um, access in case of someone uh, wouldn't um, wasn't able to pay. Um, but that's pretty much uh, that we have it more or less uh, ready because we did a business plan as well and a, and a feasibility study. So we think uh, this can be uh, sustainable, economically uh, sustainable once the project is over. And how do they do it? It's something very interesting because what they are doing from the cooperative perspective, they are pretty much based on uh, participation. The idea is that they want to change uh, what we said before, empowerment. They want to really uh, change this uh, balance of power between tenants and owners. So they are working on a, on a model in which participation is key. Um, they will be able to, uh, they ask their, uh, their members the, to be able to engage in uh, trainings or meetings or working sessions and um, to uh, uh, work on that on that uh, empowerment. Then there are also some social criteria that uh, also will apply, um, depending pretty much on, on economic conditions, but not only. Um, and then uh, this, uh, this it's the time being member of the cooperative that will also give uh, certain points. This is something interesting though, because as I said before, it's a project that we are, it's, it's a, work on process, a working process. Um, now um, they are pretty much working on, on, the, on how to start. I mean, they have this participation, but like this care work, community engagement, these are things you spoke before as well on neighborhood, uh, neighborhood participation. This is something that will be tackled as well in the, within the cooperative, but it's not, um, it's not still uh, defined because um, now they are working on very simple uh, things such as the contracts or the business plan, um, such that. Then 
Um, what's the uh, the idea behind the, the the cooperative? Is you also mentioned in in before in the carving the limbo, the idea of that this mediation the project will will end, and and we will disappear somehow. Um, the idea behind is that we can set a stable and a solid cooperative that they can really not only manage the flats, but being able to replicate the model, being able to uh, continue the model and having a, a stable uh, cooperative that can uh, grant affordable housing to the, the people in Mataró. So the idea is how, <clears throat> how, what will be the relationship between the city council and this cooperative? This is something that we don't have it yet defined. The application said we would set up like a second order cooperative. This is not sure we can do it like that, but still there's this um, there's a willing to to explore what relationship we can we we can uh, establish. If we think that, um, as I said before, this is not a cooperative that will be tackling uh, social housing. Social housing will still be tackled by the city council, but they still are giving uh, an answer to a need uh, in the in the city, which is the access of affordable housing. Uh, to people that in many cases are not covered through other po public policies. So if they are in fact providing a uh, housing service, a public policy to, to the people of, of the city of Mataró, how can we engage this cooperative? How can we engage this civic initiative into the um, delivery of this uh, housing policy? This is something that um, we have. We won't have to tackle it because we, didn't, we don't have it sorted yet. We will do it through uh, this um, advisory council that uh, we, we would like to set soon uh, with experts in, uh, in innovation in public administration, but also on housing, on housing policies. And that's pretty much um, the idea behind it. It's not only mobilizing flats, but also really creating this new actor in the rental market in the city of Mataró, formed by, uh, by citizens uh, engaged and, and working on that and, and how to establish this relationship. That's why I said that we don't have it. Uh, we don't have all the answers yet, but we at some point we have uh, more questions than than answers. But um, but that's what we are working. So that's that, that's my alarm clock because I was um, uh, trying to st stick on time. But, and, um, that's pretty much um, what I had uh, as for challenges. That's what I said. Well, what I said before. Uh, number three is this public civic partnership. How to establish this relationship? A second one is the governance within the cooperative. That's so. That's also uh, something very interesting because um, uh, it's true that they are pretty much focusing on active participation, but they are also finding some other uh, some people that they were just interested in in renting, and that's it. Not not so much into active participation. We'll have to find the balance uh, between the both. And then also the economic sustainability of the cooperative that also, although we have this uh, financial plan and business plan, we have to, to see how it works. Um, that's pretty much um, what we have for the moment, but we're more than open to questions um, after. Yes, thank you very much, Leah, for the very precise presentation. I was very happy to also to see a lot of details about the business model, which is, I think, helpful for many participants uh, here. We have a few questions in the in the chat, so I wouldn't go into them now because we need to move on, but hopefully we can return to them in the end. But in the meanwhile, if you can look at the chat, uh, they're mostly about uh, long term commitment of the owners. This is something we could also develop a little bit later on, and I would like to encourage everyone, please, to to listen carefully, pose your questions, and, and uh, we will try to, to discuss all the questions that uh, come in. But I would like to invite uh, Katerina Kubrichtova and Eva Nedomova, our next speakers from Romodom, Romodrom uh, in the Czech Republic. There is, an, there is a project, an organization to focus on uh, the inclusion of Roma into housing. And uh, I would just like you to jump straight into telling us uh, about the program. Okay, thank you very much for having us here. I will just share our, uh, my screen here. Um, can you see it? No. Not yet. Yes. No? Yes, thank you. Uh, so uh, we are here, two of us, uh, me and Eva Nedomova. We are both project managers uh, from Romodrom uh, from Czech Republic. And 
Eva is also a social worker. Uh, so I will first tell you something about our organization, then we will move to the uh, models of housing that we provide in the Romudrom. Then uh, we will move to the services which we provide to uh, clients and then to services for the landlords. It means uh, private owners of the apartments. Then uh, we will uh, move to the social real estate tools, which we adopted in our organizations. Then we will move to guarantee fund and we will uh, end up with advantages and disadvantages of these two models. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sounds great. So, yeah. <laughs> So uh, just, just to tell you something about us, uh, we are uh, NGO, uh, which was established some 20 years ago. It was established by our chairwoman, Maria Gailova, who used to work with Roma people. Uh, now uh, we have over 100 uh, employees and we operate in eight out of 14 uh, regions in the Czech Republic. What do we do? Uh, we provide social services. This, our, this is our main focus. We do field work, activation services, social counseling and social rehabilitation. And we also operate EU programs they are mostly uh, focused on housing, employment, debt counseling, which is a big issue in the Czech Republic, and also education, uh, preschool education, and uh, some small uh, projects on Roma culture. Now I will pass uh, the word to Eva. Okay, hello. Hopefully you hear me. Uh, in the Roma drum, we have two mo housing model. These models was established as a reaction to the lack of municipal or social housing. The models are based on cooperation uh, with private private owners. The contract is established uh, established uh, direct between the clients and the land landlord. And also there is a social support after the moving the clients to the house. So like I said, we have two models, standard models and housing first model. Uh, they are uh, slightly different between these uh, two models. First, first models, uh, no, uh, not everybody can enter the standard housing programs. The clients are pre-selected or pre-scoring before they enter. It means that they must show some uh, cooperation, motivation, they need to save money for the deposit, must handle their debts. Usually they work, uh, they uh, cooperate with the social worker two or three months before they move to the flats. And also after the moving the, to the flats, there is social support. On another side, uh, the housing first model is open to everybody. Uh, the only criterion is that the person must be in the housing need and also in the risk of social exclusion or uh, social excluded. Usually person who is, in, who is involved to the housing first models have another problem such as uh, uh, alcohol or dr drugs abuse, gambling, psychiatric diagnosis, etc., etc., and the social support is very intensive and more huge in to to the standard model. Okay. Sorry. Uh, now, uh, the services, uh, there are two, uh, two types of services we provide. First of them is to the clients. And uh, the main aim of the services, of providing these services, is uh, that the clients should, should, find, should find not only new housing, but a new home. This is very important to us because uh, that when, when the client feels somewhere like uh, at home, they, uh, they tend to sustain the housing long term and uh, this is really effective. So what we do, we do debt counseling, as I already mentioned, because it's a big deal in Czech Republic. We also uh, help the clients to manage their household budgets. Uh, we learn them how to tackle their financial issues. We do different types of accompaniment to the different types of offices, labor office, uh, healthcare services, and other services. We also uh, do social counseling for them. Uh, we help them with children, and uh, it's usually like finding a 
suitable school or kindergarten for their kids. Also, we can assist with some uh, behavioral troubles with the kids and we look for uh, appropriate free time activities for them. Uh, and also, if the clients uh, need this, if the clients need this, uh, we uh, uh, do the service. We uh, find uh, another services for them. For example, if they handle the drug abuse or something like that, we can't do this. We have to uh, cooperate with some other services, and we are the bridge between uh, the client and the service. Okay, uh, like I say, uh, we cooperate with the private landlords, but uh, the agreement is direct, uh, is contracted between the landlords and the clients, but we take uh, responsibility for the accurate and in-time payment. And also we help uh, to the clients with all the associate payments like water, energy, gas bill, and other utilities. Also, uh, the cooperation is based on the cooperation with the clients, and we teach them how to behave, how to be a good neighborhood, uh, how to behave in the new housing. It means that the clients must respect night silence, uh, participate in activities in the neighborhood, such as cleaning areas, cleaning corridors, etc. And if there is any trouble between the clients and for example, neighborhoods, we, we are the person who deal is. Usually the cave work, workers enter to the neighborhoods and try to solve uh, the problems. The landlord is uh, always informed, but we try to cause him or her the little uh, as little trouble as possible. Usually, we only inform uh, landlords that there was some problems, but we manage it, deal it, and and that now it's okay. Okay. <laughs> Well, okay. during the time uh, we developed uh, new tools, uh, social real estate agent and social real estate agency. It came up uh, because uh, our social workers, they uh, didn't really want to cooperate in uh, searching for the new housing because they said we are not business people, we can't do that. And there is also uh, the conflict of interest because uh, if we are with the client, we can't be the one who tells them you are behaving uh, inappropriately, etc. So. Uh, uh, what, what does the real estate agent do? He or she uh, looks uh, at the market and uh, he or she finds uh, suitable housing for the clients. Also, uh, they work with the client uh, themselves because sometimes the clients, they come uh, to us with unrealistic ideas about the living. Also, we developed a social real estate agency and uh, the agency basically handles all the stuff uh, around the housing, all the contracts and all the things. Also, it, also it enable us, enable us to uh, do some investments projects. We just started to uh, buy our own properties like Romodron properties, which we can uh, provide to clients and they are in our ownership. And uh, last year, uh, we have a guarantee fund. Uh, this fund is only in uh, Housing First model. The Housing First model is financed from European Structural Fund uh, through the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. And we think that this, uh, the guarantee fund is essential to, to providing Housing First model. The money from this fund is used uh, in the case if the rent is not paid or if there is some damages in the flat or or its equipment or if there is needed the recitation, disease section, etc., etc. And also when uh, the clients live in the flats uh, more than one year and everything is okay, we usually use this money for celebration with the clients and usually we give them give them some presents usually it's a cake and also some for a smaller renovation like a 
floor, uh, uh, it's deepen what it's needed. And uh, the fund is controlled by the commission uh, uh, that has the final responsibility for the expenditure. The commission is created by the financial manager of the project, project manager, the cable workers, and the director of the organization. It means, it means that cable workers says we need money for, I don't know, for a rebuilt uh, bathroom, and we set up the commission and discuss it and say yes or no. Okay. Well, and now to finish with pros and cons of these two models, uh, definitely. Uh, the first advantage is that it enables uh, to find standard and normal housing for the families who wouldn't uh, who wouldn't uh, reach to this uh, chance, and they can uh, start participate in normal life scenarios. We must say that from our experience and from our projects, over 90% of uh, households who used to cooperate with us, they are able to uh, sustain the housing for long term. It means over one year or longer. 30% uh, of them, they also uh, are able to find job after some while and uh, they uh, are able to leave social benefit system, which is very um, good news. Uh, also, there is an advantage for uh, landlords because uh, their empty uh, properties are uh, rented for standard market price. Uh, and also, I would like to mention that the models, both of them, are relatively cheap. If you compare it, for example, with uh, construction of new social housing, uh, because they require only two sources of uh, financing, and this is for the social service itself, and also uh, it requires the money for the social benefits, uh, which help the client to pay the rent. Uh, also, there are some disadvantages, of course. The first one is that the process itself and the work with the family or household is uh, really time consuming and it is not easy, uh, especially in the housing first model. Uh, the assistance of social worker is very intense uh, from the beginning uh, or at the beginning. Uh, then uh, the second advantage is it that uh, there are still a number of people who are not suitable to any of these models because they just don't want to change their uh, life scenarios and uh, you can't really do anything about them. And the third model is that these solutions are not usually not uh, very popular among the politics because if you are helping to marginalized people or Roma people, you are not uh, the good politician because no, it's still difficult to overcome the prejudices that these people can uh, live normal lives. This is, uh, this is all from us and we are looking forward to your uh, questions after our <laughs> presentation. Thank yes, you very thank much. Thank you very much, Katerina Eva. Thank you. This is actually very eye-opening also. I would be happy to go into details, for example, about, uh, we will not have the time now, but about your relationship with municipality. You never mentioned municipality uh, collaboration. Let's maybe let's use the chat later on, or, or maybe we can come back to this because that's a very important question. But I have one concrete question because we will go further. The Guarantee Fund and the, the Social Real Estate Agency, I found it very inspiring also that you 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 actually develop this uh, real estate agency you buy up properties which is on the long term can actually create a very stable economic model for you is it connected with the guarantee fund or it's a completely different story no no no, mm -hmm. no they are two different activities okay and the guarantee fund is something that is diminishing with time or is this something that gets uh, something paid back uh, from activities regularly actually we just asked for it in application oh, okay. uh, it, it is like a special special application for it within the housing first project okay perfect thank you for the quick answers we are perfectly yeah. in time and i encourage again everyone to to collect your questions put them in the chat because we're all looking at the check and uh, chat and this allows also our participants to not just uh, you know sit and and listen to the others but also have a have a dialogue with you so this is the right moment uh, for this thank you again katerina eva uh, and let's move on to poland and we have that patoszynska with us from uh, habitat for humanity poland uh, with a, with a actually very concrete social rental agency model. Let us know uh, about this better. 
Yes, thank you, Rosenta. We just share my screen to show you the presentation. Can you see it? Okay, yeah. Yes, all perfect. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I want to present you our social rental agency, which is uh, based in Warsaw, and it's run by Habitat for Humanity Poland. Uh, first, I will tell you about the agency, about the model, uh, how we understand it, uh, you know, the basic numbers, uh, tell you about our beneficiaries, and also history, uh, clients, owners, and uh, I will sum up with the added value. Plus, uh, later I'll tell you about the governments involved, because uh, in Poland, uh, actually, the uh, legal act about uh, social agencies is uh, just being uh, is just uh, is being proceeded now. So, uh, social rental agency in uh, is a non-profit intermediary that negotiates between property owners and household uh, in uh, needs of housing. And uh, the benefits for tenants are affordable and safe rent, but it's also helping them with, uh, for example, paying deposit because uh, we accept uh, paying the deposit in installments, which is uh, very helpful in case of such families. Uh, we uh, assure them good quality accommodation, uh, ongoing support, which uh, means uh, dealing with uh, sometimes like all kinds of, of, uh, of issues from uh, dealing with offices and rolling ch uh, children to school to sometimes uh, in case of, uh, of uh, immigrants advising on, on, on uh, what is the process of, of selling the car, you know, and uh, which contract that, uh, they should sign. Uh, also, uh, we mediate uh, in case of areas and uh, we don't take uh, any uh, middleman uh, fees. Uh, the tenants, of course, have some rep responsibilities. They need to uh, well, expect them to uh, pay the rent on time. Uh, take care of the uh, flat and uh, open communi and uh, like communicate openly with us, uh, which means if they know they might have some financial troubles or they don't know how to deal with certain issues, just to tell us about it, because then we can help them and then we can uh, prevent the, uh, them in, uh, in, uh, from getting into like more serious financial troubles, which is also which also gives us the security of uh, operating. Uh, as far as the landlords, uh, we uh, give them a guaranteed uh, rent payment uh, and stable rent. Also, we manage the property and uh, we do some small uh, service repairs. And we also don't take any fees from them. Uh, as far as responsibilities, we expect them to lower the rent for uh, approximately 20%, which is not always easy. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, provide good quality flats and also uh, accept our choice of tenants. Uh, because sometimes uh, we don't want uh, you know people to uh, choose uh, which what kind of family can uh, can live in the apartment. Uh, so when we come to uh, social rental agency in numbers, we have at the moment fourteen municipal flats and twenty five private flats. Uh, the municipal flats, uh, we went from uh, the city of Warsaw and uh, we uh, prolonged the contract every two years. And uh, as far as uh, private flats, when we started, uh, first we only had the municipal uh, flats, then in 2018, in January, we had uh, one private uh, apartment. And uh, then uh, a year later, four, two years later, 12, and uh, now as you can see, 25. Uh, the average month, monthly rent in the municipal flat is 118 uh, euro and in the private flat uh, 388, which makes uh, the private makes the approximately 80% uh, of the market, market price. And the average flat size is uh, 35 uh, square meters in case of municipal flat and uh, 44 square meters in case of private flat. Uh, we also during the uh, project, we also renovated flats. Uh, we renovated 18 flats, uh, including 12 municipal flats, which we uh, got from the um, city of Warsaw. And uh, also, but uh, we also help our uh, our owners. Uh, we have a service that uh, we help them with renovating the apartment, so it's also listed here. And uh, for uh, the two uh, two years, we uh, serve uh, over 100 people. 
our community are tenants, first of all. These are people at risk of homelessness, uh, people who are at risk of exclusion, for example, single parents, migrants and refugees, young people living in the foster care. And this is actually the group that uh, sometimes even uh, may be able to pay the rent uh, on the private market, but because of uh, different uh, stereotypes or uh, beliefs, it's very hard for them. Uh, we have, for example, a single father of three uh, who was unable to find the apartment first because the owners don't want to rent to uh, single, uh, single parents because of the legal issues, because it would be hard to evict them later from the apartment and uh, they don't feel it's safe. And also because uh, for the very reason uh, when we wanted to rent on the private market, he could only meet uh, people, I mean, he could only meet people uh, when the, his kids were in school or kindergarten. And the private owned apartments wanted the meetings after work. So he just, you know, just wasn't able to make it work. And uh, with us, he did. Uh, in similar situations are foreigners who might have uh, money, but they are not, not perceived generally as uh, safe uh, tenants because they might just uh, leave the country or disappear, you know, and, and, uh, and the owners just uh, don't believe uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this group. So uh, from the beginning, we had 30% uh, of single parents and 37% uh, uh, of uh, uh, foreigners that we serve in our agency. Uh, there are also people who live in substandard conditions, uh, people with unmet housing needs and uh, households with low income. When it comes to landlords, uh, owners, uh, we have owners of lower standard and substandard flats, uh, which will help to make them uh, like the proper standard. Uh, local communities, uh, within the project we adapt empty on uninhabited flats. Uh, and also uh, we have the regular flats owners who are uh, motivated either by social goal uh, or by a long-term lease offer. And recently, actually, we have also people who come because they were, uh, because the friends or family told them that it's quite, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a good thing to be our, uh, to work with us, uh, but I will, I will develop it later. So uh, the short history of uh, social rent, uh, rent agency. It started in 2013 when uh, Habitat Poland uh, uh, learned about social rental agency model at the housing forum in Budapest. Then 2015 to 2017, we devoted these two years to research and uh, advocacy projects where uh, checking uh, the legal requirements, uh, what is possible, what is not possible uh, in Poland. Uh, 2016-19, uh, we did the pilot project, uh, which was called the Home Lab. And then uh, in uh, 2019, we of officially started the Social Rental Agency as a permanent uh, program of Habitat for Humanity Poland. Uh, at the moment, we are now at the stage four, uh, which uh, we are working towards the economic sustain the sustainability. Uh, and uh, we are uh, thinking of scaling up the project. Uh, we also participate in the various uh, projects to share our knowledge and, uh, and um, which are meant to scale up the, uh, the project. Uh, we also uh, analyze the, the, risk, uh, the risks uh, apply for public subsidies. And, uh, and then uh, also uh, thinking of uh, uh, making bigger the so-called rental gap uh, because uh, we believe that if we border the, border the target group with uh, people who are independent, uh, like uh, act independent, independently in the society, uh, then it first of all uh, our social workers will have more time and will have uh, and we will be able to serve more pe more people and uh, also uh, it will give us the financial, most, more financial stability, which is very, very important for us. Uh, after, um, uh, after we did the uh, home lab project, which, I'm, uh, uh, which was the um, background for our social rent agency, we, uh, we did the research and we checked uh, the research that proved the efficiency of uh, the approach that we uh, introduced, which was helping not only offering the families apartments and places to live, but also uh, supporting them with, uh, with social work. 
Uh, so we had the, uh, we compared the control and treatment group. Uh, as, uh, as you can see, uh, before the project, the results of both, uh, both groups were not identical, uh, but uh, we can see here that in the case of uh, housing quality, for example, or, we can, or employment and stat status and income. Uh, still, when we compare the results uh, which, with the, the difference in the difference between the pretest and post test, uh, it was much uh, the improvement was much bigger in the group uh, which was covered by the support of home lab. And in two aspects, the results in the control group uh, got uh, worse, which uh, we didn't quote in uh, in our group. Uh, so, which we believe is a proof of of, of uh, you know choosing the right method. Um, I, here I'd like to show you the two examples of, of uh, our clients uh, and people uh, for whom we uh, help to improve their lives. One is Evelina, she's a single mother uh, of two, she's Polish, she is a victim of uh, domestic violence and for a long time she lived uh, with her son in a facility for single mothers and uh, she gave birth to a second child and thanks to the uh, flat which uh, she rented from us and uh, our uh, social assistance, uh, she, uh, first of all, she regained her stability and self-reliance. And uh, also uh, now she's helping her other women in, in, in similar situations. Uh, we have also, uh, we also have people who are foreigners. Um, here we have an example of such family. It's a Barno, mother of five from Uzbekistan. She's a refugee and her husband um, had to uh, leave Uzbekistan. And uh, now he, they're living a normal life. The children are going to school. Uh, yeah, and, 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 and the, they got the security they needed. Uh, when it comes to owners, uh, we first of all, as I said, we give them the security and stability. We guarantee the pay, rent payment. Uh, we give them a stable rent. For, uh, we manage the property. We uh, do some small service with us. And we also don't take uh, and the middleman or other fees, which actually, uh, when you uh, see it on this uh, on this chart, it's uh, they don't let's say lose much uh, in terms of money, uh, because uh, if we take uh, as an example the uh, here uh, compared to the monthly fee they can get from the uh, average price uh, of the apart privately owned apartment in uh, our portfolio, uh, and in in case they would rent it on the private market for 20% more, uh, they, would, uh, they would gain uh, 39 euro. And in case uh, they would rent it for 10% more, it, it's only for uh, three euro. So it's not really a big, uh, mm, it's not really a really big difference taking into, into consideration uh, all the other things that they are getting from it. And also, as I mentioned before, uh, we help uh, renovate the flats, uh, which in practice is like a free loan for the renovation to be settled uh, within the rent later. And usually in this case, we have the 24 mo uh, four month uh, contracts uh, because we just need time to recover the money that uh, uh, we put in, uh, in the uh, renovation. We have three kinds of renovation. One is when the owner pays, one is uh, like partly covered by the owner and uh, sometimes we pay uh, everything. Uh, still, it also depends on how much uh, we need to invest in it because uh, we don't want to uh, we don't want to recover it for longer than a year. Uh, and of course, some of the uh, we have most apartments we find uh, on the market. So there are people who didn't know about us, and uh, it's on the demand basis. The family family comes to us; they say what they want, and we look for the apartment for them. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have a dedicated person who is a real estate agent who need to convince them to work with us and uh, tell them uh, what are the, uh, the benefits. Uh, but we also have owners who come because they heard of the, it's a safe and good solution from the friends or family. We have one, one, one owner who wants to buy an apartment and uh, a new apartment and just uh, for the sake of renting it to us. So this is the proof that uh, uh, that it really works. And also we have uh, owners who come because they feel the need to share a good that they don't use themselves uh, with us. Mm. So uh, research and advocacy that uh, we do prove that the social rental agency 
uh, that the solutions are available uh, in regard to accessibility, uh, which the initial cost of the rental housing is much lower than of the ownership. Uh, it offers affordable and secure tenancy for those who, uh, from the rental gap. Uh, affordable uh, rent is an exit strategy for people living in institu institutional care. It serves the most vulnerable clients. Also, they, uh, it's sustain sustainability. Uh, workers help tenants uh, to sustain rental payments for the flat. Uh, uh, agency creates a network of specialized referrals for clients seeking social assistance based on the synergies of existing programs. And uh, we negotiate the price with the landlord in return for uh, regular payment and maintaining the property uh, standard. Also, it's the uh, livability. Uh, the flats are uh, dispersed in different districts located within condominiums to ensure their integration into the local community. And also, uh, we activate empty uh, unused housing stock. So, um, as I said, I also want to say uh, you about the bill on social rental agencies. Uh, the so the first question that comes is, is the regulations are needed and they are definitely needed because it's an incentive for local authorities to open agencies like ours. Uh, it gives the clear legal solutions uh, and the clear legal situation. And also it's a reference for potential beneficiaries. And uh, the bill was, the first draft was provided uh, in May 2020 for public consultation. Uh, later, it was amended uh, in, and published in September. And actually today is the first reading of the bill in the uh, parliament. So, you know, keep the fingers crossed that it all goes smooth. And we finally have the um, uh, official bill uh, on social rent uh, rental agencies in Poland. And... Um, Mm, the uh, agencies, uh, the, the, according to the bill, the municipalities will decide uh, if they want to establish the agency or not. Uh, they will be operated by NGO or companies uh, controlled by mu municipalities, not by municipalities themselves. And uh, they will be operated on the basis of an agreement con uh, conclud concluded with a municipality. And uh, the, um, uh, there will be a special act uh, the municipal legal acts, which will set out uh, the uh, criteria of clients. And uh, as far as funding, uh, it will require the involvement of local authorities uh, fund finding. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, definitely the subsidies uh, will be needed and according uh, uh, to NGO, it's also the, the it's crucial that the public funding is involved, uh, and the bill will provide for special housing allowance for the clients of agencies, and also tax exemption for landlords renting the flats uh, to agencies, which is also uh, a big incentive. Uh, as far as the scale, the, uh, by 2030, it's uh, uh, expected uh, that 45 agencies will operate. Will, will uh, each will operate around 50 flats, uh, so uh, which makes by the end of 2031 2000 uh, flats, and uh, the subsidies uh, are supposed to be 80 euro for each household. So thank you very much. Thank you very yes, much, Berta. You know. Yes, uh, uh, we went a little bit beyond time, so I would move almost immediately to the next speaker, but. I'm, I'm really curious of two things, and please respond to this in the chat if you can, because I'm not sure yeah. we'll have time for everything in the end. Uh, that before uh, this national leg legislation on social rental agencies, what was the motivation of, for example, of uh, uh, Warsaw to enter in collaboration with you? Because we didn't hear much of this. And also, I'm really curious on how do you get uh, tenants on board to help each other and actually establish kind of a mutual help uh, system among them. So how, how you turn your tenants into community, because I think it's a very uh, important you, element. Turn my tenants into what? Sorry. Into, into a community of, of okay. people who help each other. Uh, but I'm afraid we have to move on because we okay. want to give everyone the same opportunity. So um, we thank you very, very much, Berta. And we thank move you. over to Finland, to Peter Fredriksson. And I, I ask you, uh, 
just to try to stay really under 15 minutes. Otherwise, we skip the question <laughs> and, and answer part. I thought so. Yo, hello, everybody. It's nice to be here. I try to be very quick because uh, I thought I I have problems with my my, my to share any. I I've sent uh, my presentations there are several uh, slides, so I'm not going to use it. You can uh, you can deliver if you if you want the organizers. I try to say some points uh, to to get back to the timetable. It's easier for me anyway. I'm sorry about this. Uh, uh, my presentation, I've been working you know, as a you know, civil servant very long in the Ministry of Environment in Finland. I've been responsible on, on housing policy and, and especially been uh, responsible of the homelessness policy for about 17 years until I retired in uh, 2017. Uh, it was the period when the whole housing first was implemented in the whole homelessness policy in Finland. So I uh, some points on that also. But but my main target, uh, my main main team is the social housing in Finland because that's the basic the infrastructure of the whole work we are doing in in our country. It is 70 years old uh, present uh, uh, intru, in, intru, instrument which was uh, established uh, after the war. Uh, as an you know delegation for housing production, but it uh, developed very quickly then as a tool for to implement the housing policy. Uh, uh, it, it's called ARA. E -R -A. It comes. It's a it's a Finnish word, uh, which means social housing, affordable housing in our country. It's at the moment uh, it covers 1.1 million uh, flats. As a whole, and it's a it's a it's a combination of of several different tenures, uh, rental housing, uh, affordable rental housing, also owner occupant housing, and then there's a, a in between these two forms, there's a right to occupancy housing. It's never very nearby. Uh, 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 it could, you could say it cooperative housing, but it's slightly different. Uh, it's also different from the Swedish model of the same right to occupancy type of housing. All these elements have been uh, developed. The, the main, uh, ARA is, is a housing fund. It gives out loans and grants to municipalities and to non-profit sector. We have a very different, uh, important non-profit sector uh, with uh, different uh, organizations, foundations, like uh, the one where I'm now at the moment temporarily working, uh, Y Foundation is one of, uh, one of it. Uh, these are the basic you know, elements of the social housing system. One third of the whole housing stock is funded in our country by the ARA, ARA funding, affordable funding. And you can imagine how important it is in the biggest cities. For example, in Helsinki, uh, they have about uh, over 100,000 of Helsinki citizens live in an ARA house. So it's, an, it's, an, it, it's a very relevant. And it, uh, it, it, the result is that the difference of ARA average rent level Compared with private rental, for example, in Helsinki, the difference is at the moment 60%. So it's 60% more cheaper, the ARA level. It's, uh, the, the private rental sector is over 20 uh, euros per square meter in one month, over 20 euros uh, when, the, uh, when the ARA rent is 12.5 euros per, per square meter in, in one month. So, so it's very Im important in that. And it's also the social housing system is also naturally the basic of the whole homelessness policy and other uh, special groups, the refugees, disabled persons, child welfare, etc. Uh, not going through them all. Okay, this is the basic uh, larger picture. And now the basic principles are important for, I think, on the European discussion of the all interesting projects which you have presented here. Uh, I think uh, I try to give you some idea what's the idea. The first basic idea is that all subsidies 
how to guarantee that all the subsidies and grants and, and uh, uh, rent uh, loans that uh, their, uh, their, the subsidies go to tenants and not for, for administration or for profit. That's very important. Uh, basic principle, and you have to be very careful on it. And and we have a, a regulated system how to to secure the, that uh, that the tenants get the, the the support. The second very important principle is that the rental, the use of the uh, apartments with RI's funding, they have to be in rental use up to forty years. So it's a, it's a very long, it's a very uh, important principle that we have a, a huge amount of pro projects in all around the world, also in Europe, which are very short term, five to 10 years or even uh, shorter. And it's difficult to build a, a permanent housing stock, a permanent housing policy, if you don't have the, the, the infrastructure for a long period in use. In, in rental use in that in this case, uh, then it's important. The, uh, the third uh, principle is that cost recovery uh, uh, in a rent setting. It means that you 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 cannot put whatever you want costs in the rent setting. You have to f be uh, careful on on that the building cost, the renovation cost, and the, some of the basic maintenance costs are approved in the rent level. Uh, in that case, then our the selling of older or the ones which are not in a good uh, place, uh, located place, there have to be regulations also when you can sell your your ARA funding uh, uh, in the case. Then the next um, uh, important element of the whole is the tenant selection, and th those in greatest need have to have the priority in our system, naturally. And not in, in, in any other, we, have, we don't have any queue system. We have certain criteria that those, are, those who are in greatest need have, the, have their, the, the right to go first uh, in, in priority. And then the, the last one of the principles is the social mix. I know that, that you, you, you know in your own country and in many other European countries, the, the social housing has its stigma, stigma. It's stigmatized in many ways of different historical and other reasons, as you know. Uh, also bad maintenance and problems uh, we have uh, all around Europe. Uh, we have uh, uh, tried to, to, and I think we have some results, but we have also problem areas, absolutely, in our country. But we have uh, succeeded that the idea of the social mix in Helsinki and in, in whole country is the idea that uh, in the same area, you have to find ways how the different tenures can be in the it's a city planning uh, question and how do you uh, 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 deliver out the, the, the sites where you build new uh, houses. So uh, you have to have a difference which is allowed in, in concern in income and wealth level. The different tenures, which I already said, they guarantee that there are different kind of persons in that, this sense, economically, but also different in age level, young and old and, and middle aged also background, the ethnic background, the social situation, the social uh, group, etc. Uh, we try to find a social mix which could be in balance. Also the question of the new, the refugees with uh, immigrant immigration has been a challenge to find the way the, to find the social balance. Okay, these are the principles. And now some points in the end of our homelessness policy, because I think it, it's one of the best examples of, of a social housing system, uh, or, or, or in a way, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thesis. You can say maintain. You can say that it's not possible to implement an effective homelessness policy without uh, a, a very permanent social housing stock, or. The, the arrangements with the private market that, like this police example shows. Well, uh, it was uh, the, the whole, uh, the results when, if I said about in, in 30 years, 
the number of our homeless persons with the same definition it, it has decreased from about 20,000 to the, to the present level, which is 4,500 in 30 years. Uh, it has gone down, down, and it's still going down. It's the only European country where we have in seven executive uh, uh, following years, we have succeeded to put it down year, in, in, in present. And, and the background is, I would say, has been the national program to reduce homelessness from 2008 to 2019. I was responsible of implementing it. I'm not a politician, I'm, I'm a, a civil servant. So I had the responsibility to implement and it. And the idea was naturally that we took, we launched the whole housing first thinking the model. And at the moment it's used all around in our country, in, our, in the municipalities and the nonprofit sector, et cetera. So it's, a, it's the common, we have moved from staircase model more or less to the housing first uh, idea of, 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 of. And I would say that uh, the basic instrument which we used uh, it has been a letter of intent between the 10 biggest uh, cities and the state, the ministries. The letter of intent I, idea was that we put all our projects, about 3,000 flats, in the same agreements, in the letter of intents. And we made an agreement that the municipalities and, and provide service providers, uh, builders, um, developers, don't get uh, uh, any state money if the agreement is not followed. And it included also the principles of housing first, and the different also the rent level, et cetera. And the, the state put uh, quite a lot of money. We, as a whole, the whole funding for eight years was 240 million euros, 30 million euros per year. And I say that you have to put resources, you have to make a real intervention. Otherwise homelessness is a so bad problem that you have to, have to put uh, initiatives on. And the last point of the results, I would say it has been uh, that um, the savings of one uh, homeless person uh, to, uh, to, uh, to remove, to supported housing has meant the 15,000 euros yearly, the saving for one person from homelessness to housing. So it is, it, it, it pays back, the investment pays back in three to four years, the, 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 the costs. Sorry, I tried those so quickly that I could. And that worked, Peter. Thank well, you very much. You, thank you, did, you. Uh, you did a thank wonderful you job. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I have just one question before we move on to all the questions to everyone. You mentioned social mix is a key, and this is what we saw uh, in, in other projects as well. There's a lot of services around. Uh, housing are also uh, about integration and, and, and you know connection of different people with different backgrounds. Uh, besides uh, zoning and urban planning laws that you mentioned, what other means you have to maintain or reinforce social mix? If you can give us a, just a few examples briefly. Well, you know, uh, ah. This is a huge question. You, you, you should go through the whole, you know, societal policy almost, uh, because it's the basic idea. I would add to the social mix idea also that you, you cannot see, it's very important, the architectural side, the aesthetic side in a way that you cannot see outside from a, from a, from a high rise building or whatever building that it's built for rental or owner occupied of right to act occupancy. So there is a there is a very certain you know criterions for the planners that you have to maintain uh, high level quality uh, 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 independent of the the tenure and who is going to live there. 
So yeah. it's important, as you can see, it's, it, it's not easy to find it because it's a cost, it cost it, uh, it's, a, it's a question of the costs all the time, what kind of material you have, you use, etc., etc. But that is very important. But then it's a, uh, it's a larger question, you know, it's all the, all the activities and the way the, the services are also uh, guaranteed and maintained inside the housing areas and the cities and also in the and in, in in the countryside it's important that that um, th that you as you know the nordic model emphasized very much the universal uh, rights and obligations and 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 duties also for persons of the finnish persons also eu uh, citizens and, and, and our immigrant, immigrant population. So, uh, so it's combined these universal rights to the special rights concerning, for example, in Finland, we don't, we have in, in, the, in the constitution, there is a very nice uh, formulation that the, the, the public sec sector must help persons to get their own ac accommodation. But there is only three groups which have uh, enforceable right to housing, you know, subjective right to housing, and it's the child welfare clients, and then there's the disabled, two groups of the disabled persons, also the ones which have, uh, which are disabled uh, 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 from mental reasons. Uh, so, so we don't have a very large right to housing, uh, you know, uh, thinking, uh, and we have more uh, emphasize the, the, the program-based uh, yes. policies. Thank okay. you very much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, uh, something that uh, a topic that we mentioned in the other presentations as well. And I would uh, now use a few minutes to come back to some of the questions that were raised by our, our audience. I see that some of the speakers started answering uh, them, but there are also two questions to Leia, and maybe I would turn to her. Uh, directly, uh, uh, we had the question: What are the terms of the renovation grant? How must, uh, how long the owners have to commit to renting for? And uh, also, another question that actually addresses the same issue: How secure is this housing solution for the cooperative? Is it long-term lease? Can they buy? Leia. Yeah, uh, the terms are basically regulated by an agreement we set between the the, ten the owner and the city council. Um, mainly, uh, what we do is that um, we, we determine the renovation works that should be undertaken. We have an architect that uh, visits the flat and determines uh, what are the, because we are talking about um, the, the necessary works. It's not like a very, uh, we tackle uh, the, at least the conditions to have it, uh, um, like to put it in good conditions, but it's, it's, it tries to be very uh, on, the, on the basics, let's say. Um, so they, they basically accept the the, uh, the works that we we propose, and also um, they have to uh, accept the price that we set. Um, we set the price with this index uh, we told you, and then we have these adaptations, mainly also regarding uh, works. That means that the more uh, the bigger the grant that they get, uh, then the the price um, will be lower. And also they have to uh, accept the fact that uh, once they bring the flat to the uh, project, it's it's going to be the city council who is going to determine who's going to be the tenant. Uh, that now we are doing it through the cooperative. Uh, in the long run, they accept that their um, contract will be uh, will be um, will be managed and everything will be managed through the the uh, cooperative. And uh, for the moment, they and regarding the time of the, for the lease and, and everything now, uh, they are engaging to five years uh, contract. Um, uh, that's what we do. Uh, that's what they. Um, the, these are the contracts that we are uh, we have now. But as I said before, the idea is that the cooperative, in the long run, will manage their own contracts and they will uh, that they will be able to uh, go for longer uh, longer runs and also to. Uh, uh, seek uh, like new other forms of engagement with owners for maybe longer runs with uh, that that is still have uh, to be said but for now the minimum uh, the minimum contract we are setting is of five years i don't know if that um, answers pretty much the questions i think so yes thank you very much leah and then uh, there's a, there was another question 
to Stefania, and she already answered this uh, in the chat, but I would like to give her also to wo the voice uh, to talk a little bit about uh, uh, how could public housing stocks owned by different institutions in a way help the program? So you, you describe here why it didn't work out. Uh, high renovation cost, how buildings were versus scattered departments, timely coordination process between relevant stakeholders. What could be done better on the side of public administrations to help uh, programs like Curing the Limbo uh, you know, work with more public apartments? We also saw in the case of, uh, I think Warsaw, uh, a, a kind of a balance between publicly and, and privately owned flats. Uh, in Athens, we almost had uh, almost exclusively private flats. No, so what could the the, the public sector do better in this? Uh, in your case, Stefania. So, as as I wrote in the chat box, we we conducted a very rich assessment uh, to map key housing actors in 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 Athens, uh, publicly owned uh, NGOs, institutions. Uh, so the, the information is there. Uh, since the initial idea was to pilot both private and publicly owned apartments, um, we were unable to, to utilize the public stock, unfortunately, for the reason, reasons you mentioned, Levente. Um, uh, being able to utilize publicly owned apartments would tackle exactly the issue of affordability. Uh, since we would be able, the apartment would be able to um, uh, be rented uh, be, um, below uh, the um, market rates. Um, plus, it would uh, create uh, what other speakers uh, mentioned before, uh, a stable, a stable uh, and affordable stock um, in Athens. Yes, uh, thank you, Stefania. And I would have just one last question to uh, Eva or Katarina uh, about Romodrom, because you, you mentioned here, and I think some people in the audience were quite interested in uh, the social real, real estate agency that you, you mentioned, that, that you're buying your own properties. You corrected this, that it's not actually that you buy your, your own properties, it's some investors uh, buy properties for, for you, no? Um, yeah, so how does this work and what is the interest of these investors to actually um, invest in your project? Because this is also something that other cities, other projects can also look at uh, to get maybe some social ethical investors on board who might be able to provide that kind of fund that you know, also enables this whole process to, be, to become a kind of a self-sustaining mm -hmm. uh, model also because in some cases we we see that this is not necessarily well ideally it's also the private sector but in some cases it's not the if it's not the uh, public sector then it has to be somebody else yeah, thank you for this question and sorry for a small confusion. Uh, yes, uh, the social real estate, estate agency works on the principle that we are like the moderators between the uh, investors, the private owners and the clients. And uh, there are basically two, uh, <laughs> two um, like uh, two sides. Uh, first is that sometimes uh, we are able to uh, rent uh, some kind of property, uh, for example, from the municipality, and uh, we do uh, the projects uh, or we we have some investments projects to renovate it, like EU fund EU fund EU funds projects, and also the uh, new project which is now uh, just evolving is uh, the one that uh, we try to attract the private. Uh, private investors, uh, the persons who have enough money, and uh, we uh, describe it as a long-term ter long uh, uh, investments for them. So it means they just buy property, they invest their money, they just have their money saved there, and uh, we can use the property to lend it for our clients. M maybe Eva, do you want to uh, add something to that? I think it's not necessary. I think you say everything. Yeah, thank you very much, Eva, Katerina, and thank you all. I'm afraid that we are actually run a little bit beyond our schedule. Um, so I would move back to the, uh, to the, the Master of Ceremony. Uh, but before that, I would like to thank you all for participating and, and also for using the chat and having this nice discussion in the chat with our audience. And uh, yeah, Dina. Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Levente, and thank you for all of you participating to our panel. Um, it's 
Thank you. Invaluable contributions, and it's really important to realize that housing and social housing is a rather complex matter, and it's not as simple as if you build it, they will come. It's a lot about creating trust and maintaining this trust with incentives and good partnerships to make sure that um, it is, it is an idea that both the communities of interest and the property owners show trust to this uh, initiative. So before we close, uh, I would really like to ask you, Levente, if you could possibly summarize all this wealth of uh, information and intelligence we have from this panel in a few words and tell us how can housing support can really contribute to the inclusion of those vulnerable communities into a city? Yes, thank you, Dina. Uh, just in a few words, actually, it is, uh, as you say, it's very important, of course, to develop programs to support vulnerable groups, but also it's not only affordable housing is not only about vulnerable groups, because what we see uh, uh, based on all these presentations and experiences is that it is a, a condition for a healthy city in general and a healthy economy as well. So uh, it's a win-win situation because all kinds of services will, will depend on and all kinds of you know, collaborations in the city will depend on affordable housing to different parts of uh, society as well. But also what I found quite important in all the cases that there's a careful exploration of uh, you know, how we get access to a part of the housing stocks, what kind of incentives we create for uh, private owners and also public owners. And what is the financial super sustainability of a program on the longer term? What kind of governance? Who are the participating organizations? So this is very important, especially because we need to get different stakeholders on board. We need uh, investors, we need owners, we need the public sector uh, as well. But also another key point is that housing does not stand alone. There's a lot of services that accompany housing, uh, social work and, and all uh, these kinds of services. And in the end, just to close, that the public sector role is actually very important, and I encourage all public sector uh, representatives with us today that uh, find you, find a way to support your uh, housing programs. Also, if these are social rental agencies, also if these are also to include private apartments, but uh, it's very important to have all stakeholders on board. Thank you. Thank you very much, Levente and everyone at the panel. And uh, perfect closing words to give us the perfect cue for the next two panels that we're going to run after the break. So we're going to now have a short break for five minutes. As we said, please uh, stay connected on the chat box and meet us here again in five minutes. We have our two next parallel panels. The first one is on municipal strategies for affordable housing. So if you have selected to join this panel, please come back to this main room, this link you're already on at the moment. And the other panel number three is on financing affordable housing. If you have selected or you wish to attend this panel, please click on the link that we have just posted in the chat box and you should have also received by email in your mailbox. So we take a five minute break and we come back together in the two parallel panels, and then back in the main room for our closing remarks of the day. Thank you very much.
Welcome back to our symposium. Uh, just to remind you that this virtual room is hosting our parallel panel number two on municipal strategies for affordable housing with your moderator, Dr. Dimitras Yatitsa, housing expert and researcher. So enjoy the session. Bear with me one second. We'll have a quick check and we'll be with you in a second. Uh, sorry, because I uh, missed the Dina. I was uh, disconnected. Did you give me the floor? Shall I? <laughs> sorry for this. I was disconnected and missed no, your last. Uh... No, apologies. <laughs> been a, it's been a minor technical um, uh, error on her behalf as well. But yes, yeah, so this is the room for the municipal okay. strategy for okay. affordable housing workshop panel and uh, Dr. Dimitras Yatitsa will take the floor and organize our first panel here. Enjoy. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to coordinate uh, this panel and uh, I welcome you all to the third uh, panel of uh, Curing the Limbo Symposium. Uh, the, the discussion up to now has been very interesting. A lot of issues have been put on the table. Um, in this session, we will be discussing um, about the municipal strategies and intervention to provide affordable housing. Uh, from, uh, we will learn from the experiences of, of a big variety of uh, European cities. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, their, uh, what they have to, to uh, tell us. Um, it, we have a very rich panel from um, uh, diverse experiences in terms of uh, uh, embeddedness, uh, history, duration, uh, different levels uh, of implementing uh, social housing policies and affordable housing policies at the local level uh, by or in collaboration with municipalities. Um, so I think it will be uh, very, very uh, informative, uh, especially for uh, the Greek context uh, where municipalities uh, have uh, quite limited uh, capacities in terms of uh, experience, uh, administrative mechanisms, financial resources, uh, including no municipal housing stock, no public housing stock. And, and this is something that came out many times during the previous session. So they have to deal with uh, growing demands um, uh, within a very uh, limited uh, supply or options. So dealing especially with the private uh, landlords, uh, small scale private landlords. Um, I won't say more. There has been a small change in the program. So um, uh, first, I, I will I would like to uh, invite um, uh, Javier Buron, who uh, told us that he has a limited time, and so he uh, kindly asked us. Uh, uh, to uh, present first, uh, and he will have to leave. So we will also give him a few moments also for questions after that. Javier Buron is the housing manager uh, at the city uh, of uh, Barcelona. 
and he has been very uh, strongly, very much involved in the development of a very concise and multi-level housing strategy during the last years. Um, Javier, are you uh, with us? Are you here? I'm not sure uh, if he has been connected. Um, should we, uh, I don't know, should we advance uh, with the uh, next speaker and uh, uh, give him the floor uh, once he's connected? I don't know, uh, Edward uh, Cabre, that connected. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Dr. Siatitsa, if you like, you can, we can move on to someone else and uh, we'll uh, try um, in shortly, okay? Uh, he, they say he's connected but cannot unmute. Uh, let me see if, uh, uh, if we can uh, do something about that. Or maybe the technical team there could uh, help with that. Unmute. Uh, maybe he's he needs to be turned into co-host. Thank you, thank you. I'm here. Oh, <laughs> hello, Javier. Nice to have you with us. So I give you the floor directly since you have a, a short time, and thank you for being here with us today. My pleasure to see you all. Uh, I have to share my presentation, and I think it's... And again, you have to give me permission to share my presentation because otherwise I won't be able to do it. It's happening the same thing that with the volume. Yes, uh, probably the, the technical team will uh, now deal with that, I hope, so that we can proceed. I don't know. Um... Dina, if you can hear us, is there a, a problem with uh, the connection? In my screen, what it says is the host has uh, um, turned off your function to share the screen. Is it on me to do that? It is on someone from the technical staff because it has nothing to do with <laughs> okay, my computer. I, I, I... He now is co-host. Here we go. Great. Now you can see the same, the same screen that I'm watching. Yes. Perfect. Yes, yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Sorry for, for all this inconvenience and thanks a lot for the flexibility with the timetable because I have another webinar to, to attend. I will try to be uh, brief, but uh, hopefully uh, insightful. Uh, there is this, this first slide has to do with the context. I won't go into detail because the context uh, right now in Barcelona is very similar to, to the uh, context in other European uh, cities. We have a small uh, social housing stock, very little public housing investment, at least in the last years, and mainly at the state and regional level. Um, we have a, a steady increase in rental housing prices until uh, co the coronavirus crisis. Uh, uh, mm, uh, the the uh, regulation of the private market has been usually uh, very soft or very weak, and we have not very relevant, um, um, uh, a very relevant history of PPPs, of uh, projects in which uh, the public and the private sector, they collaborate. As I told you, not very different to the situation in, in many member states, especially in the Mediterranean and in the uh, in the east uh, side of the uh, of the Union. Uh, this this uh, data it could be a bit more uh, interesting or uh, differential. We have uh, studied the structure of the property 
uh, within the city and we have focus in the types of landlords that we have in, in Barcelona. The uh, common um, understanding in the market is that around 80 or 90% of the supply is provided only by um, uh, individuals who are not professionals. Uh, and we have uh, um, uh, state uh, and, 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 and document in, in our city then this is not quite the situation that we are facing. As you can see, 73% uh, of the offer, a bit more than 70, uh, 63, I'm sorry, a bit more than 63% of the offer uh, is uh, carried out by, uh, by persons, by individuals, and uh, close to 40% are, are companies. And uh, this is already a data that we have to take into account, but if you go a bit deeper and you uh, check out the number of uh, dwellings that are offered by a uh, supplier, you can see that there is a big chunk uh, in between one and two uh, uh, units, 46.7% uh, of the total, but all the rest, we are going through different sections which are very interesting, three to five, six to 10, 11 to 12, uh, 11 to 15, I'm sorry, and more than 15. Of course, all these suppliers, they could be individuals or companies, and uh, probably in the lower uh, part of, of them, you could say that they are uh, families who own some wealth uh, in terms, in form of real estate and they rent it. But uh, uh, you have to take into account that the average uh, rental price right now, mon monthly rental price, price in the city of Barcelona is 1,000 euros. Uh, as you can see, uh, a supplier with five, six, seven units is, uh, is, is able to make a living uh, quite well. Uh, it could live only from that activity. I and mean, if you go beyond that uh, figure, uh, what we are uh, facing is uh, economical activity, not the occasional use of real estate in order to complement, the, to, to complement uh, family, family income. And this structure of the property is very relevant in order to uh, to uh, to act uh, from from a, 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 from a, a, an administration. Uh, this being said, this is the uh, general chart of the different instruments that we are the main different instruments that we are using right now in order to intervene in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the market. Uh, some of them they are very um, uh, classical. Uh, we are implementing different measures in terms of uh, inclusionary zoning, uh, uh, land policy. Uh, the most interesting figure is that right now we have uh, rental, affordable rental obligations in the, in the metropolitan area of Barcelona, which is the first place in Spain. And uh, at the same time, we have um, affordable housing obligations in the already consolidated uh, city. As well, we are regulating the tourist, uh, uh, the touristic uh, apartment market, which is very intense as it is in, in other places, especially also in, in, in Greece, in Athens, in Greece. And uh, we have done some uh, zoning in terms of uh, restrictions of these uh, of these uses in some areas of the city. Uh, uh, on top of this, we are constructing we are constructing new uh, social rental uh, units. Uh, uh, Effort under and under and um, done by the uh, the uh, uh, municipal housing company, and we are also acquiring property in the private market. Uh, and uh, we are developing two different types of uh, um, public private partnerships with limited profit companies and with non profit companies uh, non profit companies. The names of those two uh, initiatives are uh, Habitacha Metropolis Barcelona, and we have uh, a, an agreement with the main uh, with the main um, um, networks of NGOs uh, of the city uh, that represent uh, cooperatives and, and and foundations. And our aspiration is to be able to form a CLT in the future between the. Uh, the uh, NGOs and the administration. And now I will be focusing a little bit more in uh, these three programs that I understand that are of some interest for, for our uh, Greek friends, which is 
how to mobilize private uh, empty housing towards public rental schemes. And we have three different uh, schemes uh, in place right now. The, the oldest one is called Borsa, La Borsa de Yugue. Is, um, it is um, a, a system uh, through which uh, we uh, give some public incentives to private relationships and relationships between uh, housing owners and tenants, potential tenants. And if they cross uh, their wills and they sign a contract uh, under uh, a certain specific circumstances, we are uh, using public money in order to uh, give refurbishment, renew, uh, renewal allowances, and we give a great deal of uh, insurances and, and securities in order to make the, the, the operation uh, possible. The aim is how to cross empty premises from the market to affordable rent. We are not directing this program to social rent. And this is a fully publicly uh, uh, run program. We don't collaborate with anything, uh, with nobody else. The other program, uh, the, the agreement that we have with uh, Fundación Habitat 3, uh, a very relevant uh, NGO here in, in Barcelona, it is different in several uh, terms. First of all, it is not a publicly 100% uh, publicly run program because we collaborate with, with this NGO, with this foundation. The second thing is that in this case, the program is not a mediation program, it's an assignment program. And this is relevant. This means that the private owner signs a contract with the foundation, not with the tenant, which is the other case that I had, I had explained. And the foundation afterwards sign signs a contract in real in reality two contracts with the tenant one rental contract and one social contract so uh, these two different approaches they have been our main our main tools to intervene mediation uh, for affordable rent 100% public assignment for social rent uh, in collaboration with an ngo Recently, uh, since the coronavirus, we have uh, added in a third tool, which is a, a program in order to do temporary assignments of touristic apartments that are not rented right now. And what we do is uh, we, uh, we um, assign these apartments uh, to people who are in the waiting list for social housing. So we know that the resource it will be for the short term. And at the same time, the, the, we have to use uh, these, these houses for people who in a few months, they will be entering in the uh, social uh, housing stock. We are expending around 1,200 um, euros per month as an average. This program is much more expensive than the other programs that I, I, I have uh, described. And so far, we have been able to um, uh, engage in 100, a bit more than 100 um, uh, operations. The probably the most interesting thing of these programs, uh, speaking from the point of view of a public manager, is that they are very um, uh, widespread over the territory. This is a map of Barcelona, and all those blue dots, they represent uh, 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 units that they have engaged in the two uh, programs, the two first programs that I had explained to you, Borsa and Habitat 3. Uh, the map is very different to the map that uh, represents the stock of the, owned by the municipality that is rented in, in social rent, uh, which is very, very concentrated in the southern and east part. As you can see over here, it's very widespread with obviously the lack of units in the central part, which is Eixample. And this program is slowly but firmly uh, going up. Right now we have a bit more than 1,300 uh, 1, units. And obviously it's a qualitative uh, approach or a qualitative instrument. And at the same time, 
is a niche instrument. We know that we won't be, very, uh, we won't be uh, systemically relevant through these type of programs, but they complement the construction and the purchasing uh, efforts, and they are uh, very flexible in terms of being able to adjust to the needs in the territory. Common features of most of these programs uh, when you, are, you try to collaborate with, with non-public uh, bodies, with NGOs, with cooperatives, and with foundations. Uh, our, our understanding is that without political will, it is impossible to uh, undertake this type of efforts. With political will, sometimes it's quite difficult, but without political will, it is impossible. At the same time, uh, the third sector, uh, they, they, they have to come together and, and, and join forces. And for example, in the case of Habitatres, it is very relevant that the uh, NGO uh, network, they decide to create a specific foundation only for this purpose, only enable, in order to be able to uh, sign an agreement with the municipality. So all the uh, third sector, they assume that they have a compromise with the administration through a specific uh, instrument created uh, with this purpose. And on top of this, it has to be uh, some degree of uh, mutual uh, trust and understanding uh, among uh, elected officials, uh, activists, professionals in the NGO and public uh, sector. And uh, and this is what I have to share with, with you, apologizing for uh, my English and hoping that uh, some of these experiences are of, uh, of your interest. I won't be able to be the whole session with you, but my colleague, Eduard Cabré, is at your disposal. So any questions will be uh, addressed in, uh, in any moment. Thank you very much, Javier. I, uh, I'm tempted, although you, you mentioned you have to leave, I'm tempted to, <laughs> to ask you uh, um, uh, just uh, uh, a little bit about the time span of, of the development of these, the different uh, projects, uh, programs you, and policy tools you presented to us. Um, if you could say a few words, how long does it take? Uh, you mentioned political will, you mentioned uh, multi-level cooperation and joining forces, uh, but I also understand that uh, investing time and, and long-term commitment is also uh, important. Well, th th there, there are different degrees. For example, the project in which we are working for the longest period of time, uh, innovative project, uh, and is still about to be born, hopefully this month. Um, it has taken more than four years of, of uh, work and efforts. Uh, not because of uh, political problems, because of um, juridical difficulties, and at the same time, because the market has been changing several times of situation. But at the same time, other projects, for example, I told you that we have signed an agreement with cooperatives and NGOs not to mobilize vacant, uh, vacant uh, uh, houses, not to produce new homes and use them for co-housing and rental. And for example, this other project has taken us only four months from the first talks to the uh, approval of the municipality and signing the agreement. And we are about to hand uh, uh, land in leasehold to the cooperatives and the uh, foundations in a brief period of time. So different projects, depending on if you, are, if you want to build with others, if you want to buy, purchase with others, or if you want to uh, mobilize um, vacant uh, housing with others, depending on the matter, the times are, dif are different. But I would say we have an internal joke that I'm going to share with you because we are almost nobody in this session, close to 100 people. Uh, we have this joke of how to open an interstellar gate. Because law, it is not adjusted to all these efforts. Uh, public law is prepared to give services to a, a, a private pro provider, and that's all. 
Uh, and when you want to engage in complicated uh, schemes in which the cooperation between the parties uh, is very, um, um, it has a lot of details and there are different services and it's, it's a long-term relationship, it is very difficult to go through public law all those uh, projects. But once that you have opened one of these interstellar, interstellar gates, you have to use it to the full maximum extent. So the, 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 the idea will be to have an, an, a stable agreement that is wide in terms of purposes with the non-profit uh, sector and also another one with the limited profit uh, sector and be able to allocate in those two agreements as many uh, policies, instruments and resources as possible. Because the, uh, the public machinery is quite difficult to go through. Looking at that problem from my point of view, the uh, public uh, employee, I suppose that from the market point of view and from the civil society points of view, point of view, it is very, it is very similar. How to uh, create wide agreements that are legally robust and they are able to go through different situations over the time and how to be able to implement different uh, policies and, and, and instruments. That will be my, my experience. Thank you very much for this uh, positive uh, <laughs> experience of everything can happen if you open interstellar gates. And uh, I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of effort and experience and, and knowledge behind that. Uh, so thank you very much. I also keep uh, in mind that uh, Edward will be here to answer questions at the end uh, regarding the Barcelona experience. So uh, if you need to go, uh, <laughs> Uh, you can, uh, we can uh, do you have now and we can move on to the uh, next uh, speaker. Uh, so thanks again. Uh, the next uh, uh, speaker is Merit Osgunas. She's from the municipality of Thessaloniki. Uh, hi Merit, nice to have you here. Uh, and she will be speaking from a quite different uh, experience and background, uh, uh, presenting us uh, the first steps and, and efforts, but really uh, strong and determined ones to develop a local housing policy uh, for the municipality of Thessaloniki. So welcome, Merit. Thank you for the invitation. Um, just to clarify, I'm not from the municipality of Thessaloniki but I'm from an intermunicipal uh, development agency. So bringing together- Sorry about that. It's okay, just to clarify. Um, so we are 11 uh, municipalities who have a development agency, which is the implementing arm of these municipalities to implement technical and uh, social programs in the greater urban area of Thessaloniki. At the same time, uh, Laura in the morning mentioned the roof network. I am the local, a ULG coordinator for the roof network as well. And these two um, efforts on combating homelessness and uh, developing affordable housing uh, and social housing in the city go together and complement each other. Oops, how do, you, how do I move to the next? Okay. So some people mentioned it, I won't go through it in detail and it will be a bit simplistic, but just Recapping on the national context in Greece, um, you know, we have 0% social housing stock, very limited uh, public ownership of um, properties for, uh, let's say, uh, provision of uh, social housing or with the potential of provision. And for poor households, we have 90% <clears throat> uh, housing cost overburden, which is huge. It's the highest. Uh, in the EU, and 36% overall for the population. Um, also mentioned in the morning, there is limited institutional experience in managing um, housing policies, and um, there are defunct structural interventions like the Workers' Housing Organization, which no longer exists. So there is no national body and no national, let's say, housing policy 
which can provide umbrella guidance uh, for the local level. And most of the uh, housing programs are subsidy based and program based. So if we come to the local level, the challenges uh, for Thessaloniki, but I think this is also true for most municipalities. So <clears throat> building an affordable housing policy or social housing policy in Thessaloniki is difficult when there is, let's say, no national housing policy. Um, also, there are not yet com a common understanding, a common language on what we mean by right to housing, um, affordability, social housing. So this is another challenge. Um, also, we should mention in the limited mandate uh, of municipalities, while the reform processes um, provided more mandates uh, to municipalities, especially in 2010, um, for social policies, this also uh, came together with the economic crisis and austerity measures. So this meant that we had increased obligations, increased social needs, but uh, decreased funds. And at the same time, as other panelists mentioned, uh, we had increasing demographic pressures like um, an increased refugee population, asylum seekers, more people on benefits, new poor, and increased private investments. So um, while we were implementing uh, social programs, we faced a major challenge, which is basically a bottleneck. So people who were on rent subsidies, let's say, uh, or benefits, just couldn't find affordable housing. And I'll show you with some case studies to demonstrate and illustrate that. At the same time, we had a shrinking population in the center of the city, in the central municipality. Though, so the population in the central municipality was decreasing. We have abandoned neighborhoods or destitute neighborhoods at the same time. But even during the pandemic, we have steadily increasing rents. So, just let me go to the next slide. What's happening? Oops. Yeah. So we, we were trying to understand what's happening here. What's, what is the bottleneck and why are the rents increasing continuously? There were different explanations. You know, one set of people were saying it's the Airbnb and short term letting platforms. And others were saying, it's the refugees and asylum seekers and all these programs that are seeking for housing and looking for housing. They are, they are like spiking the rents. We wanted to find a more, let's say, uh, holistic interpretation of what was happening. And we know that uh, we lack a lot of data uh, on housing and housing exclusion, especially at the local level. And the latest research that was done on this issue in Thess for Thessaloniki was 30 years ago. So it's quite, not quite, very old. And so we, as uh, the agency, we collaborated with the School of Spatial Planning and Development of Aristotle University. And we developed a very large scale baseline study in the city. And the report will be launched in May and we'll be able to share it with all of you. So we looked into identifying the major uh, housing problems, uh, causes of housing stress, the main target groups, um, trying to make sense of the local housing market and the housing stock, uh, looking into good practice, like we also heard from other panelists this morning of models of provision of affordable housing and checking that with national legislation uh, to see their applicability and the possibility of applying it to the local context. And obviously, financial tools and funding resources, uh, alternative tools to fund these solutions and governance structures. So just, I'll give you a bit of highlights. There's a lot of data that was collected by the research team, but I'll just give you highlights um, to, to, to note both the housing potential and the housing stress. So um, in these case studies, we took, um, seven case studies of different sizes of households, as you'll see. 
single couple, two roommates, etc. Looking at the city of Thessaloniki, the center, and other periphery municipalities, and to see basically uh, and doing a search in the um, let's say rental platforms to see how much, how many uh, housing units were generated in accordance with the parameters of square meters that we were looking for. So for instance, I'll just take two examples. For a single household looking for these meter squares, um, the cheapest we got in the center of the city was one unit, 170 euros. That's the cheapest. And in the periphery municipalities, it's 100 euros. Um, it's in the area of Ayus Dimitrios, which um, if you know Thessaloniki, if you think you're going to be finding a ground floor Ayus Dimitrios area uh, apartment, it'll be quite noisy, <laughs> not, not the best of conditions. Also seeing that the um, building is built in the 1970s year of construction. And here you see in this diagram, the minimum level of income you would need to be able to sustain uh, this level of rent together with the housing cost. Just to remind people who are not from Greece, um, the net, let's say, minimum income in Greece is 400 euros and the maximum rental subsidy you can get, the maximum is 210 uh, euros. So you can see the level of housing stress if you need to earn more than 600 euros per month to be able to sustain 170 euro rent home. And similarly, if we look at a case um, for a couple with children here, you get a result of 400 euros, a single unit, the cheapest unit, and you would need a mixed uh, income of more than 1,400 to be able to sustain that in the Vardaris area, which again, if you know Thessaloniki, you probably wouldn't choose uh, that area to live um, as a family. And you'll see also the amenities and the conditions where um, either it's um, the heating will be through stove or no heating uh, provision, et cetera, which is another issue. Oops, sorry. And if we come to what people spend most on when they are, let's say, household costs, this is also um, interesting because we see for the region of central Macedonia, it's similar also to the national level. We see that almost 50% of the cost goes to heating and rent. So that means that the highest pressure for households in terms of cost is rent levels, but also energy poverty stand out as a key challenge. And uh, as I said, you know, these assumptions on what are the major pressures? What, what is it that makes the rents go high? It's a lot more complex than just Airbnb or just, um, you know, accommodation programs for refugees. Um, we saw these striking numbers you see here <clears throat> that the research team uh, looked into the electricity disconnection applications from the electricity grids across the city in order to determine the empty homes. So here we see a very uh, striking number for Thessaloniki, which is um, based on the electricity disconnections, is 38,840 houses with no electricity. And for overall the whole city, you'll see that it's 123,000 empty uh, properties. At least half of those uh, were disconnected, that were disconnected are homes, actually declared as homes. And the, the rest are declared, declared as uh, ge for general uh, use, but they could also be potentially residential or were also residential and professional, uh, let's say units. And most of them were disconnected uh, due to uh, the reasons declared, which was to be rented or to be sold. We also see here uh, that the um, disconnections from the electricity grid peaked during the economic crisis. And here in the maps, we see the geography uh, of the disconnections, which will also help us very much 
while we are looking, digging deeper into uh, identifying specific empty homes to work with, with our social rental agency. Uh, we see that in the Western part of the city, there's a huge concentration of empty homes and empty vacant uh, properties. So um, we are currently uh, working with the support of the Roof Network and our partners there, as you see, under the leadership of City of Ghent, um, preparing local action plans and local strategies through participatory planning at the local level to combat homelessness, implement housing first. We talked a lot about it in the morning. Um, better data collection and use and analysis and methods to generate affordable and social housing stock. The strategy, the main elements, but not all, uh, will be focusing on complementary interventions in order to increase the resilience of housing solutions, creating a social rental agency, which I'll get to very, very soon, and using municipal, public, and private stock. And as the, the diagram I showed you before, um, we, we are going to be focusing on empty and vacant uh, properties initially, and also to municipal properties. Also working, the strategy will be looking into institution building. Uh, Dimitra, you mentioned the lack of capacity at local level and at institutional level for managing uh, housing solutions. We'll be looking at um, trying to develop public housing services within the municipality. Focus also on preventive measures like tackling household energy poverty, protection from evictions, tenants' rights, provision of information related to tenants' rights, etc. Combating discrimination in the housing market, fostering social cohesion, mixed neighborhoods, um, and also through referrals and through direct provision of services, trying to provide a constellation of services. Freak was talking about this in the morning, uh, with housing at its center, but not only. Uh, also, um, we will be looking at potential policy change and policy recommendations in order to identify necessary legal and administrative changes um, that could bolster housing intervention, so structural interventions as well, in the areas of, let's say, municipal tax uh, or regulation um, at the local level, and also trying to build a housing alliance, a common language across Greece, with other local authorities, non-governmental stakeholders, etc. Energy upgrading will be a very central, uh, let's say, tool that we will be using uh, through our SRA in order to um, renovate the housing units. Data, as I said, is very important. Uh, also, the baseline study provides us a very good start, but we also want to establish a monitoring mechanism to see, to observe, housing exclusion, housing stress, risk of homelessness, and housing trends in the city. So before I close, I'll just mention that um, I can confirm that we have secured funding with the kind support of IOM to operationalize the social rental agency under the auspices of our development agency with the support of the municipality. And we will be hopefully during the summer uh, establish uh, the social rental agency with a, let's say, nuclear team uh, who will be working to generate housing stock with a focus on empty homes with incentives, um, housing analysis, um, major housing needs analysis matrix, social scoring matrix, and all the tools that an SRA would need in order to better serve uh, vulnerable groups. At the same time, we are starting to develop our business plan for the SRA um, before the SRA kicks off with the support of Heinrich Böll Foundation. And uh, we are waiting for confirmation uh, in order to be able to fund a housing policies platform and a GIS system, which will also be able to, for us to manage a database of empty homes uh, and feasibility studies, etc., And also, for us, it's very important that we share whatever we're doing with other stakeholders, with other local authorities. As I said, the housing alliance is very important um, nationally. 
in order to jointly uh, develop common solutions and a common understanding uh, to, to this issue. And I think um, this is also quite relevant for most large municipalities, but also for smaller ones. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Merit. Um, you gave us a, a, an insight into um, the efforts um, of uh, Thessaloniki uh, to start to, to, to put to set the first steps to set up uh, the required uh, knowledge needed, uh, but also the, the tools and the, the mechanisms to start developing. Uh, and, and it's very important and, and it's uh, uh, very nice uh, that, to see that uh, you're really moving on to building step by step this uh, um, uh, strategy and this policy at the local level, um, pulling resources from many, from many um, parts. Uh, I, I imagine, uh, given also a comment in the chat that uh, um, about the quite limited possibility of municipalities in raising uh, financial resources, especially through taxation, that cooperation also with the central state uh, would be crucial uh, for the long-term uh, sustainability, let's say, and resilience of such an effort, but also for the scale. I mean, addressing uh, needs of a big uh, population. So one question would be, um, how uh, have you been advancing or is there going to be a kind of cooperation also with the central state? This is what we hope. And um, we are, we have been discussing with uh, some of the key uh, ministries on this issue. And I, I do hope that we will, I, I do think there's mutual interest uh, in order to, support each other, both in terms of policy development, but also piloting uh, such efforts at the city level. Uh, so I'm quite positive that we will be moving on towards that as well. Great. Uh, I, I want to remind everybody here that you can um, you can uh, put your questions in the chat and we will be collecting them and addressing them to the panelists uh, at the end at the sec of the section of, of questions and answers. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Merit, for sharing your uh, experience uh, and your effort. And we will move on to the, um, to the next uh, city, um, a really different um, uh, experience and history in terms of social housing and affordable housing. Uh, we will have with us Julia girardi Hook. Uh, the head of department of social services of the city of Vienna. Uh, so we move on to really a, a, another universe in terms of uh, social housing, a quite uh, uh, unique uh, case, uh, I think, historically uh, since the Red Vienna. So thank you very much for being here and welcome. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you for this very, very interesting conference so far. Can you already see my screen, uh, my PowerPoint? Yes, yes. Yes, it's perfect. Not in okay. full, yes, it's here. It's not in okay. full screen, but it's, uh, we can see now? also the next. I don't know if it's better coming. now. Uh, we still see it in the, uh, we still, the, the, we see also the following slides, but it's okay, okay. I guess. Okay, okay. I can also share my screen uh, if it's better so you can see numbers. Um, let me just uh, switch over to screen sharing and uh, then you can should be able to see full screen now. It's better now, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, cool. Okay. So a big hello from, from Vienna. Uh, it's been a very interesting discussion so far. And as you already said, um, we are uh, very fortunate uh, in Vienna to have a completely different situation when it comes to social housing. Also, we still oh, experience some of the problems that you are having in terms of, of the economic um, impact of, of the corona crisis, because even though, as I will show you later on, we, will, we have a, an enormous uh, social housing stock, we still have a lot of people um, really struggling to, to make ends meet and to pay the rent. 
So the situation of Yen is following, but we are almost uh, approaching 2 million inhabitants, which is uh, very uh, a lot smaller than Athens. Um, but of this million, half of the people are actually living uh, in, in public or subsidized housing. And that's uh, very unusual, I know, if for Europe. Um, we have a, had a large growth. Uh, urbanization has been a major um, challenge for Vienna. Uh, we've been growing over 200,000 people. I mean, before 2005, Vienna was really um, a sleepy city. Nobody really wanted uh, to move here. And then there has been this enormous boom. Uh, and, and we had to put up with, um, with hundreds of thousands of new apartments. And, and now, uh, as I said, we're approaching 1.2 uh, million very soon. So what uh, this um, meant for the city of Vienna in 2019, for example, just to give you some numbers, uh, we invested 360 million euros in housing, in object funding. And this is always a, a figure that I give uh, to other cities because you see the numbers for, op for subject funding, for subsidies for rents, uh, is quite low comparatively. And this... Uh, money often goes away to private investors because as a city, of course, you need to uh, to keep your people in the apartments. Uh, you don't want families on the streets, so you have to uh, to fund them um, per, per head, uh, more or less. And if the rents are super high and the apartments are owned um, by investors, foreign investors, the money goes away to the foreign investors. And by this, um, directly uh, more investing into the objects, you keep the money uh, in the local economy. So um, we are still uh, building new uh, apartments, but also we invest a lot into the enormous building stock that we already have. Mm, the history of, of social housing Vienna, the, the so-called Gemeindebau goes back a hundred years. So we celebrated a hundred years last year. So you can see it started between the world wars and uh, it was a social revolution back then that workers, um, were able to live on a better standard. Uh, they had uh, toilets in their apartments um, and even better standards than some of the villas uh, on the hills that didn't have that kind of infrastructure then. So, so this uh, system that we have, that we never sold any of the apartments, Vienna is quite traditional in that sense. It's quite sleepy also. I mean, it, we, we just, I think, slept through some of the neoliberalism phases where we could have, where, where it was like in, to sell infrastructure where we are not just didn't do it. Um, so we have kept rents and we, we can trigger the local economy easily by, by stimulating a renovation. And also now when we come to talk about climate change, we are much we have find it much easier to renovate building stocks that is are owned only by one uh, municipality unit or as I will show you later, uh, one non-profit um, association. Because when you have um, different private owners, it's uh, very hard to make them agree uh, on renovation measures. So as I said, it has enormous effects on the rental price, on the social mix, because we can much better tell um, who is given which apartment and we can avoid ghettos to some extent. Uh, and we, uh, tenant protection is, is, a very, is very high in, in Vienna and yeah, the quality of living. Um, so um, the profit limitation is a is a very important issue um, of uh, for for the city to keep the rent prices down and but also to to provide land procurement yeah and and then there has been a shift in land procurement uh, we have been selling land for quite a quite some time but then we learned from Switzerland that it's much better to only rent the rights to land out and not to sell the land so that you give uh, the building rights for 100 years, for example, and, and get some rent for that. Uh, it's much better on the long term uh, than selling away the land that you can never get back. So we're still uh, developing, as you see. We still, we always have to, uh, especially with this large um, urbanization uh, that I mentioned with these many new people coming, um, we were very challenged in the housing sector. Um, we had to be much quicker, become much quicker uh, in, in land procurement, uh, in, in new planning, in transformation of spaces of old um, 
railway station areas, inner city, industrial areas that have been transformed into housing areas where there's housing being built everywhere right now to keep the rent prices down uh, by providing enough housing. And then still also we um, experienced that um, there's a lot of, of, of private investors um, pushing into the market that build uh, apartments but only for speculation. Those high apartments are partly empty then, and this is something um, we really don't want, but it's, it's still hard as a city to avoid. So um, we have been talking about rent prices before uh, in this conference for Vienna. Uh, it's still moderate, I guess, compared to Munich or London or Paris. Um, so the private average um, is 10 euros per square meter. And for, for social housing, it's six euros per square meter. Then you ha usually have to add two or three euros per square meter for utilities. Um, but, but these are, just to give you a number, these are approximately what you have to be ready to pay in order to rent. Um, and then the, the social housing uh, uh, and the communal housing is in everywhere from the very city center to the very periphery. And, and the private prices, of course, vary. This is only the average. Um, if you want to, to live very in a city, um, you have to be ready to pay way over um, those 10 euros. It's, it's the average. But still, um, it's there. An old, very old housing that was destroyed during the Second World War, they have been refurbished uh, using subsidies from the city. And by using these subsidies, um, they had to agree to rent cap. So even uh, the very old buildings in Vienna, in the very inner city, uh, is, is rent capped. Um, so technically quite a small part of the Viennese rental market that is really unregulated. So there's always been a focus, it have very unpopular, of course, um, by the building industry, but there's always been a lot of focus on, on capping rents. And so far it's played off well, because there's always the debate that nobody renovates, it's not attractive enough, to rent out the apartments, we don't see that. Um, it's very important for a city to to cap the rents um, and then um, to in order to to provide housing for all who need it in the inner city. So, um, just to give you an overview of our facility categories, um, so the 65% of the building stock is already category A. Um, this is uh, including toilet, bathroom, and central heating. This is the overall um, housing stock in Vienna. And then we do have some uh, category B apartments um, that have a toilet and a bathroom uh, in the apartment, inside the apartment, but no central heating. We still have some oil, uh, singular, uh, yeah, oil chimneys or something, or but but this is uh, also decreasing steadily. And then we have 